Um, who is an anesthetist in the Nutri Neuro Lab in Burdock University, France. And he will be talking about ventral uh, tegmental area projecting dopaminergic neurons as a neural substrate for flexible adaptation of goal directed behaviors. So it's all yours, um, uh, Rabia. You need so to unmute. Let's, yeah, let's do it. Thank you, Adil. Uh, hi, everyone. So, yeah, my name is Javier Correa Vázquez. And wait a second. Yeah. And I'm going to be sharing with you the set of data that I got during my internship at the Bordeaux Neuro Campus as a graduate student and under the supervision of Andrea Contini and Pierre Trifiliev. They are the, under the direction of Pierre Trifiliev. The resulting project is called uh, Ventral Tegmental Area Projecting Dopaminergic Neurons as a Neural Substrate of, uh, for Flexible Adaptation of Goal Directed Behaviors. So, goal directed behaviors are a very important component of cognitive function based on the association between an action and an unexpected outcome. So, if for example, after a long day of work, I feel tense, which is an aversive state. When my goal, uh, when, and, and sorry, and my goal is to feel better, less tense, a more rewarding and pleasurable state, when possible action that I can perform is, for example, to smoke a cigarette. One important characteristic of cold directed behaviors, nonetheless, is that they are flexible and can be adjusted when the context is changing. So let's say that now the context is really changing because I'm realizing when I'm reading this paper that my cigarette is really bad for my health. In fact, I realized that one single cigarette, as you can see, can reduce my life by 11 minutes. Then, what can I do? In a flexible manner, I can adapt my behavior, quit smoking, and for example, learn mindfulness techniques to feel better, less tense, and live a healthier and longer life. Nonetheless, we know that patients suffering drug addiction persist in consuming the drug, although they know the negative consequences of drug use, showing deficits in this ability to flexibly adapt goal directed behaviors. At the neurobiological level, alterations of cognitive functions in those pathologies are believed to rely on perturbations of the prefrontal cortex activity including for sure the prefrontal cortex, and in particular, and that's very important, of dopamine transmission within this structure. However, preclinical data regarding the implication of dopamine signaling in executive control remain controversial. So, on the basis of this discrepancy, our goal during this project was to assess the implication of dopamine neurons of the VTA, the mental tegmental area, during reversal learning and sensory specific outcome evaluation task, since we know that the BTA is the main source of dopamine reaching the medial prefrontal cortex through the mesocortical pathway. Our hypothesis was then that, that an inhibition of BTA dopamine transmission would impair the flexible expression of goal directed actions. To do so, we used a chemogenetic approach to selectively and reversibly inhibit dopamine neurons of the BTA, first of all, we use a that Cree line in which the Cree recombinase was expressed in dopaminergic neurons. Then we injected an anterograde virus into the BTA carrying the Cree dependent inhibitory threat. And finally, we injected CNO peripherally and just before the behavioral test. What CNO did was to activate specifically the DREF, and the DREF itself inhibit the BTA dopaminergic projections, mainly onto the medial prefrontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens. So, regarding the experimental procedure, 
first of all during the instrumental during our instrumental training the animals learned to perform an action that in this case was to press a lever to get a reward in a milk pellet let's say for example and during the same sessions animals learned to perform another action to press the other lever to get a different reward a grain pellet the same with the same calories. Here I'm showing you the results of instrumental training. As we expected, both groups increased. As you can see the number of lever presses per minute along fixed and random ratio sessions with no important, no significant differences between groups and without session per group interaction. Importantly, mice. Uh, were kept under caloric restriction and maintained at around 80% of their initial ad libitum weight. During the outcome evaluation task, we tested the animal's ability to flexibly use the association between the action of lever pressing and the outcome of getting a reward when the value of the reward changed. How did we change the value of the reward? So we did that by inducing society. So first of all, animals were fit at libitum with one of the two rewards, the, the milk or the grain pellet. And this fact decreased the value of the reward. And at the end of this phase, CNO was injected. Right after, during the extinction test, both levers were presented, but lever pressing was unrewarded. So here we recorded the number of lever presses along this session. Here I'm showing you the results of this extinction test. We expected that the control mice, the cream minus group, the black one here, would reduce the lever pressing regarding the devalued reward, as they did, as you can see, adapting their behavior in a flexible manner. But importantly, although we predicted that the dread group, the cream plus group, would press similarly on both levers, showing this imperability to adapt they, their behavior in a flexible manner. What we found was that the group expressed outcome devaluation during the extinction test, showing a higher amount, as you can see, of lever presses performed on the lever associated with the reward that was not devalued. Nonetheless, we found an effect of group suggesting the different differences in the total amount of lever presses performed by both groups of animals during the test. Here, uh, I'm showing you the total amount of lever presses performed during, during the extinction test per group. As you can see, we found that the number of lever presses performed by the Cree plus group during the extinction test was significantly lower than that of control mice. So this data suggests that the BTA dopaminergic transmission is not necessary, as we saw, for the expression of goal directed behaviors in the outcome evaluation paradigm, but it confirms its important role for maintenance of incentive processes at the motivational level. We then tested the effect of BTA dopaminergic inhibition during a reversal learning paradigm. Why? So we wanted to go further and test the animal's ability to flexibly respond to changes in the environment, since this ability is critical for adaptive behaviors. So following the last uh, outcome evaluation testing that we just saw, the same cohort of mice underwent four sessions of instrumental reversal learning. Rewards delivered after lever pressing were now reversed across the right and the, le and the left lever. And importantly, this time, mice were injected with CNO each day, 30 minutes before the beginning of the sessions. So here, I'm showing you the results of the instrumental reversal learning process. As you can see, lever pressing performance per minute increased across reversal learning training days and did not differ between groups. Another choice test was run after this reversal learning phase. The procedure, I'm not going to get into the details because was identical to that run following first and second evaluation. But importantly now, 
uh, no C and O was injected during this phase. And here, and this is a very important slide, uh, I'm showing you the results of the extinction test following this reversal learning training. The control group responded significantly more on the valued level compared to the devalued one. While this time the creepless, the creepless group equally responded on similarly responded on both levers. So this was our very important finding. And this is suggesting that an inhibition of dopaminergic transmission during the acquisition of the reversal learning really impairs the, ex the expression of behavioral flexibility after the outcome devaluation paradigm. Importantly, as I am showing you here, uh, this time no differences in the total amount of lever presses performed by the two groups of animals were found at the motivational level. So in conclusion, what we found is that first of all, the BTA dopaminergic transmission has a critical role for maintenance of incentive processes as it has for sure uh, been demonstrated before. And we found finally that an inhibition of VTA dopaminergic neurons perturbs the expression of the outcome devaluation of this flexible manner uh, to adapt to the, new, to the new situation, but only following a reversal of the outcome devaluation contingencies, showing its specific role to encode new and reverse instrumental learning contingencies. So this is all, thank you, for, uh, thank you very much. And I will be more than happy to, to try at least to answer your questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Kabir. Um, is there any, so are there any questions for, for him? It was a very great talk, by the way. It was very really fun. Um, any questions? Okay, so probably, I I can ask. Uh, I, I'm not really uh, animal researcher. I'm mostly I work mostly with humans, so pardon my um, ignorance a bit here. Um, so, uh, so 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 these are the results that you're showing me are, are all behavioral results, right? So you have given um, you know a pharmacological intervention here, uh, but. Uh, so, so what's the plan? So do we do we want to know what's actually neural mechanisms behind the reversal learning and devaluation? Or is something that, you know? No, uh, the, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thank you for the question. Yeah, no, we really want to eat in this, in this world, especially with what is going on is, is we really need to know the, the neural mechanisms for adapt Fast as fast as we can to to a new situation, no. And the reversal learning paradigm is, is really useful when working with animals for exactly doing that, for exactly checking that, no. Because what we are doing is is reverse the rewards with a, with a simple with in a simple situation, and we can see if by shutting down this area of the brain, animals can adapt or not. So that was the point, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so there's a question coming for you uh, from Mehmet Fateh um, mm -hmm. So would you like to ask the question yourself, Mehmet? I can, um, I can uh, allow you to speak if you like. I I think it's better if you ask because my voice is not good. <laughs> Uh, not a problem. I think it's good enough to ask, but I can do it. Uh, so the so the outcome. So the question is this: that outcome devaluation uh, is also devaluation is also some form of motivational modulation. So why VTA is involved in the later but not former? Maybe you can explain the difference between devaluation versus motivation. Yeah, for sure. In, I, I would say that, yeah, when you are devaluating, you, um, you really have to be 
motivated for the for 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 the evaluate in in this survivor mode on no so yeah that's that's a great question and and, and as, as we saw no in our in our data um motivation is really important when and it's a it's using a different pathway a, di a different neural mechanism possibly what we did was to shut down and i, I don't want to be speaking longer uh we did we shut down the whole dopaminergic system so um, we really don't know if motivation is more involved with the nucleus accumbens following our our study but or, or with the prefrontal cortex but for sure there is a different neural pathway for motivation and that's what we saw and no? that you can you can devalue it, but and, and you can be not that motivated but by checking with the lever blessing yeah okay thank you uh so thanks a lot again it was a great talk we really enjoyed it. so could you please stop sharing your screen now so that lindsay can come uh come in so uh lindsay collins she is a postdoc uh, in the institute of neuroscience at the university of oregon and she is going to talk about vagus nervous stimulation and to do it induces virus spread, spread cortical and behavioral activation. Is, is, is uh, yeah. So, Lindsay, it's all yours. All righty. Share one more time. Okay. Hi. Thank you. So, yes, as um, Dr. Ozzy just mentioned, I am working in the lab of David McCormick. And I'm gonna to talk today about a project that I've been working on looking at the effect of vagus nerve stimulation on brain and behavioral state. So all this work was done in collaboration with Dr. Lara Boddington. Um, and here we go. So in order to understand a lot of the work that comes out of uh, Dr. McCormick's lab, you need to have an appreciation for arousal state and the effects that it has on um, uh, brain state. So if you're not familiar with, um, oh, why is it not going? There we go. If you're not familiar with arousal state, I think it's really helpful just to think of it in terms of sleeping. So of course, when you're asleep versus awake, there's these very different behavioral states. And these actually um, translate to differences in brain state. So here's just an example showing these slow oscillatory up and down states in slow wave sleep, and then fast oscillatory activity in waking state. So these are two very different brain states. And kind of together, you can think of this on a continuum of very low arousal state to high arousal state when you're um, up and awake and moving around and maybe a little stressed out. So within that waking state, there's actually fluctuations throughout the day and even on a small time course, so like second to second um, ar arousal state fluctuations from very low, drowsy, disengaged to high, stressed, hyper alert states. And work out of our lab and several others have shown across species and across um, cognitive and sensory tasks that you actually perform better when you're in this optimal intermediate zone. So kind of, you know, you're in the zone, you're not too stressed out. So you then can understand why it might be of interest to some people to be able to modulate that arousal state to put you in this optimal zone. So I'm gonna to talk to you about a manipulation that we found that reliably and pretty robustly increases arousal state. So it can push you from low to intermediate, even intermediate to high. So this is vagus nerve stimulation. It is uh, FDA approved for human work um, uh, for depression and epilepsy. It's also being studied for PTSD and um, recovery from stroke. Um, and we have some idea that it might operate on similar mechanisms that control arousal state. So work out of Texas from Daniel Halsey and Michael Kilgard's lab has shown that if you stimulate the vagus nerve and then record from the locus ceruleus, you can see dose dependent action potentials triggered from that vagus nerve stimulation. So it's innervating the locus ceruleus directly and you can get immediate action potentials. So this is important because the um, locus ceruleus sends out noradrenergic projections all throughout the brain, subcortically and cortically, and it is known to be um, involved in modulation of arousal state. And so I'm gonna show you some data right now from that I've collected in this lab, um, demonstrating this relationship between noradrenaline and um, behavioral state. So in our lab, we work with mice and um, what I'm showing you here is just a typical setup for one of our 
um, experiment. So the mouse is head fixed and he's on a, a freely moving wheel so we can measure rotational velocity to see how fast he's walking. We also have a video camera set up to measure or to video the face. And so from this, we'll get um, measurements of pupil diameter as well as um, orofacial movement. So this I'm gonna be calling whisk, although it really is just facial movement. It's not active whisking. And then we'll have some sort of brain imaging going on at the same time. So in this case, you're looking at activity from a noradrenergic axon in the cortex. So this is imaged via two photon um, calcium imaging. And what I hope stands out to you is that the noradrenergic activity tracks the behavioral state of the animal remarkably well. So every time you get a little increase in arousal or a little whisk, a little facial movement, there's an increase in noradrenergic activity. And so uh, this just is a, a quick one. What is any what is any there? And the and the, NA is and the water? Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we're looking at pupil walk whisk and then the noradrenergic activity in the cortex. Yeah. Um, and so this relationship has been shown in other labs and other contexts. And it's pretty fundamental for how we understand modulation of a cortical state and arousal state. So um, what we predicted then is that if we stimulate the vagus nerve, we will induce action potentials in the locus ceruleus, which would then send more adrenaline all throughout the brain. We would then see a change in cortical excitation and eventually a alteration of arousal state. So to do this research, we have to first implant a vagus nerve electrode. So it's a cuff electrode that we um, surgically implant. So this is an, an invasive technique where the nerve is represented by this dotted line, just rests inside this cuff. The mouse then recovers and we can um, measure all of those variables that I was showing before. So pupil, whisk, walking, all of that. And so as VNS comes on here in a moment, I hope that you notice that there's this very profound and pronounced increase in um, pupil diameter, as well as facial movement. Um, so to quantify this a bit, on the left, you're looking at pre-VNS pupil. So that's pupil diameter right before VNS onset compared to post-VNS pupil. So this is after the presentation of vagal nerve stimulation. And then almost every time the pupil diameter increased. And this was consistent across mice. That's what I'm showing you in the middle. So across eight mice that we looked at, same effects. And then we also found this um, interesting state dependent effect where if the mouse was already in a low arousal state, so if in pre, like the pre VNS um, pupil diameter was low, you see a much greater increase in pupil diameter than if it's already high. So this translates also to uh, behavioral state, yes? So sometimes when VNS was delivered, the animal would initiate a bout of walking and whisking. And so this was always coupled by a very large pupil diameter increase shown here on the left. And here's what that might look like, a whisk and a walk trace, all of our data combined. Sometimes the mouse didn't walk, but whisked. Sometimes the mouse did not move at all, but you still see this pronounced pupil, di pupil dilation. And then in a subset of experiments that you'll see here in a second, um, we lightly anesthetized our mice. And this is just to get rid of any contribution of motor activity on brain activity, because we know that obviously the brain co um, codes for a lot of um, movement. So we want to decouple what might be occurring from movement from what's VNS alone. So that's our lightly anesthetized state. And if you were concerned that maybe the mouse feels a little bit of electrical stimulation in its neck, we hope to convince you that that is not the case by cutting the vagus nerve. So getting rid of that input still stimulating through the electrode and we get rid of all arousal um, state responses. All right, so we looked at cortical excitation using wide field imaging. So this is a technique in which you can image through the skull of a mouse. And so we're looking at calcium indicators here, GCAMP 6S in this case, um, and it's expressed in um, using a thigh one promoter. So in, this is going to be expressed in all excitatory cortical cells. Um, and so with this technique, we're able to visualize the entire brain. Here's an example of what that looks like. I hope this video comes through for you guys. When that white box comes on right there, that's vagal nerve stimulation. So you can see this really broad increase in cortical, cortical excitability with a really rapid onset. Um, and this was true across multiple cortical regions. So we looked at motor, somatosensory, visual, as well as retrosplenial on the right and left hemisphere and found a similar effect. We even checked to see if how broadly it would go and tilted our head post to look at the barrel and auditory cortex on the lateral side and saw the same effect. 
and um, breaking down what this looks like um, with respect to motion. So when the VNS triggered a walking response, you see this huge increase in cortical activation shown here on the left, um, which is um, similar to what you might see with a, with a spontaneous walking bout. You do see this huge activation of cortex with just spontaneous walking. Um, similar for whisking, so you can see activation of um, somatosensory and motor cortices pretty well. But even in the anesthetized state, so even when there's no observable or detectable motor output, you still see cortical activation in multiple regions. And um, so we supplemented this with some two photon imaging. So now we're looking at layer two, three cells. So one of the problems with wide field imaging is that you get some um, background uh, fluorescence from other layers. So you might be getting um, neuropil from layer one. Um, this gets rid of that problem. So we looked specifically at these layer two, three cells. And in the awake state, we found that the cells were activated very strongly to VNS and um, pretty rapidly. So um, time to half max was on average around 300 milliseconds. This was similar in the anesthetized state. So we see a very robust response, although it is slightly dampened and um, is slightly delayed. All right, so to wrap it all up, I told you at the beginning that the vagus nerve innervates the locus ceruleus, which then projects these noradrenergic projections all throughout the brain. One of the places that it projects to is the basal forebrain. So basal forebrain is known for these dense cholinergic cell populations. And those cholinergic cells are in turn going to project throughout the brain cortically and subcortically. And it's also um, implicated in modulation of arousal state. So we're gonna look at these axons using two photon GCAM imaging um, in the axons of the cortex. And so here's some data just um, to describe this relationship. On the left, you're looking at the red trace is the noradrenergic axon. On the right is an example of cholinergic axon. And I hope that it stands out to you that they are very related to arousal state shown by whisker pad motion, long velocity and pupil. So if we do this um, and align everything to vagal nerve stimulation, you see this very robust increase in both noradrenaline and acetylcholine when the VNS triggers a walking or whisking bout. And when the VNS only triggers a small movement or no movement at all, like when we anesthetize the mouse, you still see pretty strong nor noradrenergic activation, but cholinergic activation, while significantly different than baseline, is much, much decreased from what you would see with our walking and whisking. And the, um, Oh, and yeah, so last thing is I wanted to point out, these are all of our data. So I think this is a nice way to look at the time course of how these things are being activated. So when VNS comes on, you get a really rapid increase in whisker pad motion, along with cortical activation of noradrenergic, cholinergic, and excitatory cell populations. Um, that's followed by walking, and then finally pupil dilation. And then in the anesthetized state, you see a very similar pattern, slightly delayed cholinergic activation, and of course, walking and whisking as well. Um, so with that, I, oh my goodness, have done actually good on time. I would like to thank everybody. So this is the McCormick Lab, everyone who kind of contributed to this work. Um, we are collaborating with Matt McGinley at Baylor and Rob Kromke at NYU, um, and we are funded by DARPA. So yeah, with that, I'll take any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, Lindsay. It was sure. great. Uh, and you're actually on time. So that's good. So that really leaves us at least. I did not expect that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it was not fast. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, um, so any questions uh, coming for you? So people are really liking your talk. Uh, so we have first question coming for you. Is any interacting with ACH system? Yeah, so we have no direct evidence that that is the case. Um, so yeah, we, we're not quite, you know, we don't, we don't know, I can't say for sure. I would say that it is likely that these, um, co these neurogenergic projections likely are increasing excitability within the basal forebrain, which is helping to uh, excite these cholinergic projections, which then carry on. Um, but our, our data don't suggest that, but I would, I would guess yes. Okay. Okay, that's good. Um, so any other questions?
Uh, so how long is, uh, okay, so we have another one coming in, so, uh, uh, probably more interesting than mine. Uh, fantastic talk. VNS is very exciting. Yeah, we all agree. Uh, given such a widespread activation, do you see it as being more specific than pharmacological activation of the NS system? That's tough to say. Um, yeah, that's tough. I mean, yeah, I it's it's truly in and at least the ways that we've looked at it, it there's very little specificity that we can find. You know, like when we when we started this project, we thought, you know, maybe there's a brain region that gets activated first, at least, like maybe not only, but at least first. And we're having like a terrible time finding that. Like it seems to be pretty widespread simultaneous activation. Um, so I don't know. I I actually am not. I, I would argue that the vagal nerve stimulation that we're delivering, which could be different than what someone might have implanted, you know, if they had epilepsy, um, is pretty nonspecific. Um, so the vagus nerve has um, fibers that will control different things, right? Um, so some will project to, um, are more likely to project to the GABAergic or interneurons of the locus ceruleus. Some are more likely to project to the um, noradrenergic uh, cells there. So there's really not a lot of specificity in what we're doing because we are cuffing the whole nerve with no specificity at all. There is some work out there that's optogenetically um, activating specific subtypes of uh, vagus nerve um, axons that are like coursing up to the brain. Um, so in that sense, you might get some specificity, but certainly not with what we do. Okay, that's great. Okay, so I think we are, uh, yeah, running out of time. So it was great, great, Lindsay, very enjoyable. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So we need to move on to uh, to Anna Flosovic. Uh, so Anna is a postdoc in the University of Rijeka, Croatia. Yes, correct, correct. <laughs> <laughs> that would be uh, Rijeka in Croatian. I'm sorry <laughs> to interfere <laughs> with your proper pronunciation. But that's all right. And she'll be talking about influence of dopamine signaling and oxidative meta metabolism on fluorescent advanced uh, glycation and products formation in Dosophilia mil milanogaster. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you, Adele, for a nice uh, introduction. And uh, yeah, I will uh, start talking uh, about uh, one invertebrate model organism, which is Drosophila menelogaster, commonly known fruit fly. And uh, as you um, actually said, I work at the Department of Biotechnology at University of Rijeka in the laboratory of uh, Rosie Andretich. Poldowski. So our uh, focus in uh, work is basically uh, associated with the drug addiction and also implication which it has on the brain plasticity and uh, induced changes. So this work is uh, one small side project or piece of what we are actually doing. So I will start with the brain energy metabolism and dopamine uh, implying uh, age formation. So we all know that uh, our uh, CNS or brain is feeding by glucoses, uh, which can be delivered through the GLUT3 um, transporter on the membrane of the neurons. But also we know that we have uh, energy shuffling uh, due to the lactate production inside the astrocytes, which then can feed uh, our neurons. So what I want to emphasize now is that we know that pharmacological manipulation of the dopaminergic system can uh, affect glucose homeostasis in uh, our uh, neurons. And also I want to emphasize that uh, if we have a situation with the increased amount of the glucose, which is induced by uh, hyperglycemia, then we have uh, something that calls age, which are advanced age, uh, advanced glycation and products, which are non-enzymatic glycation of the protein structures, uh, protein which is reversible, post-translation uh, post -translation modification of the protein structure. And it is also really important to emphasize that age are a really heterogeneous group of compounds and they are implicated in uh, diverse uh, metabolic uh, changes and also uh, some uh, neurodegenerative disease. But there is, since, since now there is no clear connection between glucose metabolic deficiency and uh, phage formation. So now I will to explain to you what phages are. So 
H are heterogeneous group of compounds. So that are all the extracellular and intracellular protein modification induced by non enzymatic uh, addition of uh, covalent addition of uh, sugars on their structures. Uh, phage have tendency to aggregate, but they are separated in three different groups. And uh, the group that we are interested in are those with the autofluorescence properties. Uh, this is important because it is allowing us a currency select activity and sensitivity in the quantification. And uh, the most important of all, it uh, all, uh, already has some clinical application in terms of the determination of the phage uh, in a patient's skin. So that, this was the reason why we focus uh, all of our work on the phage formation. So our aims in our work was to synthesize and characterize phage BSA standard calibrator, then to uh, define cellular localization of phage in uh, our model organism, also to test the influence of monoamines on phage formation in vivo, then see how does short and long-term imbalance in DNA signaling and phage formation uh, is uh, induced in vivo, and then to see if we can um, somehow inhibit phage formation by applying antioxidants. So to synthesize our standard calibrator, we use our model protein, which is uh, BSA or bovine cell bone uh, serum albumin, uh, together with the uh, reductive sugar glucosis. And then we heat it up on the 50 Celsius degree in the dark, and that process was uh, up to 96 hours. So this is important uh, since uh, we uh, were able to synthesize fluorescence advised glycation and product of the, the model protein uh, BSA. Uh, since uh, we know that this process of glycation is really slow, heating uh, the, um, our samples on the 50 Celsius degree uh, was success and we were able to get it uh, uh, the phage BSA final product after only 96 hours. So we wanted to characterize our standard calibrator by using uh, emission fluorescence uh, spectroscopy from which we can see that only samples containing uh, HBSA uh, were having a maximum of um, emission fluorescence at uh, 440 nanometers, which is characteristic for uh, phage in the samples. In order to uh, see if there is correlation uh, in uh, concentration regarding re uh, relative, relative fluorescence intensity, we saw that we have a linear correlation and concluded that phage BSA can be used as a standard calibrator. In order to test where the phages are inside of the tissue samples, uh, we actually uh, took five adult male flies in each sample and put them in the empty uh, tube while we did the mechanical homogenization. By applying PBT protocol, which means that we apply buffer plus non-ionic detergent, we were able to uh, extract extracellular and cytosolic proteins. Then we test protocol with the trypsin uh, proteolysis in order to digest extracellular and cytosolic proteins, and also only PBS in order to focus ourselves only on the extracellular proteins. Regarding the cellular localization of phase formation, we have situation when we have excess of glucose, this all methylglyoxylate, which is a final product of the uh, glycosylation reaction. And this is important to emphasize since this product over here is 50,000 times more reactive than this glucose over here in order to uh, um, add itself uh, covalently, but, but also non-enzymatic to protein structure, which are in the extracellular or intracellular space of the cell. So what happened is that we have then intracellular and extracellular phage formation, which is then implying different um, protein uh, function changes and also signal cascade and gene expression. So what we have seen is that when we applied only a PBS, uh, PBT protocol, which was extracting both extracellular and intracellular proteins, we were, we, we were seeing that that is a uh, actually product of uh, intracellular protein since the PBS protocol had really low amount of the phage in the samples. But when we uh, look into the phage concentration and influence of the trypsin digestion, we saw that there is uh, no influence on the protein concentration regarding phage concentration. 
So we uh, actually decided to focus ourselves on the intracellular and intracellular phages, since we know that DA transports the dopamine transport and signaling influence pre and postsynaptic neurons together with synaptic cleft proteins. Then we tested the influence of the uh, playing around with the uh, dopamine concentration. So I know that this is not uh, the case with the uh, vertebrate models, but in, in, in vertebrate models like Drosophila, feeding flies for 48 hours with triodotyrosine, which is inhibitor of dopamine uh, synthesis inside of the neurons, or L-DOPA, which is a pre of the dopamine synthesis, we can increase or decrease the amount of the, uh, of the dopamine inside of uh, Drosophila whole body. So what we saw is that when we uh, reduce or when we uh, increase amount of the uh, dopamine inside of the vesicula, or let's say better increasing over all the pools, we don't have any influence on the phage formation in vivo. Uh, based on that, we tried to look into the imbalance uh, in the DA transport and signaling, and then how that is actually influenced phage formation. And what we did, we uh, did the, the same protocol as it was uh, said before. We fed flies with the methamphetamine or cocaine, which are known psychostimulants affecting the dopaminergic system. And also we used two mutant fly lines, which are fumin uh, with the mutation in dopamine transporter and dump with the mutation in dopamine receptor. Uh, and what we can see from this data over here is that short-term manipulation uh, and influence on imbalance in DA transport and signal impairment is um, less pronounced than the long-term uh, 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 impairment in DA transport and signaling induced in uh, mutant flies. In order to better understand what is happening in uh, mat and cocaine um, treated flies regarding increased amount of the phage in MAT group compared to the cocaine, we can see that uh, we have increased amount of the dopamine uh, in, in the synaptic cleft when we apply both of the drugs. But major difference is looking at the mechanistic uh, level of the uh, action of those two drugs is that in the methamphetamine case, we have increased of the pre-dopamine inside of the neurons. So we have huge efflux of the dopamine in case of the methamphetamine compared to cocaine. When we look into the fumin and dump mutants, so this is the mutant dopamine transporter, this is the mutant on dopamine receptor, we again have a different situation. We have a, again a change in the amount of the dopamine. So this one is um, uh, this one is synaptic and this one is extracellular. And uh, when we look into the abundance of the phage uh, and compare fumin to dumb butane, we again can see that there is increase uh, in dumb butane compared to the fumin. Uh, and we actually believe that that is the case because we again have more of the pre-dopamine inside of the cell. And as we showed be earlier, uh, that intracellular phage are more pronounced to total phage uh, when we do whole body extraction uh, of the protein. And then uh, to conclude this part of the uh, dopamine uh, impairment, uh, we can see that uh, both cases, when we have increased amount of the dopamine inside of the cells, we have more of the phage formation. Nevertheless, is that short or long-term manipulation with the DA transport and uh, signaling. And then, um, we can conclude that uh, phage concentration in vivo is independent of overall DA pools, so those vesicular pools, but uh, influenced by DA impairment in transport and signaling. And finally, what we wanted to test, uh, if we can inhibit this uh, process of uh, phage formation induced by methamphetamine free dopamine oxidation. So we used quercetin, which is known uh, inhibitor for phage uh, in vitro and in vivo. And what we saw that uh, quercetin alone does not influence phage uh, uh, formation in vivo that uh, is significant, but when we apply methamphetamine and quercetin together in combination, uh, we have seen uh, inhibitory influence. So all this uh, data together is implying that combination of methamphetamine and quercetin in vivo uh, have shown a reduction in phage, which is then implicating perhaps DA oxidative metabolism, which is involved in the phage formation. 
And now to conclude, we can say that we were successful for a synthesis of the standard calibrator, which was the, for us phage BS8. And then also that phage concentration is associated with the cellular localization. Uh, the most important outcome of this uh, research was that phage concentration in vivo is independent of overall DL pools, but it is uh, heavily influenced by the impairment in transport and signaling. And also that uh, combination of methamphetamine and quercetin together in vivo have shown reduction in phage formation, which is then implicated the dopamine oxidative metabolism involvement in the phage formation. And finally, these results presented here, uh, we believe that can be used for further testing of phage in the context of the neurodegenerative disease disorder biomarker. And for the end of my presentation, I would like to thank uh, my PI, Rosiandra Tishvaldowski, in whose lab I'm working right now as a postdoc. Also our funding, which is the uh, Croatian Science Foundation, University of Rijeka support, and uh, our uh, teammates or students which were working with us, that would be a bachelor Erasmus student, Katarina Jovic, and uh, Emanuel Pishtan, from whom I'm really uh, super um, proud because he's only high school student and he's able to follow up with this uh, heavy uh, and really complicated uh, situation regarding a uh, phage formation in um, a living organism such as Rosophila. Thank you. And yeah, I'm happy to take any question. Uh, thank you, Anna. It was great. Um, and I see the implications for the neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, probably you can um, expand on that a bit, uh, unless we have further questions coming for you. So are there any questions for you? Uh, are there any questions for Anna? Nobody likes flies. <laughs> no, I think people like, uh, but I think uh, it means that it was very clear uh, and concise and there were no questions. Uh, so, um, but um, yeah, so what are, so, so, uh, and this area is also um, much out of my comfort zone as well. I, I work mm -hmm. with humans um, at the macro scale level. Um, so, but what, what, so, but I do a lot of uh, work in neurodegenerative diseases um, at the whole, whole brain level. So mm -hmm. I see, I see where you're going. So what, what do you think it's uh, something which uh, uh, can be used, uh, um, you know, uh, what are the translational implications here? Well, uh, for sure, um, I mean, uh, dopamine is influencing the glucose levels for sure. And um, we know that uh, if we are reducing or, you know, uh, just playing around with the overall pool DA concentration, we don't, we don't see nothing. So that means that in normal health people, you know, if you're, you know, I don't know, hungry, or if, if I mean, if you're something like that, and you get your primary reward in, 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 in the way of the food or something, uh, then uh, the phage concentration will be always remain the same. But for some reason, which I, I really now cannot elaborate good enough, because I don't know nothing about the glucose levels in these flies in their brains, um, and also nothing about uh, the uh, metabolism switching, uh, when we have impairment in uh, DA. So for sure, there are some implications that uh, we have something, uh, I, I have some slides which are hidden uh, for sure in this presentation. And so we did some uh, um, additional testing in uh, vitro, not only in vivo, to play around with the protein structure and so on. And what we saw is that, for instance, dopamine uh, is really tricky, uh, although small, but really tricky compound, and it can bind to protein structure, but not through the amine group, but to the sulfur group, so tile group in protein structure. So we believe perhaps that in that case, we are missing the modification, which can be induced by the dopamine. Rather, okay. the, I mean, there is a modification, but it's not glycation modification. So yeah, that makes sense. I mean, perfect sense to me. Um, I, I think we have Taha here, and and I think he's here because I think we are getting late now. 
Mm-hmm. So we are over time, uh, but we should thank Taha for his uh, support for this session. He was at the back end uh, providing the IT stuff. Uh, thanks a lot, Taha, and thanks everyone. Thanks, thanks all the speakers. It was great fun. It was a very exciting uh, session, and I yeah, and and bye bye from my side now. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Have a great day or night. So, so we will be able to see whoever is participant. I think we as a panelist we do, yeah. Yeah. We are live. Okay. Okay, we'll wait a few seconds for more people to join and I'll start. Welcome everybody who is joining. Okay, I think because the time is tight, I will start. Uh, hello everyone. Um, my name is Alex Hernandez. I'm speaking to you from uh, Madrid right now, and I will be the moderator of, of this session. This is session 29.12.5 at Neuromatch 3. Welcome. Uh, I also want to thank um, Saeed Saleh, who is doing a lot of uh, work from behind the scenes. And yeah, we have a great lineup of speakers today. Uh, they are Rafael Lazar, uh, Manuel Spitschan, and Jeroen Schmeitz. And they are going to talk about uh, physiological aspects of visual perception and as well the perception of size. Um, remember, you are very welcome to tweet about the talks uh, during, after the talk, whenever you like. You can use the hashtag uh, NMC3. And please ask questions, uh, use the chat. You are very welcome. Uh, there's no stupid questions. Please make it as, interest, as interactive as you can. Yeah, our first speaker is Rafael Lazar. He just finished it, finished his master's degree at the Justus Liebig University Gießen, where there's a lot of uh, visual perception research going on, by the way. And yeah, he will start uh, soon a PhD at uh, the Center for Chronobiology at the University of Basel in Switzerland. Yeah, so without further ado, please, uh, Rafael, stage is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen here. Um, start the presentation. Um, there we go. All right. Uh, share screen. And the right window. So we can see. Yeah. All right. Um, I just want to start by thanking my team first. Uh, Manuel Spitschan, who is in the panel here, is actually co authoring this research. And I want to thank our team in the Center for Chronobiology in Basel, as well as our funders who made this research possible. So I want to start by talking about pupil in general. The pupil has been a very special outcome variable used in different research. And it's so special because it's so versatile. So it has been used for risk assessment in neurological diseases and injury, as well as for detection in emotional events and sensory events. And uh, there's also cognitive processes that can be seen by a dilation of the pupil. But most critically, it's important for visual functioning. So there's effects of accommodation on pupil size, but the most pronounced effect is its effect in response to light. And it regulates the light that hits our retina. So I, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with this effect from your own eyes. And that is, um, in a broader sense, you can think of the pupil like a bouncer to a club, basically. So when light is scarce, then we have as much light getting in there as possible. So the pupil is dilated. But once the light gets brighter and we have plenty of light, then the pupil constricts and only lets in as much as needed for high quality vision. This is also demonstrated in this video here, which I'm still amazed by actually how, how different the pupil can look. And uh, on top you have the dark adapted pupil, which is fully dilated and huge in comparison to the bright light adapted pupil on the bottom row. 
And apart from the fascinating fact how different the pupil of one individual can look, there's these effects of inter-individual differences. So when you compare, for instance, the eyes of these two individuals, you can see that the fully dilated pupils are very different. This has also been um, looked at in the research of Watson and Yellett, who had a very meta-analytic approach to looking at pupil size. And then they derived a unified model from looking at eight extant studies and computing or estimating pupil size from this data. What they used for quantifying light is the measure luminance, which is also very known for, um, for an accurate measurement or accurate estimate that is uh, for brightness perception. It is basically computed by looking at the sensitivity curves or look, taking the sensitivity curves of L and M counts. So let's talk about the photoreceptors real quick. You're probably very familiar. Um, we have the L, M and S cones who are necessary for daylight vision or um, color vision, in fact. And then we have the rods, which are only used in very dim light conditions. So they saturate under very bright light and they are necessary for us, for our rudimentary vision in um, very dark environments. But apart from these visual photoreceptors, there's also this more recently discovered melanopic um, photopigment, which is expressed by the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. This is very interesting because these are not necessarily used in vision, but they are used in non-visual effects. For instance, in the inhibition process uh, caused by light, when inhibition of uh, melatonin, I meant, um, caused by light. And apart from all these photoreceptors having different sensitivity curves, which do overlap, overlap though, they have differences in their temporal response to light. So melanopsin response of the IPRGC specifically has been shown to be a very slow response. So it, is, it has a long latency along with a sustained response and it can be called very sluggish in fact. So what, it, what is it about pupil size? How do these photoreceptors contribute? Well, all of them actually contribute but the when and how is critical here. So when we look at photopic steady state light conditions, which we are arguably surrounded by most of the time, like, like now in our wakefulness, then we can see that melanopic weighted measures. So melanopsin is actually a better representation of our pupil size shown in this graph here than luminous measurements. So luminous would be more uh, accurate for brightness perception, for instance. And these are monochromatic lights here, by the way. And then McDougall and Gamlin have shown that the cone response that influences pupil size is only really meaningful in the first few seconds after a light stimulus onset. And after some seconds, the melanopsin signal is the most dominant one to contribute to pupil size. We actually have quite a lot of research on the pupil from the 20s to now, you can find a huge amount of data, but this is restricted to almost every study is restricted to limited um, labor laboratory settings. So most of them not necessarily like this old school <laughs> kind of pupillography, but most of them use static setups and only very few of them look at outdoor light, for instance, but these don't really have dynamic outdoor lighting as well. Uh, they mostly stay confined to one specific location. And furthermore, they don't use melanopsin weighted measures, but more the L and M cone weighted ones. So the question basically still remains, what does the pupillary light response look like in a complex multivariate world. So the world that we actually move and live in. And to tackle this question, we devised a new ambulatory measurement setup. So we used a spectral radiometer and put it on the forehead, adjustable and angle. 
and we combined it with an eye tracker from Pupil Labs. This was coordinated by a Raspberry Pi computer that made both of those devices take 10 second simultaneous samples. And um, curiously, we were able to move around with these measurement devices as much as we wanted to. So we were able to measure pupil size along with melanopic irradiance, or in fact, any other cone or, or whatever weighted light, we get this irradiance measurement along with pupil size. And as you probably can imagine, there are different lights that lead to different pupil sizes that we can compute from these still images that we took. And um, we measured in seven healthy young participants aged 20 to 30. And we were able to move around freely, like I said, in completely uncontrolled conditions. And I think the most important thing is we still were able to retain 65% of our data, which was quite high because you have to imagine when looking around, your eyes move, the bright might hit a certain spot and reflect. And we still had 65% of usable data. Uh, so these observation pairs of pupil size and spectral irradiance. The two protocols in which we measured these with these seven participants, they were a little different regarding their light intensity um, distribution. So you can see this on the left and on the right, you can see how closely related the photopic illuminance, so the lux and the melanopic irradiance measurements are. And they are really closely related as shown on the diagonal. And this, these outliers that you can see here are just the result of our control conditions in the lab that where we had high contrast, for instance, this blue light, which would stimulate the melanopsin much more. So the real world data is actually very highly correlated. So let's have a look at our results. Um, we can see on this, in this graph, we can see the, uh, on the x-axis, we can see the correlations. So the higher the bars are, the higher the rank correlation is. And um, let's have a look at the simultaneous samples. So on the x-axis, we have different melanopic irradiance samples, and these are time shifted. So this would be the correlation of the simultaneous sample of pupil size and melanopic irradiance. And then when we go back by 10 seconds, looking at the light measurement 10 seconds before pupil size, then we can see the correlations start to rise. So we have a stronger correlation in the 40 seconds before the pupil size measurement, when we measure the light there, than with the simultaneous ones which would actually be consistent with the idea of melanopsin being a sluggish signaling um, photoreceptor. So conservatively, what we did here is we averaged the, the 60 second window of light measurements and predicted this one pupil size measurement from it. And we can plot this in individual dose response curves. So this would be one individual having the data there. And we, on the x-axis, we have this average melanopic irradiance in the last 60 seconds before pupil size. And then we have the pupil diameter on the y-axis. And as you can see, there's very stable prediction in the bright light and a more fuzzy prediction in the dim to medium light, which is consistent across participants. And we have high rank correlations all the way. So to conclude, we devised a novel para uh, paradigm for predicting pupil size in completely uncontrolled conditions while retaining 65% of the data. Um, our pupil size is stronger associated with preceding than with simultaneous samples in line with the melanopsin signaling shown before. And apart from more research, hopefully being conducted with this setup, are, for example, assessing retinal injury risk, predicting circadian effects, or estimating our visual uh, performance and light sensitivity. So thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to the questions. Yeah, thank you very much for, for the presentation. 
Um, yeah, we actually have one question by Megan Vaughan. So she first says, uh, great presentation and great idea. So what percentage of data were you expecting to retain before you began collecting? And how do you think you could improve this? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we were looking to, actually we had in mind to have at least a half of the data there. So um, I think most of the time, the problem was with very bright light conditions, we had reflections of light on the eye and a lot of eye movement. So one thing is you can talk to your participants and tell them not to move their eyes as much. And furthermore, you can look for light that is not extremely, like when you have sunlight shining directly on the light, it's there's less data retention. But um, in general, I think 50% was the one thing we were looking for and 65% is a very good value already. So um, I think this is a trade-off that we have to have when moving around. Mm -hmm. Thanks. We have another question, but uh, I think maybe you can you can uh, answer on the chat because we need mm -hmm. to move on. And, and I want to thank you again for the great presentation. Very interesting, Rafael. Thank you. The question to the chat. Yeah, our next speaker is uh, Manuel Spitschen. Um, he finished his PhD in uh, 2016, and he's now a researcher and lecturer at the University of Oxford in the UK, uh, where he studies the effect of light on human visual, uh, visual and non-visual physiology. And he's going to talk today uh, about retinal inputs to human neuroendocrine and circadian physiology. Welcome, Manuel. Super, thank you. Can you, can you hear me and see my screen? All good to go, great. Uh, well, thanks, um, Alex, for, for hosting us. And also thanks to the uh, NeuroMatch um, conference. I think it's a really, really great opportunity, I think, to learn about all kinds of exciting science, uh, which I think we, we all, we're all very grateful for. Uh, so I'll be talking today about retinal inputs to human neuroendocrine and circadian physiology. Before I jump into my talk, I just want to thank the various people who I've had the pleasure and privilege of working with over the last couple of years, as well as my funders. Now, my research really starts at the question of how light affects human non-visual physiology. So obviously, when we're thinking about the effects of light, often we're thinking about, you know, light enabling us to see, to identify objects, to see color, space, motion, etc. But there's a whole other class of effects of light on us that we are just kind of beginning to study um, systematically and parametrically. And I think it's a quite, a, quite exciting field uh, and one where there's, I think, a lot of development that's going to come out of this in the next couple of years. Um, specifically, then, two major effects that are studied in this field are melatonin suppression by light. So the, the melatonin uh, is a hormone that's produced by the body naturally. It rises in the evening. And if you're exposing yourself to a very bright light in the evening, that production is suppressed. Similarly, and through a similar but not the same pathway, uh, light shifts the circadian rhythm around. So what happens is you are basically shifting that melatonin rhythm by a certain amount if you expose yourself to uh, light at the wrong time. Um, all of these effects are mediated by the retina. So this is a diagram that Raphael already showed. Just to remind you, there's various photosensitive elements in the retina. There's the rods, which enable us to see kind of rudimentarily during dim light con uh, conditions. There's the cones. And there's the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. And these intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, or IPRGCs abbreviated, are photosensitive due to the photopigment melanopsin. And it's only really been 20, 25 years or so that we know that there's another fifth photoreceptor class in the human retina, which of course makes it very exciting. Um, and melanopsin is the photopigment that's involved in these non-visual effects of light. What I wanted to focus on was really understanding on how do cones contribute to, contribute to these non-visual processes. And I specifically focused on the S cones because they're short wavelength sensitive. Um, you know, they might be involved in this process as well. What are the what, what's what are the motivating factors or what are the motivating data points? The first one was finding that S cone uh, signals produce a paradoxical pupil response. So an increase in S cone signals leads to a, a dilation of the pupil, which is counterintuitive and opposite to what you would expect. And the second data point is that short wavelength sense the data on on um, collected from action spectra uh, studies showed that there's, there appears to be uh, some short wavelength, sens short wavelength sensitivity that's not accounted for by melanopsin. And so it's this kind of these data points that really drove asking us the question, well, can we find an S-cone contribution to melatonin suppression? 
Um, of course, these studies are very different from your vision science experiments. They're evening studies. Participants spend a couple of hours in the evening and get exposed to different kinds of light sources. What we did in this study was we exploited the method of sound substitution to create pairs of stimuli uh, that have the feature that they differentially only stimulate the S cones. So this is the spectrum on the x-axis uh, and the irradiance on the y-axis. And these spectral pairs are set up so, such that there's about a two order of magnitude difference in S cone excitation, uh, factor 83, while, with minimal difference in M cone, L cone, rod and melanopsin stimulation. And so really then if there's any difference in response to these pairs, this pair of stimuli, uh, what, should, what that should indicate is that S cones do contribute to melatonin suppression. It's basically a way to separate out the contribution of S cones relative to other photoreceptor classes. Um, this is kind of what the stimuli looked like. They were presented using a viewing box. And of course, because we're stimulating S cones in isolation here, um, they look different as well. So S cones obviously contribute to color vision and therefore the S minus so of the S cone depleted versus the S cone enhanced stimuli uh, look different there, you know, orange and pinkish. So we exposed participants to these, these types of lights and we measured their melatonin concentrations with the hope of finding a difference or at least characterizing if there's a difference. And I'm gonna jump straight into the data, the results. Um, if you're looking at the melatonin concentrations uh, as a time course over the course of the evening, you basically see no difference uh, whether you're exposed to the S minus or the S plus uh, light. So a Basically, this means that there's no significant or no evidence for an S-cone mediated uh, driving of, of melatonin suppression, at least using these types of um, manipulations. We also looked at sleepiness. So that's a, a subjective rating scale asking how sleepy do you feel and vigilant attention. And we found no difference in, in these kind of objective uh, parameters of, of performance. And so overall, I think this speaks to the idea that at least in these, using these stimuli, we can't find an S-cone effect. Um, of course, you know, just to, to have a positive control, we ask a bunch of other questions, right? So we asked how comfortable is the light, how bright is it, et cetera, using rating scales. There's pretty much no difference between the, um, the, 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 these ratings except for color temperature, where obviously the warmer looking light will appear, will be rated as warmer. And interestingly, just as a side note, the general well-being of the participants decreased over the course of the study. And then just as they were about to leave the lab again, there was an uptick. Uh, in summary, then, we find no strong S-cone contribution to melatonin suppression under the conditions that we used here, which are really biased to finding a difference, right? So a two order of magnitude difference is really, um, you know, it's a large, should, be, should, drive, a, should, should drive the S-cones with a large signal. Um, and so now we're obviously facing this discrepancy with the action spectrum data, right? Because we did see there might be a uh, short wavelength sensitive pole um, that is not accounted for by melanopsin. And it's probably uh, due to the fact that monochromatic lights and action spectra produce a larger differential contrast. And there's other differences in protocols such as use of pupil dilation and timing, et cetera. So I think the, there's still a lot of work I think to be done um, regarding the mechanisms, right? So you can imagine that under certain conditions, you might find an S-cone contribution. The other class of photoreceptors that I investigated were the rods. Uh, and so this is a relatively uh, novel or new, new approach to, to, uh, to understanding the photoreceptor inputs here. So we were looking specifically at a class of patients who do not have functional cones. So generally in the, in the uh, healthy human retina, Again, you have three classes of cones, you have rods and the IPRGCs, but in congenital achromatopsia, uh, which affects about one in 30,000 to one in 50,000 people, the cones are basically non-functional. And so presumably then the only two photoreceptors that these patients have are the rods and the IPRGCs. Um, of course, if you don't have a functional cone system, what that basically means is that you're quite light averse. Uh, photophobia is one of the symptoms of, of congenital achromatopsia, simply because the rods will saturate at daytime light levels, uh, which obviously would facilitate, you know, what vision would be facilitated in these levels uh, using the cones, which these folks don't have. And just to give you an idea of, of kind of the range or what that means for the range of light exposures that, that congenital achromats might have. So this is kind of the, the overall several orders of magnitude range of Light, lighting conditions that we might encounter. Um, if you think 
as of rod saturation as the point at which the rods no longer function and effectively for congenital achromats, that means they have about half the range, uh, half the dynamic range of vision uh, available. And of course that has consequences then for the light exposure that might be relevant for the non-visual effects um, of light. We did a little bit of a theoretical analysis first, which was to ask, well, okay, um, these people who, who, are, uh, who have a congenital achromatopsia wear typically filters to uh, enhance the S cone contrast, but also to reduce the signal so they can operate and see during daytime light conditions. And what we basically asked, well, what does that mean for the melanopsin signal? So we know rods and melanopsin are spectrally very close. Their spectral sensitivity is very, very similar. And so this is just a simulation where we took 401 uh, illuminance spectra and we asked, well, you know, what is the rod and the melanopsin um, activation produced by these spectra? Uh, and then we asked um, basically, how is that changed when you are looking at these same spectra using the filter? So these using the, the commonly used filters. These are cutoff filters that have spe specific spectral characteristics. And what you can see here basically is they will be just by design, uh, change the activation of um, melanopsin and rods at the same time. So they will conjointly modulate uh, rods and melanopsin signals. Um, which obviously then for, for a non-visual perspective is quite interesting because it poses the question, well, what is their circadian and sleep phenotype? There's no prior work on this. We found a New York Times article that claimed that uh, many with the disorder are proud night owls who love going out after dark. In the standard book on this uh, condition, there's no references to this. And it's very different from other types of blindness where melatonin might be preserved, but there's no photophobia. So what we did was basically three studies. One was a questionnaire based one. Uh, we found uh, a higher incidence of you know, uh, sleep problems, uh, more pronounced or you know, existence of, of, of poor sleep, a tendency towards later chronotypes, so later, later sleep, and generally uh, also um, less um, uh, a higher visual discomfort. Uh, we then asked, well, what about their rest activity cycles? So we asked them to wear these active watches in a three week period um, to study, are their rest activity cycles regular? Uh, what we find is these are actigrams where the one line corresponds to a 48 hour period. Um, you do see, you know, synchronization of activity to at least daytime light. Uh, so the idea here is obviously that you do see regular rest activity cycles in these patients. If you look at the averages, you, very, you see very similarly, uh, you know, obviously activity during the day and no activity or low activity during the night. But what this doesn't tell us is if there is actually a light input into the circadian process. So what we did here was basically using the best biomarker that we kind of have for circadian rhythms, which is melatonin. We used the dim light melatonin onset, which basically refers to the time point at which the melatonin level levels are rising in the evening, sometime prior to habitual bedtime. And participants completed this uh, in an at-home collection protocol, which we, um, we later then assayed that for melatonin. This is just one data set here. Uh, so you have this characteristic increase in, uh, in melatonin levels, and you can basically pinpoint when that melatonin level rises above a certain threshold. We call that the phase angle of entrainment, the melatonin phase angle of entrainment. We see this kind of pattern looks like a hockey stick and that's what we fit to it as well um, in four of our subjects and in two of our subjects, we couldn't find it. So basically at least we have, um, uh, you know, convincing evidence that in some of these patients we have uh, a preserved melatonin uh, uh, cycle that's linked to their rest activity. Um, these two participants here where we didn't see an increase there were a couple of factors that could have contributed to this. Both of these were over 65, and we know in, eight, in elderly participants, melatonin levels are generally lower. But at least we find normal DILMO and normal phase angles of entrainments in four of our participants. So just to summarize this part of the study, uh, we find regular rest activity cycles despite the lack of a functional tone system and the resulting reduced light exposure range, relatively normal phase angles of entrainment, and so this is obviously stuff, stuff that we will still need to work on, but this possibly points to an adaptation mechanism that basically scales the light inputs into, into the operating range. Um, with that, I wanna uh, thank you um, for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Also, again, thanks uh, to the organizers for facilitating this. 
Thank you very much for the for the talk, Manuel. I, I personally learned a lot. I don't know if there's no questions at the moment. If there's one, we would have time for one very quickly. Um, I was wondering if you can answer briefly uh, if you had so you didn't find like S uh, con contribution um, in the in the first study. Uh, I was wondering if if that if if you were expecting something else uh, before the study or. Or is this what you expected? Yeah, so I think, so it depends a little bit on which data set you use to motivate your study. So in some data sets you do see, it's all accounted for by melanopsin. And in this one study, you do see evidence that it might be S cones that are involved. I think it depends a little bit on uh, what you what you use as your starting point to, to formulate the hypothesis. We had the idea that, well, we've created lighting conditions or light stimuli that produce the maximum difference in S cone activation. And therefore, if there was one, we, we should be able to find it here. But it is possible that, you know, even a two order of magnitude difference isn't sufficient uh, for, for to find this effect. And I think there's also can, probably, you can probably find other protocols to, to enhance the possibility of finding such an effect as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, if uh, the audience have questions for, for Manuel, you may ask on the, the chat. Uh, so with this, we're going to move to the last speaker of the session. Uh, he's uh, your own mate, um, and he's professor in human movement sciences at the um, Freie Universität Amsterdam, where I actually was lucky to attend a lot of talks when, when I was uh, interning there. And yeah, he studies the way um, sensory information guides our movements and, and also sensory processing itself, which is the, the topic of, of his talk today. So. Welcome, your own, and looking forward to your to your presentation. You have to, your own. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. Ah, there you go. Thank you. The effect of familiar size on size perception, and it's a work to, done together with Pauline Weiss and Ali Branagh. And I think uh, for the audience I have today, I should explain what I'm uh, talking about. Uh, it's the familiarity uh, in perception, uh, how that influences our perception. For instance, if we look at this image, we see a leaf and the leaf seems closer than the girl. And the reason is that we know that the size of a leaf actually is smaller than the face of the girl. So if it's bigger on our retina, it should be uh, uh, is because it is closer. So we perceive objects that we know that are small as near than objects that we know that are large given an equal size on our retina. So this is what I would call uh, assimilation so, or Bayesian. So we combine our expectations with our sensory information to get to our perception. However, this is not the only way in uh, our familiarity affects perception. Uh, a second uh, category is uh, what you could call anti-Bayesian. So it works in the opposite way. And uh, a very a large effect is uh, in uh, the perception of heaviness. Uh, if we have four objects as depicted here, an image uh, from Gavin Buckingham, uh, you see cubes of uh, apparently different material and different size. And you might expect that the metal large cube is heavy and the styrofoam small one is the lightest. But if you lift them, you'll perceive that the uh, metal uh, and uh, a large one feel light and the styrofoam and small one feel heavy. So what you perceive is the contrast between your expectations and your sensory input. So that is, you could call anti basin Okay, these examples, we're about the indirect effect of familiar size on the judgment of uh, other properties like distance and weight. But what about a direct judgment? Does familiar size affect judgments of size itself? And uh, if so, is the effect an assimilation, so the Bayesian, or a contrast effect, the anti Bayesian? And we did this experiment uh, online. Uh, we recruited 70 participants and uh, were able to analyze the data of 63 of them. So what was the task for the participant? The participants got 
the image of two objects and they had to say uh, which of the two was larger. Uh, the soccer ball or the tennis ball. And you may think of yourself what you think. And then you got two other images and you also had to say which of the two were larger. And actually I now showed you examples for which the sizes on your screen were uh, exactly the same. We did that also with images with uh, different sizes and uh, the result is for one participant and for the comparison of the coins is here. And you see that if the size difference is large, that they were always correct in judging that the larger object was larger. And uh, also for if the two euro one was uh, larger, they also judged it correctly. And they had a small bias uh, that they, uh, if the, uh, two euro uh, was a little bit larger than the 10 cents, then they uh, judge them as equally large. We expected such small effects, and that was the reason that we got so many participants. But then we analyzed the data for the balls, and then we uh, saw a very big effect in the opposite direction. So this means that uh, if the uh, soccer ball was displayed uh, smaller than uh, the tennis ball, they were perceived as equally large. Okay, we added two additional conditions to judge whether it was actually the comparison in a single image of two well-known objects that caused the effect or that it was also for a single well-known object compared with a arbitrary object. So therefore we added the conditions where we had gray discs compared with the soccer ball and with the tennis ball. And also here you see for the soccer ball effect for the tennis ball in the opposite direction. This was for one participant and in the next we combine all the biases for those four conditions for all 63 participants and we get the result over here. So a small effect uh, in the direction of the green dot, and that is the example participant. Uh, and for the balls, it is for all participants in the same uh, direction, uh, the way you uh, perceive the uh, image of the soccer ball as larger as it actually is. And we also find the effects of uh, the independent um, uh, measuring the soccer ball and the tennis ball compared to the gray disc in the same way as the single participant was there. So we had uh, two questions that we wanted to answer. First is, is the effect of comparing the tennis ball and the soccer ball actually the, the, the sum of this effect and that effect or uh, so the, the independent effect of the tennis ball and the soccer ball uh, so we uh, computed for every participant the sum of those two effects and plotted that as function of the effect of the direct comparison. And this is the result we get on the horizontal axis, the bias in the direct comparison and the vertical axis, the sum of those two comparisons uh, of, with the gray disk. The color coding of the participants is blue one are the precise participants, red one are the more variable participants. And you see a nice correlation. If you uh, make a fit, then the fit uh, is close to the unity line. So that is a perfect prediction. And the error bars are the 95% confidence intervals and almost all of them uh, cross that unity line. So we can say it is uh, independent effects on each of the objects that determines the effect. The second uh, question we had is whether participants that have large effects for the uh, balls have also a large effect for the coins. And that is what we plot over here. And you see that uh, overall there is this bias for the balls and uh, that is clear and for the coins the bias is in the other direction but there's no correlation between them 
and the various participants have their independent bias. We can make a similar plot for the two comparisons with the gray disc, so the soccer ball and the tennis ball. And there we see that participants are correlated. So the ones that have <coughs> uh, uh, the, the most positive effect uh, of the tennis ball compared to the gray disc also have the most positive comparison of the soccer ball with the gray disc and the same for the uh, largest negative one. What you uh, see is that this line is not along the identity line. And that means that participants have their own misperception of the gray disc that is in the uh, situation. So <clears throat> combining these uh, findings here, we uh, come to the conclusion that we uh, have contrast effect for coins and assimilation effect for balls. So that was uh, something uh, that is not that clear why. We have several ideas what uh, might be possible and maybe you can add more reasons in uh, the discussion. So one of the difference between the two set of stimuli is that the coins are actually almost 2D objects and the balls are 3D objects. So it is easy to think that the coins are actually glued, glued to your screen and the balls you really have to think about them floating around somewhere and not actually on your screen. The second difference is that uh, for uh, most screens, uh, all normal screens, the coins are smaller uh, in reality than displayed on the screen and the balls are larger in reality than displayed on the screen. And a third possible reason for the different direction of the effects is that uh, in our daily experience with uh, coins, they are generally held at arm length and balls, you see them at all kinds of different distances. So that might explain how you, your familiarity is uh, this different between the two. And uh, a last difference is that the coins, judging uh, what coins they are involve cognitive aspects. So the balls are directly easily seeing which one is which. And for the coins, you have, for instance, to uh, judge whether it is a 10 or a 20 cents euro to know what size it has in reality. And it might also differ how old you are, whether you were used to uh, pay with a golden or gilders, uh, or even if you are young, you almost don't use coins at all, but you always pay with plastics, at least in the Netherlands. A second uh, uh, point and the point of discussion is that uh, it's important that the effect of familiar size is kind of absolute of the single familiar object. Uh, we initially thought that it might be that if you compare two familiar objects that you might be influenced by the size they have used to have in real life but the similar effect was present when comparing a familiar object with the unfamiliar gray disc and that is the uh, the end of my talk and i hope i, I get some interesting comments and questions yeah thank you very much for uh, for the presentation that's an interesting topic um yeah, there, we, are, we have no questions from the audience yet. Please uh, don't hesitate to ask the questions. I'm sure there should be some. Uh, in the meantime, I'm, I'm curious if you um, if you test it with other objects uh, or the, the results uh, you presented today, like with the coins and the, and the balls are, um, is, is it it? Or for, I'm wondering about other shapes apart from, from circles, from circular shapes, if, uh, if the effects would persist and so on. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 we, we only use circular shapes because there it is the easiest to uh, ask for size. If you have uh, elongated shapes or so, then uh, it might uh, that not only the, the, the size is affected by the familiarity, but also the judgment of shape. Uh, 
but in principle we could do so and we could also uh, use uh, easily a uh, square objects mm -hmm. yeah and i'm wondering as well uh, if the so you mentioned for example that uh maybe not everybody is so familiar anymore with coins um i'm having the same questions with uh with the uh, tennis balls and football like um for example i have experienced myself but uh uh, I've played both both sports, but maybe some people have just uh, watched this on television and and they actually have a, like a wrong idea of what the actual size is. Uh, yes, that 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 is possible. We we didn't uh, try to uh, investigate that. We uh, because we had a large set of participants, we uh, checked whether there was an effect of age, for instance, on. Uh, the, the biases, and there was no clear age effect uh, on the biases. Uh. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, it seems that nobody is uh, daring to ask questions. Um, I don't know if anybody else in the in the panel have questions for uh, your own. I actually uh, was thinking because I talked about uh, real world research. Do you expect to have similar effects when you have this depth perception in, in reality instead of like a screen? When you maybe prepare like the, the objects so that you can not really tell how close they are? Yeah, I, 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 I think uh, we have. We, we did an experiment um, uh, once on the beach of Schiermonnik Oog uh, where we put uh, square uh, or uh, cubes and uh, red cubes and uh, participants then had to judge how far they were and then we found a beautiful relation between uh, how far they uh, judged the cube to be and how large they thought that the cube was so uh, there it's probably not the, the familiarity but the uh, their, their, their judgments or their prior, you could say, uh, that influences uh, uh, all aspects of perception. Mm -hmm. And the and interesting thing is that we have here now a situation where it is, in a way, extremely easy to judge the size. As you, you just have to think of an horizontal line connecting the upper and the lower ends of the balls, and you could do the task. But apparently, the participants don't do that. And sorry, uh, actually another question arising from that. Um, would you expect also behavioral differences? Like uh, for instance, when looking at uh, grip uh, wide, uh, how, how if you want to grab like an, uh, an what do you call it? Like yeah. a ball, for instance, that you would expect yeah. the behavior to be adapted as well to that yeah. misestimation. It's, it's, yeah, it's a common misunderstanding that uh, people think that you open your grip based on size judgments. It's not on size judgment, but on position judgments. Mm. Uh, but what will be affected is uh, how heavy you think that the object is. So like the, in a way, the size weight illusion, and it will affect on the amount of force you use when you start lifting an object. So your expectations uh, on the, the weight. But for uh, opening your hand, it is about the location of the sides of the object. Mm. And uh, because for knowing the location of the lower side of the object, you don't have to know the size of the object. You just uh, direct your gaze at the lower uh, side of the object and you, you know where it is. And you don't have to interpret the retinal size using all kinds of additional information. Oh, thanks. That's interesting. Yeah, we have to finish very soon, but there is one question from uh, the audience. Eli Hassan is wondering uh, if affordances have, could have anything to do with uh, with the results. For example, coins tend to be picked, whereas balls tend to be hit. Or, yeah, that's. Uh, I think uh, definitely it's a little bit related to what I said that you have the coins always at arm length, but indeed you uh, pick up the coins with uh, finger and thumb and I don't know anybody able to pick up a soccer ball with finger and thumb. Yeah. And it might even be that uh, there, uh, that is the reason for the uh, uh, opposite direction. In a way, the, the, the tennis ball was also in, uh, having an effect in the opposite direction. Uh, and you are able to pick up a tennis ball with a finger and thumb. So yes, that's a very nice idea. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, all the speakers, your own Manuel and Rafael, and also Sahid for for working on the behind the scenes. And we have to finish. And thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Goodbye. Thank Enjoy you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks bye -bye. for the great. Should I leave it here? Or? Yeah, I guess. Um, I think I turn it off, and um, when I I'll introduce all three speakers, and then you can. Sure. Sure. I don't know if that sounds good. Thank, thanks, Lucy, for letting me in, by the way. She's sitting in the, the Zoom room. Uh, she's doing the back end. Uh, Guido, how do you say your last name? Or if, I don't know why I'm saying your first name right either. So actually say my first name is Guido, but Hito. that's okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, my last name is Meyer. Guido Meyer. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So, and, um, so I'm going to say a sentence about everyone's talk. And I guess for Hito's talk, um, uh, is this data that's shared already? Yeah, yeah. So this is the, um, we have this preprint on BioArchive and we recently updated it also with the new data. Um, so almost everything I'm going to tell will be there as well. Yeah, so if you want, um, so you can do, if you change the chat to all panelists and attendees, you can send it to everyone. So if you, if you want, you could send the paper um, at the end of the, the talk or at the beginning if you want, if people want more info. Okay, sounds good. Hey, you on? Hi. Hi. Uh, can you say your name for me, real quick, uh, when I for when I introduce you? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Yuan. Yuan. Yeah. Zhao. Yuan Zhao. Yeah. Yuan Zhao. Okay. Yes. Cool. Thanks. All right. Um, so I think we probably should go live now. To, um, I guess people can come in now. I think, oh, there's already people here. Okay, great. Uh, so welcome everyone to this session. Um, we're gonna have three great talks today. In the first talk, we're gonna hear about a potentially more humane and effective alternative to water restriction, which is a widely used technique in systems neuroscience work in mice. In the second talk, we're gonna hear about the origins of choice variability in MT. And it sounds like some surprising results there. And then in the third talk, we're going to hear about a multi-lab collaborative effort to standardize behavioral training and analysis. And this is an effort that's really pushing forward open source science. So I look forward to all the talks today. Um, thanks, everyone. So Inez Laranjera is going to go first um, with her talk titled Citric Acid uh, Water as an Alternative to Water Restriction for High Yield Mouse Behavior. Hello. Um, hello everyone, so my name is Ines and I'll be telling you about some recent work on the possibility of using citric acid water as an alternative to water restriction for
for high yield mouse behavior. Uh, so this is work developed amongst some members of the International Brain Laboratory, namely Anne, Valeria, myself, Fanny, and our PIs, Zach Maynard and, and Churchland. And this work uh, has been published on BioArchive with the same title as, of this presentation, so feel free to go and check it. Um, so as many of you might be aware, mice are of great interest in behavioral and systems neuroscience. And amongst other reasons, that is because there are many available tools to record and manipulate brain structure and function in mice. But not only that, uh, there's also great knowledge on how to train mice to perform specific behavioral tasks of interest. Um, and in particular, yielding high numbers of trials, which is something crucial in some experimental designs. Um, and the way this is frequently achieved is by mildly restricting animals' access to either food or water uh, while rewarding mice for performing trials in a given behavioral task uh, with either food or fluids. Uh, in particular, water restriction uh, has been widely used in the community, uh, but it requires a very rigorous monitoring of animals' health and hydration status, as well as it requires uh, that the experimenter um, comes in every day and gives a very precise and sometimes subject-specific amount of water to each mouse on every day. And because of this, uh, this approach is quite error-prone and uh, time demanding from the experimenter. So as an alternative to the classical water restriction regime in which mice drink only a limited amount of water per day, here we propose an alternative which consists of giving mice free access in their home cage to water to which a small amount of citric acid has been added. But so what is citric acid? Uh, citric acid, like the name suggests, is naturally occurring in citrus fruits. Uh, it is also commonly used as a food preservative, so it's safe for consumption. But most relevantly for this uh, research project, it tastes slightly sour and makes the water taste slightly sour, just like lemons do. Um, and so previously, work from Renegal et al. Uh, it's shown that in rats, the administration of citric acid water in their home cage leads to a decrease in water consumption as compared to the control rats, which had free access to plain water. But interestingly, this only led to a subtle decrease in the motivation to engage in a, in a behavioral task where they could get fluid rewards as compared to rats that had, were on a water restriction regime. Uh, and so here we set out to test the safety of using this water regime, but in mice, while still achieving high throughput behavior. So we started by verifying that in mice, just like in rats, uh, administering, giving free access to citric acid water in the home cage leads to a re reduction in the water consumption as compared to control mice which had access to plain water, which drink about three times as, more, uh, as much. Consistent with this initial observation, we saw that mice that had access to citric acid water on the home cage uh, reduced their weight as compared to the control mice uh, that ha who had access to, to plain water. Um, and importantly, we saw that the extent of the weight loss was within a healthy range and highly comparable to mice that were on a typical water restriction regime, getting a measured amount of water every day. Uh, lastly, we wanted to test whether mice that had free access to citric acid water were interested in drinking plain water. And um, for this, we placed the mice in a new cage where they could have access to plain water during uh, a, up to five minutes. And we saw that control mice that had access to plain water in their home cage were definitely not very interested in having drinking more of this water because they were satiated. Um, but mice that had ac 
access to citric acid water instead in their home cage were motivated to drink plain water uh, in comparable amounts to mice uh, on a more typical water restriction regime, which had a measured amount of water, drank a measured amount of water every day. Um, so after verifying that mice on citric acid water were motivated to drink plain water, when we wanted to test whether they were also willing to engage on a decision-making task where they could get fluid rewards. For that, we tested a different cohort of mice uh, that performed the visual discrimination task at expert levels. Um, and this task is the official IBL task of which Hid will talk about and you might, might learn more on the preprint on bioarchive. Um, so I should say that for, for the different water regime protocols that we tested, uh, all animals were trained on weekdays, but not on weekends. Uh, and so we saw that as expected, control mice that were given plain water uh, throughout the week had the highest weights and performed the least trials. One other approach that we tested that is sometimes used in the field was to give free access to plain water during weekends, but, but not during the week. And so we saw that for these mice, um, their weight decreased along, throughout the week and trial counts increased. Lastly, for the more typical approach of giving mice a measured amount of water every day, uh, we saw that mice performed high trial counts throughout the whole week. So then we, we wanted to compare uh, the effect of giving uh, free access to 2% citric acid water on the home cage uh, and tested these effects on weight and trials for comparison. Um, and we, we tested uh, the effect of citric acid water in two regimes, one in which mice had access to this water throughout the whole week and one other uh, approach in which uh, we only gave citric acid water in the home cage during weekends so in non-training days. And we were pleased to see that mice uh, that had free access to citric acid water were, were motivated to do many trials overall in amounts comparable to mice on a typical water restriction regime, especially when citric acid water was administered only on weekends. Uh, so finally, we leveraged on the big behavioral data set that the IBL has produced. Uh, we included up to 140 mice in this analysis um, and these mice were trained on the IVL's visual discrimination task that I just mentioned for the previous experiment. Um, and uh, all mice were trained according to a highly standard, standardized protocol, but conveniently for this research question, four out of seven labs in the collaboration used citric acid water on weekends as the regular weekend uh, water regime, while the others used the common water restriction approach. And so this was a great opportunity to test uh, if our observations were robust enough and generalizable across institutions. Um, and moreover, we could see how the citric acid water regime affected learning behavior, which was something that we had not done thus far. Um, and so we could see that mice from both groups had compar comparable levels of weight loss as measured by their weight uh, upon uh, the start of auto restriction and throughout days. Uh, we also saw that mice in the two groups yielded comparable amounts of trials in the behavioral task across training days and mice in both groups um, learned the task at comparable place, paces. Um, not only uh, learning behavior was comparable across the two groups, um, but we could see that upon training completion, several parameters of the animal's behavior were similar for the two groups. For instance, mice from both groups performed comparably high amounts of trials per session. Um, and there were also no differences in the time mice took to complete trials, so the, the average trial duration. Uh, moreover, when looking at the bias threshold and lapse parameters of the psychometric curves of these mice, 
um, we could see that there were also uh, no differences across the two water regime groups. So to conclude and recapitulate, we, we found that mice maintain healthy weights and, what, and water intake levels when given free access to citric acid water. We also saw that mice perform many trials even uh, when they have free, citric acid, uh, free, free access to this uh, citric acid water. And lastly, um, leveraging on the big size of the behavioral data set of the IBL, we saw that uh, giving free, free access to citric acid water on weekends does not adversely affect learning behavior. Um, so I would like to thank uh, all the co-authors and extend uh, these acknowledgements to the whole collaboration and also to our funders. Um, and as I said, you can check uh, further details of this study in our preprint, but feel free to contact us with questions or just feedback on your own attempts to, to use citric acid water to train mice. And of course, I'll, I'll take any questions, but I would like to say, like this was just said by our host, but uh, don't miss Hiru Meyer's presentation. He'll be talking about uh, also the International Brain Lab efforts on standardized and reproducible measurement of decision-making in mice. And thank you all for listening. Thanks, that was a great talk. Does anyone have any questions they, they want to ask about it? I'll start with a, a brief question. So do you think your results are convincing enough that um, the labs at the IBL are going to use citric acid water more than just on the weekends for all of the training? Uh, so far, our results are very convincing for the weekends. And that's, um, that's uh, great already because this reduces uh, the amount of work from the experimenter, the possibility of errors. And the truth is that uh, throughout the week in which the mice are trained, in general, after the very first weeks, mice get enough water in the task. So the experimenter in general doesn't have to supplement uh, after one or two weeks. Um, as we showed, um, when we give citric acid water throughout the whole week, the trial counts are slightly uh, reduced. And this might have to do with a, a compromise uh, I think IBL for now will we'll keep with the approach for the weekends, uh, but of course um, it will be nice to see more concrete results, especially for learning periods. We don't know um, how the availability of citric acid throughout the whole week affects learning. This was not done yet. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Uh, if if no one else has any other questions, um, we might have time at the end too. If you think of questions, um, you can go on to the next speaker. So Yuan Zhao is going to give a talk about non-corrupting decision-making feedback to area MT. Looking forward to. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, can you see my screen share? Looks good. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, so I'm gonna tell a story on a peculiar phenomenon we observed in the Marcark middle temporal cortex. So here, uh, this is uh, collaboration with uh, a hot lab in UT Austin. Uh, here the punchline is we found the uh, internal representation of motion stimulus is mostly misaligned with what we expect from an ideal sensory cortex. So you could imagine that our uh, survivals rely on the brain generates uh, proper behaviors, depending on what we sense. Uh, the neural coding problem is a fundamental in understanding how the brain does that. In sensory systems, we often seek for a relation between the stimuli and neural responses to study the code 
However, such analysis alone are prone to misleading conclusions because our ability to detect signal in neural activity is only a necessary condition and doesn't imply that the brain actually used this information. So it is critical to have a behavioral component in the uh, experiments that we can quantify which aspect of the uh, spatial temporal pattern of neural activity correlates with the behavior. So the sensory area MT has been studied for decades in this context. So as we know, MT is a critical bottleneck in visual motion perception through lesion and uh, in activation studies. Then we seek analysis on the recording uh, air in the area MT while the monkeys performing a perceptual decision-making task. So in this task, uh, <clears throat> the monkey started with a fixation at the center of the uh, screen. And uh, then it was given seven pauses of drifting and the flickering gabors consecutively. Uh, the monkey needed to uh, accumulate and report the net direction of the motion in the end by a card. So get back to the question on the correlation between your activity and the behavior. We know that the MT activity is primarily driven by the stimulus during the experiments, but it correlates with the choice as well. Then how do we isolate and measure the correlation between a neuron and choice? And we use the frozen trials and uh, the choice probability. Uh, the frozen st stimuli mean the same stimulus is repeated across trials. So there, there's no variability MT that uh, is introduced by the stimuli, but there is also trial to trial variability, uh, well, uh, for the frozen stimuli. And uh, the choice probability mean, uh, me is a measure of the uh, separation between the distributions of MT activity conditional on the choices. For example, in this uh, figure, you can, uh, you have uh, two distributions uh, conditional on the two choices. So, point five, uh, well, Point five uh, choice probability means uh, uh, you cannot discriminate between these two distributions. And one means uh, there is a perfect separation and you can build a perfect decoder to, uh, to decode a choice from the distribution. And uh, there are studies ha uh, that have found uh, a substantial choice probability in MT neurons. Then the next question is, where is the choice correlation comes from? Then here are two possibilities. One is that the choice confirmation is generated within MT and read out by the downstream areas to generate behavior. The other is that the choice information is fed back to the MT from the downstream areas. However, these are hard to verify with only single neurons. So before we get to the results, let me explain some ex concepts. Imagine a population of two neurons. Each dot on the plane represents a pair of firing rates. Suppose the two neurons have a uh, opposite preference on the direction of uh, the stimulus. Then we can find a subspace within, uh, uh, within this space uh, where the 1D stimulus is encoded. Of course, there are uh, variabilities and or noise contributing uh, uh, to the uh, activity. So among the noises, some are in the same direction of the stimulus that uh, uh, distorts the in, uh, stimulus information. Uh, uh, sometimes it's called uh, information limit noise. And some are a thought node to the stimulus and uh, harmless. If we only use these two neurons to make the choice, uh, we can easily find the, the optimal decision boundary that is our stock node to the stimulus subspace. So 
yeah. Then as we uh, partition the space into stimulus and the null space, uh, we also call the null space as non-stimulus subspace. And these two subspaces are orthogonal we would also ask where the choice information resides in MT or um, which subspace the uh, choice information resides. So combining with this two po this previous two possible sources of choice correlation, uh, we came up with four hypotheses. So the first one, the uh, optimal write-out case. So here, the choice information resides in the stimulus subspace and read out by the downstream area perfectly. In this case, uh, we should observe 0.5 choice probability in the non-stimulus subspace, but a, 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 higher stimulus, a, a higher choice probability in the stimulus subspace. And the, uh, the, the other feedforward case is the, uh, um, that uh, the, the downstream areas are uh, uh, read out not so perfectly. So then the variability in the non-stimulus subspace also correlates with the choice. And therefore we should observe a higher choice probability in the uh, non-stimulus subspace as well. Then in the feedback cases, the choice information could be fed to the stimulus or the non-stimulus subspaces. And the space, the, the sorry, the feedback to stimulus subspace will corrupt uh, the stimulus information in the stimulus subspace and uh, thus inflate the choice probability in that subspace. But uh, the, uh, the feedback to the null subspace will not corrupt in the stimulus information and only inflate the no choice probability in the no space or, or in other words, in the non-stimulus subspace. Uh, of course here, uh, it doesn't uh, completely rule, rule out the, the, the crafting uh, cases because the, well, the feedback can be, uh, well, yeah, the choice information can be fed, fed back to uh, both of the uh, subspaces. And uh, now let's look at the analysis we have done that rules out some of the possibilities. So we first extract a, four, a 4D latent factor from the population spectrum using uh, so-called variational latent Gaussian processes. Uh, it is a, a dimension re dimensionality reduction tool that produces smooth latent factors. And we can see uh, from the noise correlation uh, uh, matrix, we can see uh, uh, the uh, the 40 factors has already explained the noise correlation very well. Then the regression analysis on the latent factors shows that the stimulus is encoded in 1D in the latent space. Uh, here uh, on the left, it's the uh, uh, a real uh, visual motion that was present to the monkeys. Finally, we can align and map the factors for choice probability calculation. So after the uh, uh, extraction of latent factors and we then align or we uh, partition the factors into uh, the uh, stimulus subspace and the non-stimulus non subspace. Uh, then we did a so-called choice mapping to map the uh, multi-dimensional factor to a 1D scalar that uh, uh, enables the calculation of choice probability. And those uh, choice mapping uh, preserve, preserve the uh, uh, choice information in the latent factors. And finally, we pull the mappings across sessions and the data statistical test in the nested model. So basically the nested model uh, tells if the outer model explains more than the inner model. So our finding, so the question is, that is the non-stimulus subspace also cont contributes to a choice? Our finding says, yes. We find a substantial uh, and significant uh, uh, choice variability in the non-stimulus subspace. 
that meaning uh, the sensory and choice population codes are misaligned. And that also rolls out the, 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 the two uh, aligned subspace uh, hypothesis. Then the question is, is the uh, feedback corrupting or not? To answer the, the question, we also look at the time course of the choice probability in both subspaces. Uh, on the left, we, uh, we observe this large late uh, CP component in the non-stimulus subspace. And uh, so the timing suggests that the, the, the choice information is, is, is from the feedback, uh, uh, feedback way. And, uh, but the uh, absence of the uh, large component CP in the stimulus subspace uh, give uh, us a hint of uh, non corrupting feedback. So, but why that is the case? Why the, the feedback is non corrupting? Uh, it might be useful for adapt adaptation and learning. And uh, also we, uh, the new, we did some, some new uh, experiment and we found that this uh, pattern changes when the new behavior st uh, strategy is learned by the monkey and uh, the working is uh, in progress. So to summarize, uh, in this study, we uh, found that the sensory and uh, choice population code are misaligned in MT and uh, the time course of choice probability supports non-corrupting feedback of decision-making process to the sensory area MT. And this uh, concludes my talk. Thank you. And uh, uh, questions are welcome. Thanks. That was a great talk. Uh, I, are there any questions from anyone? I see there's one in the Q&A. Um, Matteo Carandini asks, could it be orthogonal to sensory signals because it is motor, this feedback? Yeah, that's, uh, that's possible because, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it could be the feedback from uh, a downstream motor errors to the MT. I guess that, that the follow-up to that might be, is the time course this late time, is that when the saccade is happening? Is that aligned to when the saccade starts? Uh, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, the more uh, we, we didn't look at the, uh, mm, mm, the, the, the choice probability uh, time course uh, uh, near the, uh, the saccade, but uh, uh, the, news, uh, the new experiment, we, we, we don't see a very late uh, uh, large CP component at the uh, saccade time. Uh, so uh, it might not be the case. I have a question too. Yeah. So did you do any control experiments where you only present passive stimuli where the animal doesn't have to make a response to see if there are any changes in the non-stimulus coding subspace versus behaviorally relevant stimuli that do require a response? Uh, we did some, some new, new experiment that uh, uh, forced the monkey to uh, uh, use uh, uh, early or delayed the uh, uh, pauses to, to, to perform the task. And uh, the preliminary results showed that the, the monkey uh, uh, kind of changed the strategy. Uh, uh, well, uh, among these different uh, conditions. There, there aren't any other questions. Matteo says it could be pre-motor as well. Um, so I think we should move on to the next talk because we're at 9.31 um, Eastern time. So Hito Meyer is going to give a talk about standardized and reproducible measurement of decision-making in mice. So. Yuan, thanks. Can you um, unshare your screen? Oh, sorry. Yes. No, no, you're good.
All right, can you see my screen? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Uh, well, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Hido, uh, Hido Meyer, and I uh, am a postdoc in the International Brain Lab. Um, and today I'll be telling you about our standardized behavioral paradigm that we've uh, now successfully reproduced in seven different laboratories across the world. Um, so our aim, our ultimate goal is to understand brain-wide circuits during a single complex behavior. And the behavior should have um, all these aspects that you see listed down here. And we believe that this aim is something that is uh, too large to actually accomplish by a single traditional lab approach. And therefore, uh, the International Brain Lab was founded, which is a collaboration between 22 labs uh, that span experimental to theoretical backgrounds. And our approach in getting to this goal is to uh, go for high throughput experimentation. We use a common data architecture. Uh, we develop open source hardware and software, uh, which ultimately lead to the publication of publicly available data sets. And most importantly, we aim to standardize as much as we can across the laboratories in our collaboration. And our standardization comes in a couple of different levels. So we have things that are fully standardized. So for example, the hardware, the rig itself, um, the software that's used to uh, run the task, the mouse train, obviously, and our handling training and surgery protocols. And um, then we have things that uh, should either fall within a range or uh, is a choice between two options. So within a range is, for example, the, the protein and fat concentration in the food that the mice get, their weight and age. Uh, and also in some cases, the uh, experimenter or lab can choose to go for two things. In the light cycle, for example, they can opt to go for an inverted or non-inverted light cycle. Uh, we have two mouse providers, one in Europe and one in the US, uh, where they can choose from because we cannot really ship mice across the Atlantic and actually have a single mouse provider. Um, and we use male and females. Then there are things that we cannot standardize, but we can only measure. So for example, the temperature, the humidity, and the ambient noise in the vivarium of each uh, institution. So the task that we uh, settled on using is um, developed originally in the Cortex lab at UCL. Um, very quickly, the mouse has a steering wheel in front of it and it's looking at a screen. A stimulus appears either on the left or the right. Um, and by turning the, the wheel, the mouse has to put this stimulus in the center of the screen to get a sugar water reward. When the mouse moves the wheel the wrong way, the stimulus moves outside of the screen and the mouse gets a white noise burst and a time out. Um, this is the rig that we developed to do this. Um, it's completely open source. And if you want to build one yourself, just go to this website you see here which has a list of all the components we use uh, and build instruction guides that guide you through the whole process of, uh, of building one if you do feel so inclined. We have a uh, automatic progression through training phases to minimize experimenter inter uh, interference, basically. Um, here you can see the training days on the x-axis and uh, contrast on the y-axis. Um, and the negative contrasts are on the left and positive contrasts are on the right. So you can see that in the first phase of training, the mice only get uh, two high contrast options. And as they progress, the algorithm decides when to introduce lower contrasts up until, in this case, day 14, where the animal uh, has the full contrast set. As you can see um, in the color, it makes the correct choices stimulates either on the left or on the right. So the mice in our task, they learn quickly, um, but the training times are variable over labs. So here you see data of 140 mice that we've trained in this task. And um, in, uh, they have an overall median of 14.5 uh, days until they reach trained criterion. Um, but as you can see, there is still uh, some labs that have uh, shorter training time compared to others, and there is indeed a significant effect here. Um, and preparing for this talk, it occurred to me that one of the things that actually differs between labs is whether they use an inverted or a non-inverted light cycle. Uh, and I actually um, found some indication that, contrary to what I expected, 
it seems to be that uh, mice that are trained in labs that use a non-inverted light cycle learn faster. So that is when the mouse is actually trained in their inactive phase, which I would have expected the opposite. But um, this is uh, still to be confirmed, but uh, it's at least an interesting indication. Um, when they reach the trained criterion when they, um, that we have set for the mice, they show very stable psychophysic uh, performance. So here you can see the psychometric curves and every color is a different lab. Um, of all the my, mice that reached the trained criterion. Uh, and you can see that they overlap uh, nicely, indicating a reproducible stable psychophysics. From these ex uh, psychometric curves, we can extract a couple of, um, a couple of metrics, um, like the performance on easy trials, uh, their contrast threshold, and their bias. And uh, none of these metrics uh, significantly varied overlaps, indicating that um, indeed their behavior is reproducible. Then after uh, they reach this phase of training uh, and they do it well, they go into the next phase of training. And in this phase, we introduce uh, a manipulation on the stimulus prior probability. So in blocks, we change the probability that the stimulus will appear on either the left or the right side of the screen. And uh, every session starts with 90 trials where the stimulus prior probability is still 50-50. So the same as the rest of the, the training phases. But then in blocks, the prior probability is changed to either being uh, more probable to appear on the left, as is indicated here by 80-20, or on the right, as is indicated by 20-80. So it's an 80% probability of the stimulus appearing on either one of those two sides. And uh, as expected, uh, we find that mice bias their behavior according to uh, the statistics in the stim stimulus prior probability. Um, so you can see in red here that for the blocks where the stimulus prior probability was higher on the right, um, the psychometric curve is shifted to the left and vice versa. We can quantify this as uh, the delta right word choices. So how much, um, how much more likely are they to choose right um, in the left block in blue compared to the right block here in uh, left. And when you do that, you see that the bias is highest when the stimulus contrast is low, um, which makes sense. We also have this condition of 0% contrast. And in that case, um, there's actually no stimulus. There is a go queue though, so the mouse doesn't know that they have to make a response. Um, and in that case, they are strongly biased towards the side uh, where the prior probability is highest. And importantly, there is no consistent difference uh, overlaps when you look at this metric. Here, we've pulled out a couple of, um, of these metrics. So the um, contrast threshold, for example, which is basically the steepness of the psychometric curve um, it doesn't really change in the two blocks and also is not significantly different uh, across labs. Then we have the lapses. And so the, uh, they do tend to show uh, a bias that in one of the two blocks, they have fewer lapses to uh, when the prior probability is high on the left, they have fewer lapses on the left and vice versa here. Uh, and they have, of course, a very strong bias uh, in the block that is currently presented. Um, but again, importantly, none of these metrics uh, significantly varied overlaps, uh, showing that also this bias protocol uh, is reproducible across laboratories. Then a small teaser is that um, using this task, we now went into the second phase where we actually aim to record the entire mouse brain with neuropixels. Well, the left hemisphere, like the most important hemisphere of the mouse brain, the left one, of course, with uh, neuropixel recordings, every red line here is a planned neuropixel insertion site. And this is uh, very exciting and it's currently on the way. So you will uh, hear more about that hopefully soon. Uh, then I'd want to thank the entire collaboration and our funders. Uh, I've highlighted here in bold uh, the people that uh, can provided a key contribution to the work I've showed today. And if you want to know more, check out our, our website, uh, International Brain Lab. 
www.ecosystemsmanagement.com. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions. Thanks, Hito. Great talk. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I, I have a, a quick one, um, which is, is this the statistics for the mice that successfully trained on the task? And is there a variability across labs on how many mice actually learn the task? So yeah, um, the psychophysics I showed is indeed for the mice that success successfully learned the task. So I'd have to think about if there is a significant difference in the percentage of mice that actually do learn. I brought along this figure here, I think. Where is it? Uh, no, I don't have it with me. Um, there's, there's some slight differences, but um, we didn't explicitly test if they're significantly different across laboratories. Well, I'll have to check. I, I mean, it's not super important. The, the ultimate question is, can you tell if a mouse is going to be able to kind of learn the task? And do you have all of this data now where maybe you have a better handle on what mice learn and what mice don't learn, for instance, and that sort of thing? Yeah, so Inesh might uh, want to chime in on this because this is actually a project that she's working on. So she's actually trying to predict whether a mouse is going to be a fast or a slow learner based on oh. their behavior in the first session. So this is uh, something indeed yeah. very interesting and it does seem to work a bit. Maybe Inesh wants to say something. Uh, so what I can say is that fortunately we're able to collect lots of data like Hido is exemplified a bit. We have all kinds of metadata available and very easily uh, queryable uh, information about mice, uh, conditions in the rig, uh, and their behavior. And we can pull all of this data and actually um, a random forest classifier can predict quite, uh, or above chance level for sure, uh, how long a mouse will take to learn. Uh, it turns out that it will relies a lot on on uh, the performance and number of number of trials that uh, mice do very early on, um, but definitely uh, this the size of this data will be um, promising for this kind of analysis. Interesting. Thanks. So this gets back kind of to your talk too that maybe you do want to maximize the number of trials that they can do. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, this has to do with the fact that we do acute recordings, right? And we want to maximize each session uh, and we want to test different contrasts, different conditions within one session for one penetration. And that's why it's not only in, in the case of, of this uh, project, but in many projects, the trial counts matters. Um, but what I was saying before was more throughout learning we see that this is a, a feature of mice that learn faster they're also doing more trials because in our task we we don't fix the length of the the session or the number of trials and so we allow mice to do as much as they want more or less i mean we have criterion for for this and so this is one feature um, in early learning that the ones that do more trials uh, are learning faster. Cool, thanks. Yeah, sorry, I guess I, I meant like the fact that you you might want to use the vanilla water restriction to make sure that they have enough trials at the beginning. Like what you were talking about seems to be maximizing this learning as well. Uh, what do you mean the vanilla? Okay. Well, just, sorry, not I shouldn't use the word vanilla. Uh, I meant no. nor, normal water restriction rather than the CA water restriction to make sure that they're doing a lot of trials at the beginning. Um, ah, um, so it's complementary. What we found is that, so this, the thing is on, on weekends we don't train them and they still should be within the same level of water deprivation or, or we should maintain their motivation to do the trials. And what we found is that the citric acid does not uh, harm the performance throughout the week. Um, it, we also didn't find that it's any better or worse than normal water restriction. It's just that it presents some advantages uh, in, in the way it can be applied. Cool. 
Oh, so importantly, the, the citric acid water didn't change their learning curve. Yes, so it's not that they exactly. learned slower uh, on citric acid. Right, but that was only citric acid on the weekend, not all the time. Right. Exactly. Uh, also because we only, for this big uh, data set, we only tested uh, differences in water regime regarding the weekend. Every, everything else that I showed uh, that was eventually throughout the whole week, uh, that was with different mice. Um, yeah, kind of a preliminary experiment. Great, thanks. Uh, does anyone have any other questions? Uh, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Hito, if you wanna put the link to the paper in the chat, you can. Um, yeah, I'll uh, link to our if anyone else wants paper. to put links in now, um, I think the room is closing in a couple of minutes. Thank, thanks everyone for, for coming by. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. Yeah, no, thanks for the great talks. Thanks. Neurospin in close to Paris under the supervision of uh, Stan Dehan. So, um, now I'm going to show you um, a sequence of dots on the vertices of an octagon, and I'm going to ask you to predict which are the next locations. So if I show it to you again, maybe you have guessed that the next locations are these ones. So um, we think that you have coded the sequence in the following way. So um, th um, coding the first segment as a symmetry with respect to this blue axis and translating four times this segment um, in this parallel, uh, using this parallelity between, uh, between the lines and shifting the starting dot by minus one. So um, we think that uh, you, uh, you use the fact that we use an abstract language of thought to represent these geometrical sequences and that uh, you use this expression, this description, to represent these geometrical sequences. So we use uh, this, uh, this variety of geometrical sequences. So let's do one step back and um, consider that we... Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm having a problem with my presentation. Um, it's uh, it's uh, uh, doing uh, continuing alone. So, oops, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry, it might have been the mode of presentation, but... Yes. Yeah. Try again, maybe the mode presentateur. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, go it's doing it alone. So it's a bit strange. I'm sorry, I'm going to... Uh, yeah, maybe take a bit more time. So um, we consider these geometrical sequences because they are non-linguistic structured sequences. So they are adequate for the comparison with non-human primates. Um, as as uh, we think, we, you are not storing these eight items in distinct memory slots, but instead you are uh, using some geometrical regularities to segment and compress the spatial sequences in memory. So our hypothesis is that you use combinations of geometrical primitives belonging to an abstract language of geometry to represent these special sequences. And uh, the primitives that we think you are using are these ones. So elementary um, geometrical operations of rotation and symmetry with respect to these different axes. So the different sequences you're con uh, we considered in this study are the following ones. So as you can see from the left one, it's very simple. It just goes around very simply. While the one on the, on the right is very complex, the irregular one is very complex. So actually we um, use a measure of complexity, the, the length of the description of this abstract, that this abstract language uh, does of these um, sequences. 
So uh, this is the, the paradigm we're using. So it's um, an MEG paradigm where we have first some um, part devoted to geometrical sequences where we show to participants uh, in a continuous way some geometrical sequences and we ask them to press um, uh, when they detect violations and when they have encoded the sequences. There's also a part that is devoted to the primitive operations and where actually we consider some mini blocks where we show um, uh, pairs of dots that illustrate a given primitive operation. So these different rotations or symmetry. So it's an MEG experiment that was done at Neurospin. And um, so we are going to do consider some decoding. So for the ones that are not maybe super familiar with this technique, the idea is to train an algorithm on MEG topographies of a brain that correspond to different conditions and then ask it to predict which conditions a new topography belongs to. If we train a decoder at a given time, let's say Tx, and test it at another time Ty, we can understand if it generalizes or not the representation. So then we get something called a generalization across time profile. So um, we used this decoder to, uh, first of all, decode spatial location. So we see from this decoding profile that there's a peak of decodability of spatial position on the screen, one of these eight positions, at 150 milliseconds. This, um, we see also a diagonal on this, uh, on this generalization across time profile. And this diagonal actually tells that there's an um, unfolding of the sequences of stages in this uh, visual processing. But there's also a partial kind of square pattern that tells us that there's a like, sustained maintenance of um, a special location information. And we also could decode the presented positions on the screen for every ordinal position in the different sequences. So we also uh, decoded the anticipation of the sequence items. So this was actually um, done to understand how much we could decode the next location be before it's actually presented. So between the first point, P1 and P2, for example, before P2 is presented, we can actually decode above chance uh, it, its position. It's, uh, yeah, it's a special position. And um, so if we average over the Y, um, over the training times, on a window from 100 to 200 milliseconds, this anticipation score, we can see that there are two windows where it's significantly above chance. And actually, if we now try to understand if the prediction or expectation mechanisms are modulated by sequence structure, we see that um, we can actually show that anticipation significantly decreases when complexity increases. Um, yeah, so this is the first evidence for the uh, presence of a compressed code, mental code. We uh, also um, decoded the, the primitive operation, the abstract primitive operation. So to do so, we, uh, so we did so in the primitive part and in the sequence part. And as you can see, this is a... Um, 11 category classifier for the 11 primitives and it, its decoding score is above chance. Um, it has also kind of a sustained pattern and also maybe more diagonal for the sequence part. But something very interesting is that actually if we use the um, decoder trained on the primitive part and test it on the sequence part, it's um, not generalizing. So it means that the code of the primitives in the context of a sequence is not the same as in the primitive part. And maybe there are some interesting reasons for that. Uh, moreover, uh, the postulated language of thought uh, we assumed, uh, we, we postulated, assumes that, the, uh, that we parse, we human parse the sequences into uh, multiple groups of locations that are linked by common geometrical primitives. So if we uh, consider, for example, these um, four diagonals and four segment sequences, they are made out of four groups of two items. 
So for example, four segments, that is the one I presented at the beginning, goes like zigzag, 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 zigzag. Uh, so the ordinal uh, code, the ordinal position within a sequence component would be one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And for the two squares and two arc sequences, uh, they are made of two groups of four. So actually, the, the, as you can see, the, the code would go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So we, um, uh, we consider these two groups, two, um, yeah, these four, se uh, four sequences. And what we did was to uh, decode, um, we trained a decoder to determine was what's the ordinal position of a given item in the sequence. And we see that this ordinal code uh, reactivates for every two item of the sequence in the case of these uh, four diagonals and four segments. So what we did was to do a Fourier transform. And uh, if we do a Fourier transform, what we see is that actually the, there's a peak at the frequency of presentation divided by two. So um, that, and this corresponds to the size of a component. Um, and we actually get the same results this time for the two squares and two arcs. Uh, when we look at the re reactivation of the ordinal code, we see that it reactivates every four items. Um, and if we do the Fourier transform, we see that it peaks at the frequency of presentation divided by four. Um, so overall, um, what, uh, what I tried to, to show you is some evidence for the fact that we mentally compress the sequences, these geometrical sequences using geometrical regularity, so these primitive operations. Uh, this could be seen from the anticipation signals that were modulated by sequence complexity. Um, we could decode um, uh, three types of codes. First of all, items of special location. Also geometrical primitive operations um, that are the ones that code for the transition between two su successive locations. And also items ordinal position within a sequence component. So um, actually these three codes are um, uh, elements that tell us that we have an abstract structural code for these sequences that may be represented in a factorized manner. So this is our hypothesis. Um, so the human brain, um, we have seen that it does not stick to a flat representation of geometrical sequences, but instead it parses them into subsequences based on the primitive geometrical operations in order to compress these sequences in memory. And with this, I would like to thank all my colleagues and also my lab, Unicoc Neurospin. And thank you for listening to this presentation. Up. Thank you so much, uh, Fosca. This was yeah. really interesting. I opened the floor for a few questions. We don't have a lot of time. Um, yeah, I'm but, sorry uh, for the confusion at the beginning. No worries. It, it went uh, fairly well, I would say, uh, notwithstanding. Um, I actually have, oh, Pierre Oran here has a question. As, to model such sequences of discrete and geometrical transformations at the neuronal level, I had a similar question, actually. Would you use discrete or continuous variables? Here, we are using discrete variables. Uh, most of the time, um, in the sense that, for example, when we're decoding ordinal position, we uh, use uh, some classifier and not a regression, assuming that the, um, the ordinal code would uh, not have anything uh, linear. So or not, not, it would not be a monotonous uh, like function. Um, also for the 11 primitives, uh, what we did, for example, there's this rotation one, two, and three, and the only difference is the step, the size of the step that uh, they do. But we, we still consider them as um, different, as different as, um, as a symmetry would be from a rotation in the results I'm presenting you. But uh, in the article, you will see that actually there's some other kind of uh, analysis we did. We did. 
last thing is the distance. Distance, we try to take it into account, but this time in a continuous way. Yeah. And last questions, I, uh, question, I think Paul Ter here is saying, absolutely beautiful. Have you tried larger or other grids arrangements? Not yet, but the next experiment we're going to do is actually is going to consider instead of eight points, six points. Um, so it's going to be an hexagon. Uh, we're going to see if uh, the, the operations, the primitives are the same or not. We're actually also going to investigate um, other, kind of, other kinds of regularities that would be more like uh, temporal regularities. The fact that we have um, some, for example, some repetitions of a given pattern or inversion, temporal inversion. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting. I have tons of other questions and there are other questions that you can type your answer to, uh, Fosca, but we'll transition to Niklaus. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, um, Niklaus, if you can share your screen. Um, Niklaus Chrysantidis, he is at the KTH um, in Stockholm um, and He's going to speak to us about decoding stimuli in visual working memory. Um, hello, hello. Uh, give me one second. To no see worries. It works. I don't see your screen yet, so we'll wait for the screen to be there. Uh, I see, see it Janet now. See yeah, I see your screen and I see your mouse. So off you go. Okay, okay. great, great. Uh, so yeah, my name is Nicolas. Uh, greetings, uh, greetings from Stockholm, from Sweden, um, from K88. So um, I'm a PhD student uh, in my second year of my PhD, uh, mainly working with uh, in computational neuroscience area. So what we do, we build uh, large scale uh, computational spiking uh, models in order to investigate uh, working memory and episodic memory mainly. And more specifically, when it comes to synaptic plasticity, so we combine uh, different forms of synaptic plasticity currently. But uh, interestingly, this project was done uh, under the umbrella of uh, Neuromats Academy Summer School. Um, so uh, the co-authors, uh, Hande, uh, is a PhD student at the UCL in UK, and Kathy Krishnan was our supervisor in these three weeks uh, at the summer school and uh, she works at the University of Tennessee. So, um, so I, will mainly, uh, I will mainly present you uh, the project what was about uh, decoding stimuli in a visual working memory task. Um, so our effort was to predict uh, correctly the stimulation that was used uh, during this task. But let's go to the introduction. Um, so yes, just briefly that uh, decoding information or predicting, uh, predicting information from fMRI data uh, has been shown to be quite informative in a range uh, of uh, tasks. Um, and also analysis have uh, shown that uh, different uh, stimulation types that were used during the, the different memory tasks uh, produced uh, different brain, had uh, distinct brain uh, signatures. Uh, so these brain signatures could be successfully decoded from uh, bold signals from fMRI. Um, so in this study, we analyzed the, the published uh, HCP dataset that, were, that was given to us. And we mainly focus on the working memory and back task, which uh, included data from a zero back task, uh, which is a low uh, working memory load and the high um, working memory load, which was the two back task. So uh, the A, uh, A was to determine uh, the stimulus, um, if the stimulus already can be, uh, let's say, uh, have some different brain signatures by looking already at the behavioral data, then uh, B to predict uh, what was the, st the stimulus uh, type that was used uh, during the, um, I mean, by training a nonlinear model like an SVM with uh, bold signals. And then to see um, what was the, the role of specific uh, brain areas in order to decode correctly the, the stimuli that was used. 
So uh, the zero buck task um, and the two buck task. Um, so in zero buck task, it's just a baseline, uh, very easy task. Just to, um, I mean, the, there are multiple uh, items presented uh, on, the, on the participants, but then there's only one item that participants should, uh, should have it as a target. And each time that this uh, picture uh, is shown to them, they should reply positively that this was uh, the target. Uh, picture. The two-back task is a bit more complicated and uh, here you can see some tools that were used as a, as a stimuli type. And then the participants were asked uh, after two steps um, if, the, if the, the tool that is presented now matches the, the tool that was presented two steps uh, back. Um, and this stimuli is a tool and uh, it was among the others that uh, um, we used for this uh, for this uh, project. So uh, the stimuli that was uh, that were used in this task was uh, bodies, faces, places, and tools. This is um, just visualizing the the behavioral data. So in the upper figure, we can see the the accuracy scores, and and the y axis and the x axis is the participants ID. Uh, so in total, there were three hundred thirty nine participants. And we can already see at the behavioral level that um, some, some, uh, stim some stimuli types that were used uh, didn't produce very uh, high accuracies. For example, you can see that the, the blue distribution here, uh, which uh, bodies, uh, different body parts were used uh, as a stimulation types, uh, we can see uh, for high accuracy scores like uh, 100, it's not that dense compared to uh, faces, for instance. And it's a bit more sparser, um, touching also uh, really low values here. Um, so if you, if we can look now the distribution of times, actually this is a swarm plot, um, but we already see a shift uh, uh, to to higher uh, uh, longer times. For instance, we can see that the participants required more time to to answer when when the when the stimuli that was used was uh, was different parts of bodies uh, we can visualize better if we look the distribution of accuracy scores and response times now so uh, as i said previously this is now the distributions of accuracy scores and here we can see when the bodies uh, when different body parts were used we can see that the distribution is much wider and um, has lower values. I mean, this is the, the plot boxes and the mean is even lower. And we can see now very clearly that participants required more time to, to answer about, um, about uh, bodies actually, uh, when, when body parts were, were used for this, uh, for this task. Um, which suggests, we ended up that this might suggest that, of course, there is a link uh, between the stimulation, the, the stimuli types that were used during the task, and uh, as uh, this, as human beings, we are quite social, and we might uh, give more importance, let's say, to faces uh, and places compared to tools and uh, body parts. So this is why we we achieve higher performances for different faces and places as opposed to. Uh, to tools and uh, and places. So we we uh, we investigated a little bit further. Uh, we did some dimensionality reduction here um, uh, to bring the 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 bold signals from uh, all the the brain areas that we were uh, given to a two D space to visualize if there is any uh, nonlinearity that we could uh, leverage. And here we can see. Um, using a TSNI, actually in the 2D space, um, we were able to, to visualize the different clusters. Uh, and again, the, the blue cluster, which is the body parts, uh, is a bit more sparse compared to the other, which is more tight. So this is the PCA. The PCA doesn't produce very good results, but by increasing the number of components, uh, we, we might also achieve similar results with TSNI. TSNI here produces better results because um, it uses a machine learning algorithm which uh, leverages nonlinear, uh, I mean, nonlinearity in the data. Um, so uh, what we did then was to train, uh, I mean, we use PCA. Uh, so we, we feed the PCA with all the, the ball signals from all, the whole brain and then we produce it uh, um, 
three components, then up to 360, in order to see if an SVM uh, trained with these three components or um, uh, even more, if, if, if we can decode successfully the, the simulation that was used. So uh, we train a support vector machine with a nonlinear kernel, with an RPF kernel. Uh, in the left figure, you can see uh, for, for low numbers of uh, components, uh, let's say around three, it's 50-50. Uh, it wasn't very accurate, but then as long as we increase the number of components, as long as we increase the information uh, that uh, was used in order to train the SVM, we were able to uh, accurately predict the simulation that uh, was used. So uh, even for 20 uh, components, we were able to, to predict the stimulation type that was used. It, it, was, uh, it was a body, it was a tool, it was a face with uh, higher than 90%. Then, uh, uh, we also did something similar, but from another perspective. So instead of uh, summing up all the, all the information to some components from the whole brain, we decided to, to train a, a DLM, um, a generalized linear motor, and an SVM with specific uh, parcels, with specific uh, signals from uh, specific brains, from specific brain areas. Uh, and we can, uh, you can see that we were able to achieve high performance by using only uh, information from secondary visual cortex, uh, as you can see here, which was uh, the parcel ID number 54. And uh, we got high accuracy, like 96%, with low standard deviation, both with a DLM and an SVM. Uh, and minutes. Yes, yes. And um, yeah, uh, so we're able to get uh, higher accuracy for uh, utilizing this information from specific brain areas. Um, and you can see also the, the bar plot here, uh, visualizing the differences between DLMs and SVMs. Um, right, so we expected to see this, uh, this high accuracy here because it's a secondary visual cortex and it's directly relevant with uh, the working memory task as opposed to other uh, brain areas like uh, the somatomotor or uh, network, um, which is not that active and by utilizing information, by training the models um having parcels only from from this brain area it's it's like 50 50 we wouldn't get uh, accurate results so uh just to sum up our conclusions was um a that we were able to show that uh, there is indeed uh, a connection a link between uh, the stimuli the stimuli type that was used and the participants uh, performances uh, which is also dependent on the response times i mean this is the, the low accuracy uh, is reflected also in the response times. Uh, we were also to, able to, to train a simple uh, classifier like an SVM in order to decode successfully uh, the simulation type that was used during the, the working memory task in both working memory tasks. And finally, um, we were able to, uh, to distinguish the importance of some specific uh, brain areas like the secondary visual cortex in these uh, work memory tasks. Uh, I want to thank you all. Uh, this is my contact information. And uh, like I said uh, initially, this project was done during the Neuromass Summer School. So the Neuromass Academy is gratefully uh, acknowledged. So yeah, that was- Thank you, Nicolas. Uh, great talk. Um, we have two minutes for questions. Um, I had a technical question. I was wondering how you were choosing your components. Uh, you said that you had the T-SNE, but from there you chose yes. your components? Yes, I mean, uh, the T-SNE was just to visualize the, the, the data in the 2, 2D or 3D. With T-SNE, it's not possible to go beyond that. So we had to use PCA for that reason. Um, but we were able to get uh, similar results with Disney, but you know, with higher number of components. So, so of you use PCA for it identifying the components. Exactly, exactly. We use PCA actually to go from, to, so we took uh, bold signals from 360 brain areas. We squeezed them, let's say in three components or in 10 components. And then we use this data to, f to feed, to train the, the classifiers in order to, and then we were able to-, to And you them chose them according to their, their, their variance, right? Exactly, exactly, yes, yes, yes.
Very nice. All right. Is, are there any other questions? If not, then we will slowly transition to our next speaker. Um, ben, if you can start sharing your screen. Ben is a PhD student at Queen's University, uh, not too far from where I am. And uh, he's going to speak to us about behavioral models of visual working memory. Your turn, Ben. You can see my screen and hear me? Uh, yep, yeah, all's good. Perfect. So, yeah, my name is Ben Cuthbert. Um, I work at Queen's University with Drs. Uh, Pere and Balome. And today I'm going to talk to you about a visual working memory paradigm called the whole report paradigm. It's uh, relatively new. Um, on the working memory scene. And I'm gonna talk about some analysis that we've done of the data there and how some of these data sort of suggest that um, common models of visual working memory do not capture aspects or do, don't capture behavior on this task. So first I'm just gonna talk to you about what I'm calling a typical delayed estimation task or like a single report delayed estimation task. Basically this task starts by presenting a subject with some stimuli then there's a brief delay period. Following that, one of the locations of the stimuli is probed. Okay, so like this is the probe here. Um, and then the participant or subject is required to re report the stimulus that they were, the stimulus value that they remembered at that location. So in this case, they have to remember the color and report that they saw the green at that location. Um, but really the important thing here is that the stimuli used, and they can be color orientation or even faces, things like that. The important thing is that this stimulus dimension is continuous because when you have a continuous stimulus dimension, every time there's a report, you actually get an angular, in this case, an angular measurement of the error. So here you get an angle telling you how far off the correct color they were. And when you look at these distributions um, on the right here, this is an example of a bunch of distri different distributions, error distributions that you get. Um, at different set sizes. So this is when one item is presented versus two versus four or six. Um, and these distributions are really nice because they're very amenable to statistical analyses. And a lot of people spend a lot of time analyzing these sort of aggregate error distributions with the assumption that the sort of shape and precision of a distribution like this tells you something about the representation that someone had stored, okay? Um, in comparison, the whole report task, which was introduced by Kirsten Adam and colleagues in 2017, in the whole report task, rather than just having one probe and one report per trial, which is really common, they required their participants to actually report the stimulus um, of every single item that they presented within a trial. Um, and in their case, they had a bunch of different conditions. So sometimes the probe order was randomized. Sometimes the participant was allowed to choose um, I'm going to focus on the condition where the participant was allowed to choose. And one of the reasons that we're interested in this task is that they made their code and data publicly available, which is really great. And some people have already taken these data and they've started fitting uh, models developed originally in the single report context. And they've been fitting these models to the new data, using them to draw some conclusions. Um, the task is also increasing in popularity and a bunch of other people have started to use it. Okay. So when just quickly give you a little look at what the report, or sorry, I should say the error distributions look like in a task like this. On the right, I have the sort of classical single report distributions. And we see that in the aggregate, so when you collapse across all participants, collapse across all responses within a trial, in the aggregate, the distributions look pretty similar. We see that when only one item is presented, you have quite accurate reports. These are all, again, angular errors. Um, and then as you present more and more items, the errors become a little bit more diffuse and people seem to be a little bit worse at remembering. So really similar pattern to what you see in the single report context. What's nice about the whole report is that you can actually subdivide these errors. So here I'm showing everything here is, these are the same data that I've showed here. So this is at set size six, but now I'm showing you the error distributions separated by the order in which they were reported within the trial. Okay, so light green, dark blue is the order throughout the trial. And we see a kind of a similar, a similar pattern where people are quite precise in the early responses. And then later on, it's unclear whether, you know, are they guessing or do they have just a little bit of information about the items. 
Um, so Chris and Adams originally spent most of their time focusing on these distributions and seeing what conclusions they could draw there. But what they did not look at are the actual joint distributions. So how, how are the reports made on, the, on within one trial? So when you're reporting items that were simultaneously presented, how are these distributed relative to each other? So what I'm going to show you here are the um, joint distributions between the first report made in a trial. So the y-axis value, these are not errors. These are the actual stimulus values reported first on the y-axis. And then each subsequent plot is the joint distribution between the first report and the second report, or the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, et cetera. OK? So what we see here is that the first report and the second report within the same trial actually have a really strong circular correlation. And I'm going to talk about these correlations a bit. They're circular correlations, so they look a little bit different than linear correlations. If anyone has questions about that, ask me. Uh, but really what I want to focus on is that there's this strong circular correlation between the first and second reports within the same trial. And we lose that a little bit when you look at the third report. But then as you get later in the trial, there's actually sort of a different dependency going on where people seem to be biasing their later trial responses away from the early responses that they made. Another way of looking at this is to look at the relative distance between reports made on the same trial. Okay, so this is a histogram of the differences between the first report on a trial and the second report. Okay, so this is just a different way of looking at these data. Um, we see again, there's a huge peak in the middle here. So people are really choosing almost the same color or a very similar color and their second report is their first. And as you go later into the trial, they actually seem to be biasing their reports away from the early reports. Um, the reason that, this, that I'm focusing on this and that I think that this is a kind of a key finding is that a lot of models of working memory and specifically models developed to um, explain sort of these error distributions at the single report of generated by a single report tasks, these all tend to assume that stimuli are encoded independently that you're shown this array of stimuli and that each one gets its own little representation in visual working memory. Um, but this shows that there seems to be something else going on. The, the relationship between items or stimuli that people are reporting um, is completely unaccounted for in these models. So there are some models that explicitly discuss or that explicitly address the relationship between stimuli. And actually, um, Fosca's talk sort of had a similar idea to this where people things are encoded together or in a sequence. Um, I'm calling this hierarchical or ensemble coding, but there are many, many different names for these and many different models that people have used. One that we could call like a naive ensemble coding is the idea that when presented with an array of stimuli, um, people are sort of implicitly extracting the mean value of the array. Okay, so this is discussed at length by um, Odd, Oliva, a bunch of others have talked about these sort of things. And just to illustrate, on the x-axis here, I'm, I'm showing again stimulus value. This time I've actually color-coded the bars. So these bars would all be stimuli presented on the same trial. And if you're asked to report this dark blue color, in this case, if there was a bias toward the ensemble mean, if people were using that ensemble mean to help them compress memory or something like that, we'd expect a bias toward this ensemble mean. An alternative was introduced in 2018 by um, Nasser and all, and they essentially, they did a whole bunch of different modeling and they essentially predicted that a report should be biased toward the nearest neighbor. So that there should be this bias between reporting an item and the closest item that was simultaneously presented. Yet another very similar variation to this kind of bias is called hierarchical Bayesian clustering. So it was originally introduced by Brady and Alvarez in 2011 um, Orhan and Jacobs sort of came up with a more general case. And effectively, they assume that people are extracting clusters from an array. So in this case, you could imagine that these three similar red colors would be grouped together. These three um, bluish colors would be grouped together. Um, here, the histogram is a posterior over the cluster mean. I don't have time to go into the details of how I got this posterior, but feel free to ask me later. And this predicts a bias toward the cluster mean. Okay, in a lot of these cases, these biases, the direction of the bias can be the same, um, but the actual magnitude of the biases predicted are different. 
regardless of any of the differences, no matter how you slice it, I've done tons and tons of different tests. There are no significant biases toward any of these ensemble means or cluster means. So that I really haven't been able to find evidence for any of these biases predicted by hierarchical models in this data set. And then finally, just to make things a little bit more complicated, um, Chris and Adam AL didn't just use color for stimuli, they also used orientation. So they replicated every single condition with color and orientation. So here again, I'm showing you the aggregate error distributions for color. And then below that, the aggregate error distributions for orientation. And a lot of different people have used multi both of these um, stimuli, stimulus modalities more or less interchangeably. Um, and the common assumption seems to be that these are more or less encoded into working memory in a similar way. And at the aggregate level, that seems to be true. But then when you go and you look at the um, joint distributions or the relationship within the trial, and these are the same exact tasks, the only difference is that one uses color and one uses orientation. You see that participants seem to be approaching this task in a completely different way. None of the dependencies that we saw with color are present in the orientation condition. Um, despite having the aggregate distributions look really similar. And I think this is interesting because, like I said, everyone assumes that these are the same and people will even feed the error distributions into the same sort of models to make similar, to make conclusions. Um, but we're ignoring the fact that these seem to be completely different behavior. Okay, so in summary, within trial reports are not independent. So when stimuli are presented on the, at the same time, people seem to have some sort of dependency between them. The fact that they're presented at the same time seems to have a huge difference in how they were, are reported. Uh, that's important because many models developed in the single report context assume that they're encoded independently. I was not able to find any evidence for ensemble or hierarchical encoding, which is sort of the main alternative model where um, stimuli are sort of grouped or chunked together based on some sort of compression optimization. And finally, different behavior when reporting orientation versus color threw in a few limitations here, just preempting what people might say. These are still aggregate data. Um, we, we still get, we, this task gets you an error estimate for every single item on a trial, but we still have to aggregate them all together to get these sort of estimates of precision. And then finally, we don't have spatial position information. You can imagine that if people were um, using ensembles or clustering things together in visual working memory, that the spatial location on the screen would be very important. Um, and there have been a little bit of modeling um, to sort of try to capture these effects. Unfortunately, we don't have access to the spatial location. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. That was great. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I'm opening the floor for questions. We have three minutes. Um, I have here um, a, co a comment and a question that you can see. Um, so Ivan Tomic first congratulates you on, on the talk and then says, you're, you're talking about encoding correlations, but aren't these reporting correlations? And so distinguishing encoding and, and reporting correlations. Saying- so You uh, don't see such strong correlations toward other presented colors, but you do toward responses. Um, so you're absolutely right when I say encoding, I'm just adopting the language used by people who, who model these tasks in the past. These are absolutely just the reports that people are providing. Um, I'm not really sure about the distinction that you're making though, because like we don't have access to any kind of encoded representation. Like all we have are these distributions of errors. Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by, I'm, I guess I don't understand how you could have encoding correlations without reporting correlations. I'm not sure if um, you want to clarify. Yeah, that. yeah, Ivan, you're welcome to clarify uh, on the on the chat. Um, and um, if there's any other questions, I was actually you kind of answered my question. I was wondering to what extent like these history effects could be accounted for by some type of reinforcement learning model or or some type of sampling um, uh, theory. But the fact that you don't see these these uh, these effect the same whether you have orientation or color would seem to go towards more like an, an encoding property as you're, you're, you're um, yeah I, there is one one paper that I could point you to if you're curious about that um, by Matt Panicello et al it's like 2019 Nature Communications paper 
they argue they basically show the aggregate or not even aggregate they show just the distribution of all reported colors across a task like this and they show that the distribution is actually really peaked in certain colors like people are tend to report similar colors more often mm. um, and they present sort of a dynamical they have like a drift diffusion model and they they suggest that maybe there could be like attractors in memory centered on colors that participants have seen more often either throughout their life or throughout like a block of, of trials. Um, and, and they do quite a bit of modeling and analyses suggesting that maybe people are sort of biased toward commonly presented colors. So that's kind of like a reinforcement learning effect. Um, but like you said, looking at the orientation distributions, they only did color and looking at the orientation distributions, it makes it seem kind of, um, I don't know. It's it's hard to imagine how that yeah. would work. Sorry. Okay, thank you. That's that's a good answer. Uh, we have a last question. Uh, Chuan Wan here is saying, for his awesome talk, you presented three theories um, to adjudicate among, uh, right? So other than ensemble and hierarchical, did you find evidence for the center surround account? Yeah, it's kind of a bit disingenuous how I presented them as if like these were the three competing theories. These are just three easy biases that I could explain quickly. Um, I did not, if you're talking about center surround, I'm, I'm specifically referring to predictions made in this 2018 paper by uh, Nasser and, and Michael Frank. Um, I did not find any evidence. They, they reported a bunch of biases that they identified in their data in a single report task. And I could not replicate any of the biases that they reported. Um, the center surround was just kind of part of the modeling that they suggested to explain those biases. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Ben. Uh, I'd like to thank you to your talk for your talk and thanking all the panelists again. Thank you so much. We'll be closing Thanks the so session, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. See you all. It was nice seeing you, and I learned a lot. So thank you again. Thank you very much. So I'll just repeat it if you don't hear me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. No, no worries. <laughs> okay. Let me just uh, make sure I pronounce your name correctly. Gabrielle Pouchelon. You're, you're muted. Yes, that's perfect. Pouchelon. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And Aaron, I might have a problem with your name as well. So it's uh, Satya Nason. Satya Nason. Satya Nason. Okay, perfect. Okay, we have two minutes more. Uh, I'm starting the webinar now. All the best.
Okay, let's start. Uh, welcome everyone to this webinar this afternoon. We have an amazing lineup of speakers today. We have Andy Hansen, uh, Gabriel Fouchelon, and Aaron Seti Hansen. We'll start off with Andy. Uh, Andy is a PhD student in the lab of Simon Hippenmayer at um, IXT Austria. And he'll give a talk on cell autonomous and non-autonomous mechanisms controlling projection neuron migration. Welcome, Andy. Andrew, you're muted. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, sorry. Can you can you see my screen? Uh, we just see, now we see. Now, now you see the screen, right? Yes. Perfect. Okay, let let's uh, let's start. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm a PhD student in the Hippenmeyer Lab at IST Austria. My talk is focused on cell autonomous gene function and non cell autonomous mechanism controlling cortical projection neuron migration. We are interested in the brain and how this organ is formed. During brain development of the mouse, projection neurons are generated by radial glia cells near the ventricle, as seen here, and migrate radially to establish the first layer of neurons in the cortex. The next cohort and the following cohorts of neurons change their morphology to a multipolar shape, reattach to the radial glia, which they use as a highway for the further migration. Until they reach the top of the brain, and settle on top of the previously generated layers. This is called inside out layering of the cortex. And so goes the next cohorts of neurons until a six layered structure of the cortex is established. Here you see an image of how the layering really looks like in the adult mouse brain. So why is neuronal migration important to study? This functional cortical neuronal migration often translates into prominent neurodevelopmental diseases which remain poorly understood and largely untreated. In this picture, you see an example of a normal human brain with many folds and a sophisticated distribution of gray and white matter. If neuronal migration goes wrong during development, it can lead to what is called smooth brain or lysencephaly, one of the more severe neuronal migration phenotypes. These patients have severe malformations of the brain, lacking folds and are severely intellectually impaired. Despite the fact that in the last decades, a rich catalog of genes has been implicated in neuronal migration, the relationship between these signaling pathways and the discrete steps of migration are still mostly unknown. Most genes so far encoding for important proteins in the migration machinery have mostly been investigated on the cell intrinsic cell autonomous level. However, almost no information exists on the possible contribution of whole tissue effects, non-cell autonomous effects, which are involved in neuronal migration and the formation uh, of the brain. What are the possible non-cell autonomous mechanisms? In any in vivo context, cells will always be exposed to a complex extracellular environment consisting of secreted factors acting as potential signaling cues, the extracellular matrix, and other cells providing cell-cell interaction through receptors and or direct physical stimuli. Therefore, most genes controlling the radial neuronal migration can potentially, besides cell autonomous functions, also act through non-cell autonomous mechanisms. Non-cell autonomous mechanisms have so far not been studied in great detail and especially not in vivo. The missing knowledge on whole tissue effects are mainly due to the lack of experimental setups in which this biological process can be investigated at high cellular resolution. Therefore, I have set out to dissect cell autonomous gene function and non-cell autonomous mechanisms on radial neuronal migration using a gene-centric approach called mosaic analysis with double markers, short for MADAM. For MADAM to work, you need a MADAM line, a Cree driver, and a candidate gene. With that, you can generate cell type-specific sparse labeling and concomitant genetic manipulation. With MADAM, we can generate sparse mosaics where we have a mutant cell in an otherwise normal environment. We can also generate full knockouts where you have mutant cells in a mutant environment. So these mutants have the same genotype but different environments. So any differences we see between these can be deduced as non-cell autonomous mechanisms. Therefore, MADAM provides a unique genetic tool to investigate cell autonomous gene functions and the relative contribution on non-cell autonomous mechanisms. So to study this, we need a candidate gene. Previous studies have shown that mutant cells for noodle one can migrate up until the cortical plate in a mosaic environment surrounded by wild type cells. 
However, another independent study reported a complete block of neuronal migration within the ventricular zone and intermediate zone upon conditional whole tech cortex knockout of noodle one. Therefore, it was speculated that non cell autonomous effects might have an influence on neuronal migration. Because the noodle one full knockout was lethal, we created mosaic and full knockouts of the upstream activator of noodle one, namely P35, to study the cell autonomous gene function and non cell autonomous effects on neuronal migration. We first had a look at the adult brain to see what happens when we generate a P35 mosaic and P35 full knockout. Here you see a cross section of the cerebral cortex of the control madden where all cells are wild type using emx one cre to drive the madden events. We quantified the relative distribution of neurons throughout the cortical wall shown here in 10 bins. In the mosaic where only the green cells are mutant for P35, we see a migration phenotype where most of the cells are stuck in the lower bins, mainly in the white matter. However, in the full knockout, where all the cells are mutant for P35, we saw a more or less even distribution of neurons throughout the cortex. When we compare the mutant green cells from the mosaic directly to the green cells from the full knockout, we see a significant difference in the neuronal distribution. This difference indicates the presence of non-cell autonomous effects. To further study how this arises, we need to look what happens during development. At the earlier time points, we already saw a significant different uh, distribution between the mutant in the mosaic and the full knockout, which persists throughout development here at E16 and P0. Here, the cell autonomous gene function of P35 is important for the ability to enter the target area because the majority of the mutant neurons are stuck below the cortical plate in the mosaic. However, non-cell autonomous effects are present too. But what are they? To characterize the extent of the putative non-cell autonomous effects on a molecular level, we applied transcriptomics. We first compared the mutant cells from the mosaic to the control, and almost no deregulated genes were found. Yet in the full knockout, a high number of differentially expressed genes were found at E16 and P0. Strikingly, the gene expression profile of the mosaic mutant has almost no deregulated gene or genes, although both scenarios are mutant for P35, only the environment is different. To directly characterize the extent of the non-cell autonomous effects, we compared the mosaic mutant directly to the uh, full knockout. We saw the regulation at E13, E16, and a very strong difference at P0. The majority of the deregulated genes were downregulated. To see what function the bulk of the regulated genes is associated with, we applied gene ontology analysis. This showed that the top deregulated goal term was regulation of cell adhesion and many cell adhesion essential genes were also found in the other significant goal terms. This analysis revealed cell adhesion as a major non-cell autonomous component. To further characterize the non-cell autonomous mechanism and substantiate our transcriptomic findings, we also employed proteomics using a similar approach. We analyzed only the green labeled cells from the three genotypes at PCO. We first compared the mosaic mutants to the control and only saw three significant deregulated proteins. However, to investigate the non-cell autonomous with the regulated proteins, we compared the P35 mosaic directly to the P35 full knockout. The top 10, the top 10 up and down regulated proteins are shown in red here. And as you can see, we found a high amount of the regulated proteins. To characterize the function of the deregulated proteins, we next perform goal analysis of the differentially expressed proteins between P35 mosaic and the full knockout. In these goal terms, we found many proteins related to membrane and extracellular matrix, and they make up the majority of the downregulated proteins. To see if there would be any overlap of the regulation that we found in transcriptomic and proteomics, we matched the overlapping deregulated proteins and the genes of the P35 mosaic mutant and full knockout. This showed a significant overlap of both up and down regulated genes and proteins. Again, to characterize the function of the deregulated genes and proteins, we performed goal term analysis of the overlapping differentially expressed genes and proteins between the P35 mosaic and the full knockout. This analysis revealed that the regulated genes and proteins regulated, uh, related to membrane and extracellular matrix in general make up the majority of the down regulated proteins pointing towards cell adhesion as a major non cell autonomous component. So how do neurons actually migrate in these scenarios? Because migration is a very dynamic process, we also analyze the movement of migrating neurons in living brain slices. Here, I will show you a, show you a time lapse of the development cortex at E16 in the wild type and from the other two uh, genotypes. Uh, in the still picture, you will see all time frames in one picture. Now let's look at the mosaics where only the green neurons are mutant for P35. I hope you can appreciate the difference compared to their corresponding wild types. However, the neurons are still quite dynamic. 
So how do the full knockout cells behave? In general, there's not much movement in the full knockout environment. We then analyzed the trajectories of the migrating neurons and found a significant difference for two parameters, displacement and directionality. When we compared the mosaic mutant directly to full knockout, we see that the mutant neurons in the normal environment can migrate faster and more directional than mutants in the full knockout. This shows that non-cell autonomous effects influence neuronal migration dynamics. Because cell adhesion showed to be a major non-cell autonomous component in neuronal migration for P35, we speculated that this might be a general non-cell autonomous effect and therefore could also apply to other migration mutants. We therefore investigated another migration gene, that one which is the main intracellular component of the reeling signaling pathway. We analyzed that one in the same way as we did it for P35, and this analysis also revealed, as you can see, a cell autonomous gene function and non-cell autonomous effects for that one in the tissue. To see if this overlap in non-cell autonomous phenotype also present at the transcriptomic level, we looked at the differential gene expression for both P45 and that one mutants. We found more than 1,000 deregulated genes, both mutants. Uh, when we compare these two mutants uh, of their overlapping genes, differential expressed genes, we found significant overlap of upper downregulated genes. However, the majority of the overlap was downregulated. To see what, what function these common downregulated genes are associated, we applied gene ontology analysis. This revealed significant deregulated goal terms containing many cell adhesion essential genes. This analysis revealed cell adhesion as a common non-cell autonomous component for two distinct migration mutants. Therefore, these tissue-wide effects might be general and could be the cause for the aberrant layering in many migration phenotypes. In summary, in the sparse knockout, we see a failure of the mutant neurons to invade the cortical plate, which is the cell autonomous gene function. In a global knockout, we see tissue-wide irregular migration of neurons, which is due to non-cell autonomous effects. These non-cell autonomous effects are likely caused by a downregulation of cell adhesion proteins. In the sparse knockout, the normal environment provides a normal expression of cell adhesion proteins in the mosaic mutant neurons. The downregulation of cell adhesion proteins is a major non-cell autonomous component, which most likely caused irregular migration in the global knockout and thereby leads to aberrant lamination in the global knockout cortex. I would like to thank the Hit My Lab, our collaborators, my thesis committee, and IST facilities, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, it was a very clear and enlightening talk. Uh, we're waiting for the questions to come up. All right. in, the meantime, in the meantime, let me just ask you if you could uh, explain a little more about the um, uh, phenotype of the birth defect caused by these uh, non-migrating cells. As you, as you showed in the beginning. Exactly. So in the mosaic, where only the, the green cells that I showed were mutant, they could migrate up until the cortical plate, right? But they were actually quite dynamic and were managed to, to, to migrate up there. In the full knockout, however, in the whole cortical wall, we didn't really, they were much, much slower, right? So in terms of dynamics and position, this was very, very different. Although they are mutant for the same gene, right? But they are in two different environments. In the mosaic, the mutant cell is in a normal environment, whereas the uh, mutant, the full knockout, they all knock out the cells in, in the full knockout, right? You see a very different phenotype. And how does this, uh, that this uh, reflected in the function or structure of the brain eventually Ex in the system level? Exactly. So what we think is what we can measure, right, is that cell adhesion molecules are associated essential molecules for cell adhesion are downregulated and thereby uh, could cause the migraine. So what we actually did, what I have not, didn't have time to show here is we also modeled this taking a cell adhesion parameters to find out how can we actually connect the molecular findings to the migration directly. And we actually find, found by, by taking velocity and directionality, the two parameters I showed you, when we model this, we can actually generate with having this cell adhesion parameter, just these two things could actually generate the phenotypes, which shows that cell adhesion is sufficient to generate the phenotypes that we see. Sorry, thank you very much, Andy, for this talk. Uh, and we're moving on to the next uh, speaker. Our next speaker is Gabrielle Couchelon. She's a postdoc in the Fisher Lab in Harvard Medical School, studying the biologic inhibitory injury neurons and how they are specializing for cortical circuits. And we'll hear her talk on um, the organization and developmental establishment of cortical interneuron presynaptic circuits. 
Uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. So basically, uh, I look at in the Fisher lab at inter neurons. So basically, also the cortex, like Andy, uh, but the inhibition there, not excitatory neurons, and also at later time points where they actually form circuits. Because if you can see from this very basic Harlequin representation, we actually built a sensory representation and then sensory motor skills when we can represent the world. And this happens because indeed neurons differentiate in a very specialized way. But in addition to migration, we have also specialization in terms of circuits and what they receive and how they form that. So this is where I'm going now uh, to actually integrate sensory perception and then create a cognitive uh, functions based on this integration, uh, information is actually processed within the neocortex into discrete, discrete, discrete cortical areas. So for example, we have uh, visual inputs that is received in primary visual cortex V1 or some other sensory system in S1. And we also have a higher function in this M2 a cognitive area where actually motor planning take, takes place here. And the units of neurons that are actually uh, supporting the flow of information in those cortical areas are the neurons. And as Andy was telling you, we have uh, the majority of excitatory neurons that is represented by these gray pyramidal cells, but then there are also 20% of GABAergic inhibitory neurons that uh, shape the flow of information. And they're very diverse, but they each provide canonical motif of inhibition to specialize the circuits and gate properly the flow of information. And here I'm interested in two types that together represent the biggest proportion of interneurons in the cortex. And in addition, they're born from the same structure, uh, progenitor structures, but they differentiate into those very distinct uh, interneurons. PV interneurons first provide for fit forward inhibition by receiving this strong thalamic input and then uh, sending this inhibition to the cortex, while SST interneurons provide feedback inhibition by receiving a lot of cortical inputs. So this raises the question of how the circuits are built. First, are those uh, motifs of inhibition uh, true in every of those areas, but also thalamus and cortex are very gen generic terms, and they are actually subdivided in functional population. So how is this specific organization? So what I will show you is that first, uh, it's actually this specific circuit is not strongly uh, canonical in those different areas. They're actually uh, the afferents to SST and PV interneurons are first uh, defined by the areal location. Then we do see specific SST versus PV specificity in the way they integrate those uh, afferents from in, within an area. And last, I will very quickly give you uh, a bit more of mechanism into how activity and molecular uh, pathways actually allow for the integration of those afferents. So the way I looked at that is first by actually looking at um, uh, the, the afferents onto PV and SST cells use rabies tracing. So this is possible by targeting with AAV uh, helpers to the rabies in the specific population of interest. And then rabies would target specifically this population and allow for the monosynaptic retrograde labeling. And this is possible for PV and SST uh, with Cree line. First, we could use SST Cree that you can see here allows for the recombination of the helpers in uh, at early stages as well as uh, adult ones. However, for PV, that was a bit more complicated because PV is actually uh, allowing the recombination only late. So to target early circuits, uh, the early PV to target the circuits, we actually designed an intersectional strategy in which I uh, recombine the helpers into the progenitors of both populations with LHX6 Cree, and then uh, removed uh, the helpers from SST using SST flip recombinase and allow only for the expression in predative PV. And this worked very nicely, allowing for the exact co-localization with parvalbumin later on, so targeting the PV early cells uh, in, in the cortex. So what we could do is trace the PV cells early in development then, as early as P5, to look at the rabies retrograde labeling uh, in the P5, P10 window, and then compare with an adult time points. And I did that for then both PV and SST within those three distinct areas I was mentioning to see how those afferents are built. And here I'm showing you an example of rabies tracing because after I'm gonna talk a lot about degree of connectivity and no more the images directly. But you can see how it looks like now where you have the local injection of helpers and rabies in which each red cell is actually representing the retrograde labeling neurons 
to the starter population, uh, uh, which are in green with the helpers. And you also see long range projection neurons, such as here in the thalamus, where uh, those neurons were retrogradely labeled by targeting directly the population. And we also collaborated with the COSA lab to actually define an automated method to quantify the neurons and uh, see the distribution of this uh, uh, afferents. So for example, you see the starter cell here in S1 region, and you can see for the retrograde labeling here that the neurons are actually um, uh, found in many uh, discrete R regions of the cortex. So to actually find what region and what neurons are projecting to PVNSST, we then looked at within this retrograde labeling and aligned the uh, sections to an atlas. And from this atlas, we could define each population of neurons projecting to PVNSST. So for example, what I was telling you for the cortex, this is very generic, but we actually have very uh, distinct subregion within the cortex, such as the cingulates ACA here or M2, M1, that we could uh, quantify for the number of neurons projecting to PVNSST. There is, this is the case as well for the thalamus with different nucleus from the thalamus projecting to PVNSST. And we also have other subcortical regions that I'm not gonna talk much about today. So this is how we represent the result and how it looks like. So we traced the PV and SST interneurons into those three distinct regions. And what we expected from what we know in terms of functional circuits is that PV received a lot of thalamic inputs and then SST received a lot of cortical inputs to provide feedback inhibition. And this is the representation as a heat map of the degree of connectivity from each of those regions we found in the brain to project to either PV and SST within those each region. And if we divide those subregion into those groups, cortex, thalamus, I was telling you, and this is the others, we actually don't see very strong patterns towards PV versus SST. Actually, uh, this is way more complex than that. You can see from that heat map, and if we do an unsupervised clustering of all these areas, we actually see that PV and SST are way closer within one area than uh, another PV, for example, into another area. And this is confirmed with the correlation plot from the person correlation where you can see that they strongly correlate when they are within one area. So what about how cell types specifically target uh, within those areas, those afferents? So if we see again that canonical circuits, we expected that local cortex would specifically target SST. And here you can see here, this is really the case in M2. But this is actually not the case in S1 and V1. And similarly, if we look at other cortical input, you can see that we have a distribution in how strongly they connect to cortical areas. So basically, what we think now from this model is that PV and SST are not strongly segregated in terms of afferent they receive, but they actually regulate the type of cortical their input they receive, depending where it comes from. And this is the same in the thalamus. We don't have a strong bias of thalamus to PV at all from this cortical map. Instead, we can see that they receive distinct thalamic inputs within one area that they're gonna regulate differentially. And if we classify those neurons based on their function, we have limbic first and higher order thalamic inputs. And those different functions, if we classify them, uh, they actually have distinct profile of projection functionally in the cortex. And if we look at them within one area of S1 thalamic input, for example, they actually differentially are integrating onto PV and SST. And here we quantify the whole proportion of first and higher order. And we can actually see that PV receive more of this first order type of inputs from the thalamus, while SST has a balance of the two of them. So that we suggest that PV and SST regulates the afferents that are coming into one area specifically in a different way. And we confirm that by looking at the development in which we can see different dynamics in uh, the way they regulate a common input. So we found, for example, late dynamics of how uh, the inputs gonna be integrated. When we have a progression with more here control lateral inputs coming onto PV, uh, while for SST, you can see that this is not as strongly happening. So we have a lot of control color maturing later. We also have early dynamics in here, where it's again different between PV and SST, with more local cortex projecting to PV early on, and they don't look like in minority uh, compared to the rest of connectivity later on, while SST just keeps maturing. And the last interesting one is also transitory connectivity with the, the subplate that is mostly absent in adults, but you can see strongly connect PV and SST early on with also distinct amount. So those dynamics are different between the cell type depending in what area they are. And this is the same for the thalamus. Here, this is 
in S1, but we have seen that they integrate different thalamic input differentially. PV receive more first order, while SST have an equivalent balance between the two. But early on, PV has the same ratio, while SST actually have gradually acquire the first order neurons. They're first driven by first order. So if I summarize this, we can see that both PV and SST start with the same type of input from the thalamus driven by first order mostly. But later on, SST gonna balance the type of input between first and higher order, while PV in sensory area will maintain that ratio. So we looked at that in visual cortex when we see the same trend. However, what's interesting is that while SST always look alike, PV in M2 actually receive a balance between first and higher order. So what we think it suggests is that SST that looks alike in all areas, maybe by its identity, postsynaptically regulates the thalamic afferents in their own way. While PV that looks different in the different areas probably uh, is affected by the presynaptic input, specifically that we know at those time points, the uh, PV cells receive uh, um, sensory experience that we know shapes the, the cortical circuits. So probably activity could regulate the thalamic input. And this is something we look like, we look at. So does the thalamic and presynaptic activity would regulate the afferents onto PV? And so we check that by looking at how uh, whisper deprivation would affect the, uh, the, the division between first and higher order. And actually, when we actually deprive the whiskers to the pups, we notice that PV doesn't receive that primary drive from the first order anymore. They actually look like they are in M2 where they don't receive sensory activity. Uh, so this is the summary of that. And so PV afferents, thalamic afferents, are affected by sensory experience. And SST, normal balance between first and higher order, was not affected. So we believe that SST that actually have the same division everywhere could regulate those afferents based on their identity. So we found one in which we have um, receptors that could regulate the way the afferents come in. This is m one and GLUR1 is specifically expressed in SST cells very nicely. So what we did, and this is very preliminary, uh, but I think it's very interesting is that we actually using CRISPR strategy, delete the MGLUR1 expression as early as birth, uh, and then looked at how the first and higher order or uh, organized onto SST. And we actually see uh, more first order neurons to SST uh, when we delete for MGLUR1. So probably MGLUR1 postsynaptically is able to regulate the afferents coming in. So to summarize, we basically have a mechanism in which thalamic, uh, presynaptic input and here thalamus are defined depending early on, depending on the area they project. And then postsynaptically, the somatostatin interneurons here would regulate the way this input comes, while PV interneurons are actually affected by activity. So we think our presynaptic activity regulates those afferents, while for MGLUR1, we have a postsynaptic effect. Uh, so I think that goes well with the idea of cell autonomous versus non-cell autonomous ID that Andy was describing. Uh, and we'd like to push you that. So now I just want to finish by thanking the Fisher Lab, obviously, our collaborators in the COSA Lab or uh, Kim at Janelia Farm. And thank you for your attention. Sorry. Thank you very much, Gabrielle. Uh, we're a little bit ahead of time. We have uh, two minutes for questions. Um, so I understand that this is uh, pending publication, right? You're waiting. It's, it's in bioarchive right now. So yeah, in yeah. Revision. Yeah, so the, the not yet, actually. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Uh, the M group, the postsynaptic part is very preliminary. It's something that we try to investigate now. So this is not part of the no. bioarchive. Yeah, yeah, the one before. Yeah, exactly. Everything else is, yeah. Okay, great. Good luck with that. And we're moving on to the last uh, speaker for today's webinar. Let me introduce Aaron Seta Janssen. He finished his bachelor's in uh, bioengineering in India. From there, he moved to the States to do PhD with Dr. Lean at the University of Maryland. Now he is a postdoc with Dr. Vittorio Gallo at Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC, working on cerebellar dysfunction in mouse models of neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and we'll hear his talk on disruption of neonatal Purkinje cell function underlies injury-related learning deficits. Thank you. Thank you, Shlomit, for that introduction. 
Uh, so my name is Aaron Satinason. I'm a postdoc in the Gallo Lab. Um, and today I'll talk to you about uh, a story uh, that um, we're working on where we're looking at uh, neonatal Purkinje cells in the cerebellum and how uh, circuitry and function are affected after um, a neonatal brain injury in a mouse model. So uh, prematurity and associated neonatal brain injury significantly related to developmental delay and neurological dis uh, dismaturation. Uh, so just, this is uh, data from uh, Terry Inder's group at uh, Harvard and her collaborators in Australia, where they're correlating the newborn MRI scales uh, uh, at, uh, um, during neurodevelopment neuro neuro to um, outcomes at age seven. And what you can see, there's, uh, there's um, a lot of uh, different uh, behavioral outcomes which are affected uh, based on the global score significance. Um, and for the purpose of this talk, uh, we'll just look at the consequences on motor behavior uh, due to prematurity and the associated injury. So um, the late fetal cerebellum is especially vulnerable due to its protracted development. Uh, and the time period of injury between uh, 24 to, rough, to uh, birth and beyond uh, correlates to, um, or the injury during this time uh, can be quite severe to the cerebellum. So over here, you can see MRI scans of uh, normal versus preterm infants with cerebellar and uh, white matter injury. Uh, so these are like severe cases. Um, and so many of these uh, infants grow on to have uh, motor skill deficits, language skill uh, socialization deficits. Um, and so the reason for this is because the uh, cerebellum during this time, time period, uh, the, the volume of the cerebellum increases four times and the cerebral cortical surface increases 30 times. So uh, the, there are developmental processes happening which are disrupted due to injury. So we use a clinically relevant model of uh, neonatal, neonatal brain injury where we expose uh, mouse pups along with their dams to hypoxia uh, between uh, P3 to P11. So this time window correlates to the time window of injury in, uh, in, uh, in, in human infants. So um, earlier, what we had shown using this, uh, using this model is that the Purkinje cells, which are the principal cells of the cerebellar cortex, uh, have a delayed the dendrization phenotype. So over here, you can see the dendritic arbors of the Purkinje cells. These are the cell soma. Uh, this is labeled with calbindin, which is a marker specific to Purkinje cells. Uh, and uh, if you look at the uh, if you look at the dendritic arbor arbors, you see a delay in the maturation of the dendritic arbors, but there's no difference in the number of Purkinje cells, so there's no significant cell death happening. Um, in the human, what happens is the injury is a little bit more severe, uh, but we do see this uh, similarity in the uh, in the due to hypoxic injury in the preemie in the uh, preterm infants, uh, this uh, reduction in the dendritic arborization of the Purkinje cells. Um, so, uh, work that we had previously published uh, showed that in, uh, in the course of the normal development, obviously you have Purkinje cells developing uh, they normally and they have uh, these beautiful dendritic arbors. Um, uh, but in the case of hypoxic injury, there is a, a lower developmental GABA uh, being secreted in the cerebellar cortex. Uh, that's something I won't go into, but suffice to say that these Purkinje cells are affected uh, not morphologically, but uh, their function is affected, their physiology is affected, um, and the behavior, cerebellar behavior is affected. So over here, what we have done, what we had done before is we measured uh, cerebellar behavior. So this is a learning uh, task, uh, which is cerebellar dependent. And in red, you can see the performance uh, uh, during uh, the uh, challenge paradigm, the learning paradigm uh, of these hypoxic animals. Um, so this difference represents the, uh, the difference in the cerebral learning, uh, which is a associative learning. So uh, there's a tone associated with an obstacle presented uh, to the path of uh, a mouse. And so uh, over multiple trials, normal mice learn to associate this tone. And so you see a reduction in the step time, but this, uh, this does not, uh, is not reflected in the hypoxics, uh, hypoxic animals or the injured animals. So there's a lack of association between the obstacle in the path of locomotion and uh, the, uh, the tone uh, to learn to avoid the obstacle. And so in the uh, physiology, what we see is there's a reduction in the Purkinje cell firing. Uh, this is both the spontaneous firing. So over here, you can see uh, uh, in vivo electrophysiology recordings from Purkinje cells, and these are in anesthetized animals. 
Uh, you see reduction in spontaneous firing, as well as when you uh, evoke with channel redoption, which is an optogenetic uh, uh, tool, you see a reduction in the, uh, a significant reduction in the hypoxics as well. So these Purkinje cells are not able to fire as much. Um, so the next question you wanted to ask, and what I'll talk about today is, how does the neonatal brain injury affect circuit function or circuit performance in behaving animals? Uh, so in order to do this, we combine calcium fiber photometry using uh, GCAMP uh, 6F uh, with, with the Erasmus Ladder behavioral paradigm. Um, so in order to do that, we had to first validate the GCAMP 6F uh, injections. So over here, you can see Purkinje cells injected with the GCAMP. Uh, obviously, this is like a cerebellar cortex inject injected with GCAMP, and this is a spontaneous activity of the Purkinje cells. So you can see very nice calcium, uh, calcium activity, and this is a zoomed in uh, uh, picture, a zoomed in movie of the Purkinje cell dendrites uh, showing spontaneous activity. Uh, so we confirmed that the, uh, we can see these, um, or we can measure these, uh, the GCAM signal. The next thing what we wanted to do is to, in, uh, is to combine this, uh, the calcium uh, 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 photometry with the Erasmus ladder paradigm. So over here uh, is the experimental uh, uh, protocol I'm showing you. Uh, we inject the uh, GCAMP at uh, P, uh, P20, and then we measure uh, at uh, uh, P30. Uh, and so over here is a just a small schematic of the, um, of the technique. Uh, we're measuring the GCAMP 6F signal from Purkinje cells. So L7 Cre is a marker specific to Purkinje cells. Uh, and we can see the, uh, we can measure the uh, signals uh, from the Purkinje cells as the mouse is behaving on the ladder. Uh, and so this is like a schematic of how we, uh, how we uh, integrate the Erasmus ladder system with the fiber photometry. Um, and we can measure uh, uh, Purkinje cell activity during learning uh, in this uh, paradigm. All right, so, and we do this using a Teensy-based interface and that's uh, powered using um, Bonsai, which is a uh, uh, visual programming platform for behavioral experiments. All right, so this is what it looks like. This is the video tracking. Um, so we can track these animals very well on the ladder as they're behaving and we can measure their uh, fiber photometry. So over here is a trace of the GCAM 6F signal and a control, control signal. Uh, in, solid are the, um, uh, in solid circles are the unconditional stimuli and in open circles are the conditional stimuli. So when they're paired together, you see the paired stimuli. Um, and so if you zoom in to see, you can see that uh, you get pretty, uh, pretty good signal to noise ratio of the um, of the GCAM. So when we look at the uh, of, uh, look at the sessions, uh, uh, learning sessions, uh, normoxia versus hypoxia, you see that uh, over over sessions there's a sharpening of the response, and this response uh, is um, uh, uh, is is quite different in the hypoxics compared to the normoxics. When we zoom in to see the CSUS window specifically, you see uh, again you see a slight increase in the hypoxic. Uh, calcium uh, calcium response, but it's the, the, the total profile is quite different. Um, and we confirmed that the Purkinje cells are responsive in general to a sensory response. So uh, before the latter uh, paradigm itself, we have an air stimulus. So you can see in the normoxics, you see an increase in Purkinje cell activity, and you see a, uh, you see a similar activity in the hypoxics. So if you were to do the, if you were to like, uh, 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 you know, uh, analyze the whole uh, group uh, and compare across uh, groups, between hypoxics and normoxics, you see this difference in the uh, Purkinje cell response um, during, during the learning sessions. Um, and if you quantify this, we see a difference in the Z-scores, which is the difference in the Purkinje cells uh, in different uh, learning sessions as well. Um, and if we were to uh, correlate this learning, the Purkinje cell, uh, Purkinje cell signal to the uh, step time, which is, um, which, uh, which is over here, the Z-score of the step time, you see a difference, you see a, a divergence in the uh, uh, a behavior and the physiology of the um, uh, in this Purkinje cell versus the behavior, and you can quantify this again using another pair, another uh, measurement called the um, Euclidean uh, measurement. So we see a difference between hypoxic and normoxics in the physiology and the behavior. Um, and so uh, this is uh, this is the effect of injury on uh, trial duration and velocity measurements. And so suffice to say, we don't see uh, very obvious differences in the velocity measurements themselves. Um, so this is something specific to the uh, step time uh, during learning, not, not during the tr entire trial. All right, so what's happening during, uh, these, uh, during this learning that's causing these long-term deficits? Um, as I showed you before, early on, there's this reduction in the Purkinje cell activity, 
Um, and we know that there are protein cell dependent processes during development. So the question that we wanted to ask was, if we were to artificially silence um, uh, Purkinje cells, would we be able to uh, phenocopy the effect of neonatal brain injury? So in order to do that, we crossed a GI dreadline, which is an inhibitory dreadline uh, with Purkinje cell specific CRE, and we injected CNO uh, uh, between P3 to P11, which is the same time window of injury. And then we measured uh, uh, behavior at a later time point. And what we noticed is similar to the hypoxics, we see a difference in the, uh, the Z-score of the Purkinje cells uh, between the uh, uh, between the CNO injected and the saline injected, the CNO sorry I should um, the, the legend is missing here, but the CNO injected uh, is in blue and the uh, saline injected is in red. So we see this uh, increase in the saline injected, which is uh, which is the control, and the CNO injected. You see this difference in the uh, Z score, and so this is not as uh, uh, dramatic as the hypoxic, but we do see a difference uh, as the trials progress. All right, so to summarize, I've shown you that um, our technique, we can measure the Purkinje cell dynamics during locomotor learning. Um, hypoxic animals have altered Purkinje cell function during associative learning. Um, and that if you silence the Purkinje cells during development using chemogenetics, uh, you get this long-term alteration in the function uh, and Purkinje cell function during motor learning. Um, and so to conclude, hypoxia or neonatal brain injury causes uh, significant motor malperformance and adaptive deficits due to underlying Purkinje cell pathophysiology. Um, and this activity during development, uh, uh, which we silence, uh, is actually critical to ensure long-term functional activity in the context of locomotor learning. Uh, so uh, currently what we're trying to do is to identify the mole molecular mechanisms of this, uh, of this uh, deficit in the cerebral cortic uh, uh, cortical circuitry, both intrinsic mechanisms as well as uh, circuit dependent mechanisms. So with that, I'd like to thank um, everyone in the, uh, in, uh, the Gallo Lab, uh, funding from NIH, uh, Behavior Course, and other labs which have contrib contributed to this work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, it was great. Uh, we're waiting for questions, attendees and panelists. You're more than welcome to ask questions. Let me ask you about some technical question about this bonsai uh, behavioral mm -hmm. um, technique. Is it is it different from what is usually done from the standard um, behavioral technique? Yes. So uh, so using bonsai, what we were able to do, um, I can go back uh, to that particular side. Um, yeah. So the uh, Rasmus ladder itself is a proprietary uh, behavioral apparatus. And so we don't, you know, we, we're not able to manipulate the, um, uh, we're not able to directly manipulate the, the uh, Rasmus ladder. So we had to come up with a way by which we can integrate the uh, Rasmus ladder to our fiber photometry. And so uh, this is a very nice uh, tool, Bonsai, which was developed by, uh, in, uh, um, uh, by Goncalo Lopez in Spain. Um, and yeah, it's a really nice neurobehavioral tool, uh, visual programming platform that you can use to uh, merge, you know, different streams of data, different streams of behavioral data. So this was like a really nice tool we used. Uh, and you got good results. Okay, thank you. Uh, one question from Andy here. What happens to, and Andy, do you, do you want to ask it yourself or do you prefer me to read it? Uh, sure, yeah. So I was just thinking, maybe I missed it. So what happens to the other cell types of the cerebellum during hypoxia? Are stellar that's a, that's a, cells that's a good, and the granule cells in any way affected? Yes, so that's a great question. Uh, so the, some of the data I didn't show, show to here, but um, we have shown in a previous paper um, that, so over here you can see, uh, this, is, this is from human data, but we do see a reduction in the granule cell layer in the, uh, in the hypoxic, in the uh, animal model, as well as in the humans. Uh, so there's a difference in the external granule layer and the internal granule layer. Um, we haven't, uh, uh, there's uh, another, um, there's a, a MD, PhD uh, doc, a physician scientist, Panos Kratimenos, who's actually looking at this to see uh, if there's um, uh, cellular changes in the granule cells and how that affects uh, protein cell activity. Um, so that's another part of the work that we are pursuing. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so we can end here. Thank you again very much for all the three uh, speakers. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for the, thank the attendees for participating and uh, see you later. Good luck everyone. Thank you.
it's my pleasure to be hosting this session along with Elisabetta, our backend. Uh, my name is Maria, I'm postdoc in EPFL Switzerland, and today we have three exciting talks. One talk, 12 minutes, following, uh, followed by three minutes QA session. Please ask your questions in the QA, just here in Zoom. Uh, our speakers are thirsty for your questions. So without any further ado, we start with Brandon uh, Kai. Close uh, enough. <laughs> <laughs> a PhD candidate working uh, with uh, Gunnar Holm at Queen's University. And uh, you can talk to, to him via Twitter. You will find the link for his Twitter in chat. And also, we're looking forward to hear from you. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, like I said, my name is Brandon. I work with uh, Dr. Gunnar Blom as well as uh, Dr. Arlen Khan. Uh, thanks for very much for the opportunity. Okay, so I'll jump right in. Uh, so one of the questions we often deal with uh, explicitly or implicitly in neuroscience is how we combine expectations with sensory information. And we have different models for different levels of abstraction. So the Bayesian school of thought simply says that expectations are combined with sensory information in some sensible way based on some costs and benefits. So the question today I'll ask is, can we map these more macroscopic computations to the algorithms we use to talk about choice dynamics that occur within trials? So bounded integration models and all their variants are popular to describe choice dynamics because they explain a few simple truths about the statistical properties of the time it takes to initiate a behavior based on some external evidence. So when you take a distribution of choice to a common stimulus, the time it takes to decide will typically have a stereotyped long tail. And this is explained by saying that there's basically a starting point either it's either fixed or distributed and that information is accumulated on and variability in the accumulation period causes greater variance at short rather than long crossing times. So we can fit distributions of reaction times and choice probabilities to this sort of data. But the question also is what do they tell us about the computation? There's been some effort to parameterize these models in terms of Bayesian computation, where some will say that the baseline represents like a prior or an expectation, but others then found that choice history is represented statistically in the integration process or both. In some corners, it almost gets to the point where these parameters almost become like new psychological constructs where we try to map computational elements. Uh, but this starts with the assumption that the starting points, the baseline in space and time are statistically independent. So basically when integration starts and at what bias it starts at. But since predicting the timing of a future choice is as important as predicting what it will be in the future for behavior, priors may have within and across trial dynamics. So today I'll be basically saying that viewing baseline information in these bounded integration models as its own predictive dynamic, we can better understand choice timing and hopefully clarify some discrepancies between the mapping of Bayesian computations to these more algorithmic models. So to start, we'll try and understand how prior expectations with change within and across simple choices. So basically we use this free choice task, two alternatives, very simple. Basically, one, two targets appear, one in each visual hemifield, and the task is to direct an eye movement to either or without anticipating. So the targets appear randomized between 750 and 1250 milliseconds, and the targets appear at different times relative to each other. So on a given trial, they may appear synchronously or asynchronously, where one appears well before the other. So both the sensory evidence, so the asynchrony, and the delay period when they appear relative to the trial is randomized. So there's no like past specific advantage to choice history effects. But of course, in random statistics, as we'll see, there is often the illusion of structure. So when you look at the average behavior, you basically get a classic psychometric function. All this, all this curve here essentially shows is that on the x-axis, you have target onset asynchrony when the targets come up relative to each other. And on the y-axis, you have proportion of right choices. Basically, all this says here is that when targets come up very close in time together, people's choices are more probabilistic. Whereas when targets come up well before the other, you're more likely to direct the targets. And of course, we average all this behavior together and it, this more or less holds at both the within and across subject level. But of course, each one of these choices has its own unique, never to be exactly repeated history. So here I just plot like a tree of repetitions and alternations to help you get an intuition for this. But each choice, of course, has its own timing based on the delay period, directional history, sequence history, and 
basically every time you take one of these choices, all future choices are conditioned upon it. So what happens when we start breaking down these choice history effects based on like repeatable sequences, like successive repetitions? So when we look at the psychometric curves, essentially what we see, and here I'm plotting repetition one. So basically you repeat a choice once, twice, three times, four times, five times. Essentially what you see in, in the psychometric curves is that you have this flattening of the psychometric curve relative to the sensory evidence. So as people repeat their choices more and more and more, their choices are less weighted by the sensory evidence and become more and more flat with respect to the asynchrony. Now, all of these choices I've taken so that it's they're just when they've been made after the target has actually appeared. And we tell people not to anticipate, but when you look at the reaction times and you include all the anticipatory choices where people um, essentially errantly made a saccade beforehand, you see that in the reaction time distributions condition on the sequence that there's this graded effect where people are getting faster and faster when they repeat, 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 repeat. Uh, but it's bleeding over from the early sensory period into that anticipatory period. And you have, so you basically have this smooth effect centered around the target onset. And we see this same effect more or less in the alternations as well. It's less as you would expect. And we see a similar effect when we break it up based on the delay period. So when the targets just appear early versus when they appear late, we have this similar effect. So essentially what we're seeing is that the choice timing and the choice sequence seem to have this sort of shared variability that bleeds into the anticipatory trial period. Um, so to prove more that this choice timing and the sequence are not independent, essentially what I did here is I took all the repetition reaction time distributions and I split them based on whether they were in the early or late delay period, just essentially a median split. Uh, so basically what we see here is that when you look at the repetition one, you already have this divergence between whether the delay period was early and late, but you can see both just by looking at the distributions as well as looking at the uh, cumulative divergence, which we put on the color plot here, that this effect, like it's changed between the early and the late distributions, it increases as we condition it based on repetition one, two, three, four, and five. We see the same thing with alternations as well. So essentially, the, the take home here is that the timing of the delay period relative to the choice sequence, they're not independent quantities. So this bleed over between the anticipatory period and the sort of sensory integration post-stimulus period, they're not independent. So how can we resolve that within these bounded integration models? So the first thing we have to account for is this relative effect of early reaction times in this distribution. And essentially, a nice result from um, Okiyuki Saka in 2006 showed that uh, if you allow variability in the starting point um, in a very, very simple, just ballistic linear accumulator, then essentially what you get is this preferential change in the early part of the distribution. This is simply because in the bound integration models, you start if you have fixed starting points, you allow variability to accumulate over time, so you get that longer tail. But if you allow variability to change, then you start to account for the earlier part of the distribution. You see that in the bottom where we fix the prior, and you get this relative effect on the later half of the distribution, whereas if you fix the sensory parameters and allow the prior to broaden, then you get changes to the early part of the distribution. So we can account in this way for some of the early responses, but this doesn't tell us anything about the anticipatory period or essentially what causes that prior. How does this prior even form in the first place? Uh, so what we did is we said, instead of just treating this prior as like this fixed distribution that occurs within a trial, we asked, is it actually a dynamic process, something that is evolving throughout the trial period and across trial periods? So we modeled that as a north side Nuenbeck process, essentially, an OU process, uh, as I'll call it from now on, all it says is that we have a certain starting point and the process stochastically arises to a steady state, a steady mean, with some variability and some approach. So on the top left, we'd have one example. And in the B panel here, you see the effect of changing the rate, so how fast it gets that steady mean. In the lower left down to C, you see what would happen if you change the mean steady state without changing anything else. And in the D panel, you see the ch relative change of variance. So how or how variable this approach is to the steady state. 
But what we're using this process to describe is how within a trial, how do we get to that prior distribution? And basically the way we model this is we say that the OEU process sets like a dynamic trajectory for the baseline within a trial. And it can either cross its own threshold triggering an anticipatory choice or set the baseline prior distribution for linear integration if a target appears. And in doing so, we have set a dynamic where many possible integration distributions can result from the very same sensory evidence, depending on the timing of the true stimulus relative to how we've set the predicted timing with our prior. Um, and in the after crit critic framework, these parameters will be updated across trials according to some policy. And we can actually fit the data to the entire reaction, reaction time distributions pre and post stimulus, where the OU process causes anticipatory choices and it sets the baseline for the linear integration if an anticipatory choice is not triggered. And sort of cut to the chase to in interest of time is that to fit these models to the data by sequence, we require flexibility in both how the OU process changes and how the integration parameters are set. So in doing so, we arrive at a bit more of a holistic view of the behavior within a trial, where both the pre-stimulus anticipation and the post-stimulus sensory parameters are history dependent and update across trials. So in conclusion, choice timing and sequence, they share a common history dependence. And the pre-stimulus inf information seems to cause anticipatory choice while also parameterizing future sensory response. So we explain this by basically saying that the pr predicting the timing of sensory integration accounts for anticipatory and sensory driven choice as a result of a common expectation of when people think they will make a choice in the future. And of course, this model requires flexibility in both pre and post stimulus parameters to fit the sequence data. So when we're considering bound integration, we may consider these sort of pre and post stimulus baseline sensory parameters as descriptive of two states of choice dynamics ordered in time relative to the stimulus, rather than some sort of computational dichotomy of expectation and sensory processing in the Bayesian framework. So thank you to my lab, that's all. And great, thank you. It's an amazing talk. And I guess you're ready for questions. Sure. Yeah, of course. Are there any questions ready for you? I don't know. I don't know. Hey, crowd, you, you can be. Don't, shy, don't be so shy. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I will have a question, uh, maybe one. So, what do you think will be the best exper experimental paradigm to support your observations, your conclusions? Well, I guess that would depend on at what level you want to predict or understand, right? So this 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 paradigm that we use originally came from a neurostimulation data set, and we we're trying to understand essentially how um, transcranial direct current stimulation affected the parameters of expectation versus sensory processing in this period. And by actually um, actually trying to understand that, we sort of came to the conclusion. Um, that these models perhaps weren't flexible enough for us to be able to predict the neurophysiological data that we have, yeah. right? Um, so, I th but in in terms of making predictions about the like the across trial things, I think it's fairly important to make like explicit assumptions about the statistics of both the timing and the um, both the timing and the features of choice data um, so that you can you can sort of model these as a common process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for this wonderful talk. And I think we have to move forward because of the timing. But if uh, you, dear audience, have more questions, you can post them in the QA or reach Brandon in the uh, via Twitter. He's a Twitter account. You can find it in the chat. And we'll, we go ahead and we'll go with Harrison Reitz. Harrison, are you here? Great. So Harrison is a, a PhD student uh, from Amita Shivan and uh, Michael Frank Laboratory at Brown University. Please also contact him via Twitter if you have any questions. And uh, in chat, you will find link to his uh, recent research. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Great. 
Uh, thanks so much for having me here. I'm going to be presenting a little bit of stuff that I've been working on in, over the last uh, six months. And so this is still pretty preliminary work, but I'd love to, to get your feedback, think what you, uh, hear what you guys have to think about it. All right. So there's a long history in, in neuroeconomics of thinking about how we make decisions between uh, appetitive and aversive options. And often these are studied as discrete choices, as different bundles of options paired together. And there's been this you know, long kind of uh, history of building formal frameworks for understanding how we kind of optimally make these choices between things we want to approach and things we want to avoid. However, when we make choices in the real world, it's much, uh, not, it often is the case that we're not making choices between discrete alternatives, but we're making choices in a continuous dynamic world. And it's not just that we're choosing between A and B, but we're trying to decide how are we gonna navigate our world in order to get what we want and, and avoid what we, what we fear. And there's a long history of thinking about this in terms of the different forces that act upon us. This idea from chemistry that there's a valence that attracts us towards things that we want, that we desire and repel, repels us away from things that we avoid. And while this has been kind of an interesting kind of qualitative framework, there's been less done on the actual kind of formal models about how we might uh, navigate our environments to maximize our reward. And the kind of approach that we're interested in taking is kind of the analogous approach to microeconomics in a kind of uh, continuous in, in state spaces that are continuous in both space and time. Um, in the discrete state, there would be something like model-based reinforcement learning. In the continuous state, we're gonna use uh, optimal feedback control in order to understand how do animals pursue reward and avoid threat when they're in dynamic environments. And so the task we're gonna be studying is called uh, the predator-prey task. And in this task, the, uh, a monkey controlled a joystick in order to move an avatar around the screen. screen chasing a prey and avoiding a predator. If they caught the prey, they would get some juice reward. And if they were caught by the predator, they had to face a timeout and, and they don't like that. So let me show you what an example trial looks like. Here we can watch how the agent moves around the screen. Hope this is showing up okay for you guys. In that case, the uh, agent caught the prey. Here's another example where the guy actually got caught by the predator. And here we can really highlight that these behaviors are dynamic and naturalistic and, uh, and, and quite rich. All right, so how are we gonna try to understand this behavior? The model we're gonna use is we're going to you know, ruthlessly steal from motor control and take standard models of, of optimal control from the motor domain called the linear quadratic regulator. And uh, this algorithm in short uh, defines how you can plan your actions in order to aim close towards uh, an approach goal and which we've modified in this experiment such that when you get too close to a predator, you're gonna to start to want to approach safety. You're gonna to start to want to flee away from the predator. Now, I wanna note that this algorithm isn't just uh, kind of blindly moving towards what it wants. It's a model-based control algorithm. And so it's gonna be planning how are the actions that I take now going to influence um, how close I am to the predator and prey in the future. And it's actually a Bellman optimal um, algorithm. All right. So here we can look at how this algorithm operates in simulation. So here's a kind of simple setup. We've got an agent and they're just gonna be trying to move towards a static prey and avoiding the predator along the way. And here's the trajectory that they take. I want you to notice that the algorithm learns or plans to, to lure the predator away from where it wants to go and then back down to the prey. And this really highlights the model-based nature of this algorithm. And just to, to demonstrate that, let's look at the reward function that this algorithm has while it's making this, doing this action. What we can see is that early on, the animal for, or the agent, I should say, foregoes going down the steepest part of the gradient directly towards the goal, and instead moves kind of tangential to the gradient along the kind of isoline, you know, paying, you know, missing out on rewards early on, but doing better later in the trial when it's not quite so close to the predator. All right. So it seemed to, uh, to me from this that these kind of offer like a plausible explanation for the kind of rich behaviors that we see. And so we decided to try and, and test whether or not our model can, you know, usefully explain the monkey's behavior in the predator prey task. And to do that, we used an uh, 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 approach that's called inverse optimal control. So here on a given trial, 
we can, you know, we've recorded the policy that the monkey took, the kind of trajectory it moved through the state space. Now, what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and find the parameterization of the optimal LQR policy that was as similar as possible to the, to the policy that the monkey actually took. It's going to enact as closely as possible under certain parameterization of this LQR model. And our kind of inferential goal is what, what is that parameterization that gives us the best prediction possible. Well, it's going to be mostly made up of two terms. The first is a forward model. What do I think the dynamics of my environment are? How do I think the predator and prey are going to move? That I gotta say, we just, so far we've just fixed. We've just assumed that the monkey's kind of naively extrapolating the current velocity of the predator and prey and using that to plan its actions. But we could add more rich forward dynamics if we wanted. Where we've made, played a little more focus is, to in, in, is in the reward function. How close does the agent, uh, does the monkey want to get to the prey and how far does it wanna stay away from the predator? And we're gonna fit the parameterization of these reward functions, some value on being close to prey and some value on being far from predator. And that's gonna be how we're gonna fit this model. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna predict the joystick movement at every time, at every like frame, at every time point within a trial, um, conditioned on the state that the monkey was actually in. So this is gonna be a, a one step look ahead kind of fit. And that's kind of a, an area for future direction as well. Anyways, we're going to fit parameters to, to each trial, and then we're going to use hierarchical EM to regularize our parameters across trial within a monkey. So let's see how we do. Here's an example trial, and I've plotted out here the trajectory that the monkey and the model take within this trial. And we can see there's a pretty good correspondence between the dynamics of the, of the monkey and the dynamics of the model under this trial. Here, just for illustration, we can plot the reward function that we've estimated for this trial. And you can see that there's some density here where the monkey wants to get close to the prey. And we've inferred that this ridge here suggests that the monkey wants to avoid the predator. Well, that was a cherry picked example. Let's look at how we kind of do on average. We see that across trials within our, our sample that we fit, we capture most of the variance in uh, in how the monkey takes its actions when it's playing this game. Also notably, we see that our model does better than an, uh, a phase scrambled version of the model's trajectories, which provides an autocorrelation control. We're not just capturing the kind of smoothness of the data. Um, but we're also fitting parameters to each trial. And so we can take you know, the parameters that we fit on those 500 trials and look at the other 10,000 trials that the monkey did. And we see that out of sample, we're still capturing most of the variance in the actions that the monkey's taking. Although I'll remind you that this is again, a one step look ahead fit. So conditioned on the state that the, uh, that the monkey was actually in, how well can we predict the action that they're going to take? Uh, so far we've compared this to I think the most sensible kind of model free control where we actually estimate the control gain itself uh, with free parameters. And we find that our model based algorithm performs strictly better out of sample than this kind of model free uh, actual estimation of the of the control gain policy itself. And so that gives us some hope that it's not just kind of this trivial anything that tracked the anything that tracked the prey would do equally well. But that's definitely uh, something that we're looking for in the future. All right. So our model is inferring the monkey's valuation of the predator and prey and saying that they're taking the optimal policy under this kind of valuation scheme. So let's think about um, how we can kind of ground the values that we estimate. One thing that I didn't mention earlier was that uh, across trials, if you caught the prey, you would get different amounts of juice. And if the predator got you, you would get different amounts of timeout. And this was cued with a color and so the monkey knew this. Although I'll note, we should be a little hesitant because this was also paired with the speeds at which the predator and prey moved. And what we find is that um, that the values that we fit for trials correlated with the amount of juice that was at stake. In the appetitive domain and in the aversive domain, we see that the size of the safety margin, how, at what, how close to the predator until I start to really worry about it, the size of the safety margin also uh, corresponded to the stakes for if the predator catches me. And so this kind of suggests to us that um, the values that we're estimating are kind of grounded in the actual uh, stakes of the test. And I'll note that when we fit the model free algorithm, we actually don't get this kind of correspondence in, the, in, that, uh, in that setup. All right, so in summary, 
you know, decision making is continuous and dynamic in a lot of the cases in which uh, humans and especially animals encounter it. And so the kind of tasks we use to measure decision making should be continuous dynamic and the algorithms that we use to understand how people make these choices should be similarly as well. We found as a particular algorithm, a standard algorithm from uh, motor control does a good job capturing within trial dynamics in this task and the, and the parameters that we estimate, the values that we infer seem to do a good job capturing or at least capture some of the variability across trials and the stakes of the game. All right, the future directions for this is still pretty preliminary, but to the future, we're interested in using LQR as a process model for the kinds of task representations that uh, we find in anterior cingulate cortex in this particular task. And in particular, they find that uh, there's coarsely tuned place cells in dorsal anterior cingulate that seem to track the kind of putative location of the prey while you're, while you're tracking it. In addition, I'll notice that I'll note that uh, and there's a wide variety of dynamic parameters that seem to be represented in the neurons in this area. And this is the kind of information you'd want to see uh, for a, a region that's potentially regulating control towards this kind of approach avoid uh, pursuit. Finally, I, I would say kind of in general, optimal feedback control offers a, a, a normative but feasible uh, baseline at which to compare different models of goal pursuit, often kind of falsifiable predictions about the kind of dynamics we ought to see and the kinds of representations that ought to be present in regions involved in, 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 in this kind of control. So uh, thank you to my lab and our uh, collaborators. And I welcome any questions that you guys have. Thank you very much, awesome. And we have one question. Uh, question from Adrian. Question about quadratic uh, costs. Is that a reasonable assumption? Also, how can that even uh, work in practice? Wouldn't a quadratic cost for the predator and for the prey just sum to a quadratic cost centered elsewhere? Yes, that's a great question. The first is um, the format of the cost functions up to the organism. And so I don't think there's too much a priori that says that we ought not to have a quadratic cost. Um, and one of the powerful pieces of this algorithm is that if you do assume a quadratic cost, that it makes this kind of, of rather complicated model-based planning uh, tractable. And in fact, it gives you oftentimes analytic solutions for the optimal model-based policy, which is a really powerful thing that any organism might want to have in order to feasibly uh, track goals. Now, in terms of the additivity, you've kind of touched on uh, like a, a detail that I think is really important for this is that it's not a quadratic cost on the predator is that the model that we have is that when you uh, get too close to the predator, you're going to have a quadratic cost that's going to be away from the predator towards some kind of safety margin, which we've just defined as a, as a radius, uh, some distance away from the predator. Um, and so it's going to, so on the first hand, it's not just these, uh, we're not just adding these two different quadratics together. And on the second hand, it might also matter a little bit depending on the differences in the dynamics between the predator and prey, even if it was the case that I had a quadratic goal on both. Okay, great. And uh, if you have more questions, please uh, reach Harrison in Twitter. While we are moving to the last speaker of our session, Cecilia de Vicaris, who is a PhD student in the University of Genoa. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing from her. Hi, Cecilia. Hi. Your screen, Sorry, one second. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, thank you for the presentation. So let's start by defining what is a joint action. Well, we refer to joint action as any form of interaction where two or more agents coordinate their action to produce a change in the external world. We can classify different types of interaction depending on the physical connection and on the um, task type. Uh, it is very important to investigate uh, joint action as we are constantly involved in uh, um, interaction during our daily life. 
we addressed, um, sorry, one second. Okay, we addressed uh, uh, joint action by considering uh, uh, a sensory motor interactive task uh, where haptic force uh, constitutes uh, a um, communication channel. Um, in this task, players were required to perform arm reaching movements between a starting point and a target by crossing a via point. Uh, two players, uh, are, the two players uh, are uh, mechanically connected through a virtual spring and uh, cannot speak or talk to each other. Uh, further, they share the same starting point and the target, but uh, uh, have different via point. And this is very important because it means that we are uh, addressing a situation in which players have uh, different sub goals and uh, need to negotiate a um, joint strategy. And this is relevant to understand the mechanism underlying, for example, neurorehabilitation. Uh, further, in this task, we are able to uh, manipulate the information about uh, the partner. Um, sorry. Okay, in the previous uh, work, uh, it has been found that increasing the amount of information about the partner, um, we um, people tend to uh, converge to a stable strategy faster and uh, to develop a collaboration. So at this point, the question is about uh, the mechanism which allow the achievement of, of uh, such collaboration. The optimality principle is widely recognized in motor control where the uh, optimal control uh, and the optimal state estimation are the key components. Optimal control refers to the uh, action to the uh, action generation uh, process uh, where movement uh, are chosen um, in order to minimize uh, a um, cost function, which represents the trade-off between performances and effort. Uh, and while um, optimal sensory state estimation uh, refers to the optimality, uh, which underlines the perception, which combines the, all the available information to um, predict the future uh, state of the system. So this concept in joint action need to be extended. Uh, in particular, uh, the state estimation uh, process needs to account for a partner. Uh, indeed, while interacting, we not only need to build an internal representation of our, of our body and of the environment and to understand the relationship between this representation, between these two systems, but also we need to understand the partner and incorporate uh, such partner model in order to choose the best um, behavior. Indeed, um, in joint action, uh, in order to achieve a joint coordination, uh, we need to negotiate a joint strategy. Um, game theory has been used and proposed to extend optimal control uh, to multi-agent scenarios. Uh, indeed, a game is a situation in which uh, two or more individuals uh, whose interests are neither completely or opposed and neither um, completely um, coincident. So uh, consider this definition of game, we uh, can model our task as uh, a game. Um, in the previous work, it has been found that with little information, a uh, player perceives the partner as a source of noise, adopting a no partner strategy. While uh, increasing the amount of information, uh, players tend to keep into account the partner and uh, um, the partner action in particular and uh, converge to an Nash equilibrium, uh, in which is a situation in which uh, uh, none of the player can improve by acting alone. Um, the learning of this uh, uh, collaboration of this strategy is achieved again uh, with the, is described in terms of uh, game theory using the fictitious play rule where players uh, in repeated the trial refine their partner model and choose on this basis their um, best action, optimal action. In this framework, it is interesting to um, an interesting aspect of action is the sense of agency, uh, which is the which is little investigated in joint action, and uh, it is uh, the subjective feeling of being in control of our own action and through them of uh, the events in the external world. 
um, the, co the um, comparator model has been used to explain uh, the retrospective, compo retrospective component of agency as, uh, uh, and it described this component as emerging from the matching of the sensory um, prediction with the observation, um, where the sensory prediction are made at the level of the state observer. Um, therefore, the predictive capabilities of our uh, sensory motor system are uh, play a crucial role in um, developing uh, this uh, sense of agency, this uh, sense of control. Uh, further, a prospective uh, component of agency has been proposed uh, as based uh, on goals and task information uh, that are available before the action takes place. Uh, and um, this component has been proposed to anticipate the action itself. Extend this, uh, extending this definition um, of self-agency, uh, joint agency can be regarded as the uh, subjective experience of acting as a group. And uh, the relationship between uh, self and joint agency uh, is an open issue. Uh, while some authors sustain that uh, joint agency emerges uh, disrupting uh, the individual agency, there are evidences from cognitive sciences um, that describe the two uh, experiences and the two feelings uh, as independent. In this framework, uh, we developed a computational model for self-agency that attempt to integrate uh, uh, all the previous uh, theoretical account uh, and findings about agency. Uh, agency develops within the motor control system. Uh, it emerges before the action takes place uh, and evolves uh, within, while the action is occurring. Um, it also depends on the mismatch, on the match of, of the sensory prediction and the observation, and, uh, uh, but also on the accuracy of the sensory information. Therefore, agency is the, can be described in terms of in probabilistic terms uh, as the posterior prob probability of being in control of an action, uh, where the uh, prior probability represented the prospective component of agency, while the likelihood represented the retrospective component of agency. Uh, considering uh, the optimality principle extended to joint action uh, with uh, the integration of the partner model uh, and considering that the self and joint agency can be um, addressed uh, separately, uh, we propose a modular architecture which incorporates uh, uh, two separate observer controller uh, loops. One accounting for the individual configuration and uh, the other for the joint configuration. Uh, which include uh, indeed the partner model, so the, uh, the knowledge about the partner. Um, therefore, the two feelings uh, are assessed continuously at each time instant separately and uh, provide also a, a weighting factor uh, for the motor uh, command that are generated by the respective uh, controller. This means that agency not only is a feeling, but also uh, determine the motor command to be issued. Um, simulating the results, simulating the experiment uh, that I described before, uh, uh, the results uh, reflect the experimental protocol. Indeed, uh, during the unconnected phase, uh, the agency is the, the determined by the prior, while during the connected phase uh, of the experiment, both self and joint um, likelihood increase. But uh, uh, increasing the amount of information, uh, these two quantities are uh, uh, more discriminable, meaning that the difference between self and joint agency and joint likelihood uh, are, uh, um, is uh, bigger. Um, therefore, increasing the partner predictability, uh, joint agency increases with respect to the self agency and also uh, stabilizes stabilize the uh, adopted strategy. Uh, further, considering the instantaneous uh, likelihood within a single connected trial, uh, we observed that uh, joint likelihood varies little uh, throughout uh, a trial and it increases uh, with uh, the, uh, as the information about the partner are more uh, reliable. Um, in contrast, uh, self-agency, uh, self-likelihood uh, is uh, always smaller and uh, changes uh, within a trial. 
uh, this uh, difference between self and joint likelihoods uh, reflect the importance may reflect the importance of uh, the partner when uh, um, estimating the uh, dyad dynamic. Uh, this predicts that uh, when more information is available, we shift from a, a shared um, joint agency where self agency is still uh, is still strong to a uh, we agency where the self agency is disrupted. In conclusion, uh, we developed a predictive model of interaction where sense of self and joint agency depend on uh, separated uh, parallel processes, which uh, constantly evaluate the assumption underlying each uh, um, observer controller loop. Sense of joint agency depends on the availability of information about the partner, so it depends on the predictability of the partner. Finally, sense of agency gates each control signal, providing the basis of, for uh, optimal action selection during the interaction. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Cecilia, for your talk. And we are waiting for questions from the attendees or maybe panelists. Let's give it a second. And while they're thinking about their questions, uh, I can ask you one. So. Mm -hmm. um, is there any cooperation uh, between the agents in the in the setup that you, that you use, and how would it differ than the cooperation and the this the partnership that you were talking about? Can you repeat the question? So, Sorry. if there would be cooperation, there is a cooperation as the um, information about the partner increase and is more reliable. While uh, if uh, we only have apt communication with the partner, so we only uh, exchange forces, we, mm -hmm. we tend to behave as uh, if uh, the partner is an additional source of noise. So okay. behave more uh, in an individualistic uh, way. OK, thank you. Thanks. Um, I have a question. That's good. Mm -hmm. I asked uh, Harrison more or less the same question, but uh, I'm curious if you've thought about any um, extensions towards cases where there is more than just like one partner, for example, um, and if like different like sort of like control strategies or things like this emerge when you don't just have like two exchanges of information, but where you have like multiple distributed uh, exchanges of information, if there would be, if it generalizes or not. Yes, I... Never thought about that, but uh, it could be super interesting to also assess experimentally with uh, multiple uh, manipulandum. Maybe having mm -hmm. depends uh, again on the availability of information, and uh, I think that increasing the number of uh, agents involved in the interaction is uh, it can be harder to achieve a collaboration. I think. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. So we are just right on time to finish the session. I want to thank all the speakers. It was okay. But we have one, one question that we can squeeze in that came in the chat. If you have just one minute, okay. Has anybody done similar studies where one of two people has a neurological injury? It's a question from uh, Thandrau. Okay, yes. Uh, I, uh, the sense of agency is... Uh, primarily been uh, assessed, uh, for example, in a schizophrenic uh, patient. So it would be super interesting also to do some clinical trials uh, and understand, uh, for example, in this patient, uh, what about, what is the sense of agency in this kind of task? Yeah, so there are some work from uh, Fritz uh, and uh, Blakemore, I think. Awesome. So thank you all. I think uh, I would like to thank attendees also and uh, speakers. You're all awesome. It was a very interesting session. Learned a lot. And just good luck with your future studies and hope to see you around. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks a lot. See you later. Bye bye.
All right, welcome back to the Neuromatch Conference. Uh, I am pleased that you're here and excited for this next talk. Um, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Manish Sahani. Many of you know Manish, but um, for those of you that don't, he is a professor of theoretical neuroscience and machine learning at the Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit of the University of College London. Um, I'm excited for his talk today, Chasing the Light, Mechanistically Informed Statistical Models of Dynamics. Manish, thank you for being here. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. And, and let me thank uh, all the people who put a lot of effort uh, into getting this meeting together. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be able to meet people virtually, if not in person, but in, in these <clears throat> straightened times, we, we take what we uh, are given. Uh, and I think it's really marvelous to have these opportunities. I'd like to start by um, thinking about the role of models and the types of models that we encounter in neuroscience. Uh, and this is actually something that when you are around theoreticians and modelers, you'll, you'll hear a lot about because uh, I think there's a lot of different roles that models play and lots of different types of models uh, and, and understanding how they interact becomes very important. One of the reasons that we have all these sorts of different models uh, is that we're seeking to describe the system at all sorts of different scales. Uh, all the way from the components of a cell, perhaps even molecules, uh, to the behavior of the whole organism. Um, and when we start to build models, um, we can build sort of models across perhaps the, the best models will link a few scales together. Uh, and often these have the flavor uh, of what you might think of as a classic scientific model. Um, that reductionist in some sense. They explain what's going on at one of these layers in terms of what we might know about the structure at a layer below. And I'm going to call these mechanistic models. Um, but because the system that we're looking at is an evolved one, it's been selected over millennia of evolution, we can also ask a different kind, look for a different kind of explanatory model, um, which says, how is it that the, or why is it rather, that the particular arrangement that we might see here has been selected amongst all the other possibilities that, that might have been around, right? And these are really questions about what function does, does this particular structure somewhere in our, our scale hierarchy serve for the organism as a whole? And so often we think of these as coming top down, or that I've called them normative here, we might think of them as computational models. Now, these are explanatory models. But of course, there's also a class of models in neuroscience and in, indeed all sciences, which are more descriptive. And I'm gonna call these phenomenological. Um, they seek to capture in a mathematical, mathematically concise way uh, as far as possible, uh, the function or the, uh, the behavior that we observe. And again, at all of these different scales of, of explanation. Okay, so uh, these I think become very important and they become important particularly when we're dealing with a system of the complexity and the sort of multi-scale nature of things like the brain. And that's because they're essential, first of all, to test the explanatory structures that we come up with. If, I, if I've made some predictions about what should happen at this population level um, on the basis of it, the uh, properties of individual neurons and the connections between them, um, I need to have measurements at the population level and I need to be able to work out since I won't know the properties of the specific neurons that I happen to have recorded from embedded in my network and indeed all the other neurons that I haven't recorded from that are affecting that activity. I have to find a way to characterize the population activity in order to, uh, that will make sense to relate to the prediction that the mechanistic model makes. And exactly the same thing is true at the normative level. The normative scale won't tell us things about specific neurons within the system. They'll tell us something about um, uh, typical structures or circuits that we might expect to see. Uh, and in order to test these, we need to capture in some sort of phenomenological description what we actually see in the data. Okay, so they can test, but of course we often look at phenomena for which we do not have an explanation. We don't have either a mechanistic or a normative account of them. Uh, and so in these cases, um, the phenomenology will inform hypotheses. They'll tell us what the targets are and they'll allow us to work out um, what needs to be emphasized in a mechanistic scheme or indeed uh, tell us something about what sorts of computation 
might be going on or give us guesses as to, uh, to um, the sort of underlying computational structure that the circuit implements. So my group has uh, actually going to first uh, mention uh, at the population scale, which I'm going to focus on here in the middle of the scale um, sequence. Um, we, of course, have models of all of these sorts. Uh, I'm not going to dwell very much on the normative ones today. Um, but I will think a little bit about mechanistic models. And, and here, you know, there, there are many such. Um, you know, some of them think about the, the activity um, that emerges from networks that consist of excitatory in red here and inhibitory in blue cells. Um, and a good example of this, for example, was the, the, the mean field work uh, of Hugh Wilson and Jack Cowan. Um, a more recent example might be that of Van Fajrick and Sompolinsky. Um, uh, the models, modeling that can be done at the, this mechanistic level uh, may be biophysically detailed. It might be a very de a, a large scale simulation uh, with much biophysical realism, or there might be an attempt to abstract, in, in, uh, for example, by mean field methods, away some, some sort of central um, statistical structure uh, that emerges from perhaps random connectivity in this network. Um, but in either case, the idea is to take this anatom anatomical observations about the circuit and see what sorts of constraints those might Im impose on activity. The phenomenological approach at this population scale tends to look at uh, uh, spike trains or, or similar, um, ideally single neuron uh, recordings, perhaps calcium trains, uh, calcium signals or something like that. Um, across a population of cells that are, are working together uh, in, a, in a recurrent circuit um, and try to, tries to achieve a similar low level or, or low dimensional uh, description of what's going on. And indeed, in some cases, in exactly the same sort of dynamical portrait sense um, that is a, uh, achieved in these um, uh, mechanistic mean field uh, uh, styles and indeed, uh, this, this particular picture uh, comes from a recent paper uh, from the group uh, 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 that appeared at Dicey Bell last year. Um, so these are those statistical models, right? They're, they're being shaped by recorded data, things like spike trains. Um, and they use those data to reveal the coordinated activity in population recordings um, in vivo um, and that are underlying some sort of computation. And the hope is that by either describing trajectories of in, in some low dimensional sense or dynamical portraits like this, we can get a handle on what kind of computation is being done. So as I said, my group has been uh, involved in this for quite a while. This is an extremely selective list of references of, of different methods, uh, selective in the sense that it, it I, I've listed things that, that we've worked on here, uh, but of course this, this is embedded within a space of, of many people in the field uh, who've been working on related and, and indeed quite different models uh, that try to, to live in the same space. I'm not gonna step through all of these in any detail, uh, but I do want to sort of separate out um, sort of two classes in a sense. Models that look for um, the underlying um, so sort of population structure just by driven by effectively variants, directions that capture as much of the uh, data in the population as possible. Um, one of these introduced in this paper in 2009, we called Gaussian process factor analysis, uh, but really there are a lot of variants at the simplest level. And in fact, we'll see some today. One could just be doing principal components analysis on the population data, just exactly the directions in the space that capture the most variants. Um, other variant, other versions of this might um, try to fit point process uh, models for the individual data. That's true of uh, this recent paper. Um, uh, might take into account jitter in time between trials um, or, or might try to capture variants under certain other statistical constraints. Uh, but these are all capturing variants. There's another class of models that is seeking to actually identify a dynamical structure in the data um, people sometimes call these state-space models. We often call them linear dynam or dynamical system models, linear or perhaps nonlinear. Um, and uh, in this case, 
the idea is that the the those dynamics are telling us something about the computational rules um, that underlie the way the circuit evolves. Uh, and it, perhaps it's worth highlighting this paper about to appear in, in Europe's um, um, by Virginia Rutten, um, uh, which um, actually uses GPFA-like approaches, so variance capturing approaches, to try to say something about um, a, dynamic, a more dynamical view of those data. So there's you know, ways to trade off between these. Okay. Um, so these are uh, models that are trying to find common structure or dynamical portraits, but they're doing so in from the data alone. And I think the question for today in a sense is, are there ways that we can take them, uh, take the mechanistic and computational constraints and use them to inform uh, the pictures that we get from the data while actually gaining ideally, um, there's a risk that we might lose it, but, but gain interpretability in the process. Okay, so that's what we're gonna dwell on. How do we take, in particular, in this case, mechanistic constraints and use them to inform the sorts of uh, uh, dynamical portraits that we might uh, try to build from data sets. And so I'm gonna tell you now about a particular approach uh, to doing this that uh, we've taken recently. Um, and we were led to this by looking at a particular data set uh, and, and a puzzle within that data set and trying to understand where the phenomenon that we were observing came from. Uh, and so I'm gonna start by actually making sure that I acknowledge all of the people involved and, and tell you where these data have come from. Uh, so you'll see the slide again at the end, but, but uh, I wanted to put it here too. So the data we're looking at uh, are going, uh, were collected by Dan O'Shea and Wera Kongu when they were graduate students at Stanford in Krishna Shinoi's lab. Um, and then more recently, uh, Leia Dunker, who's a graduate student with me, about to graduate in fact, uh, and Dan, who went on to become a postdoc uh, at Stanford, have been looking, have, um, analyzing the data, um, fitting the sorts of models that I'm going to describe here, and indeed trying to understand at a somewhat deeper theoretical level what's going on. Now, I'm not going to have time to go into the theory today. I'm going to focus more on the, on the, the um, statistical modeling part of this work. Um, uh, but, but, but really, I think this, there's, a, there's a story that is connecting um, things that we know about the, uh, the anatomy uh, to the data that I'm about to show you. And all of this is part of uh, a very long-standing collaboration between my group and Krishna Shinoi is a very rewarding uh, uh, collaboration over the years. Okay, so the experiment that um, Dan and Warapong were, were doing uh, involved uh, animals doing, um, a, at this point, quite very standard um, delayed reaching tasks. So uh, these are rhesus macaques that have been trained uh, to touch a central point on a screen and then later move to touch a point, um, uh, in this case, located on a ring around that original central point. Um, but there's a, um, they've been trained to withhold the movement when the target that they're about to touch first appears, wait for a while until the central point extinguishes, at which point they know to initiate the movement. So this introduces a delay between target onset and what we'll call the go queue. Um, and there's also, of course, uh, a, a little bit of a reaction time delay um, between when that go queue is actually delivered on the screen or, or when the point is removed from the screen uh, and when they move their arm. Okay, in this particular experiment, uh, Dan and Werapong had injected into the motor cortex uh, of, of two rhesus macaques, um, a viral construct that expressed an excitatory uh, uh, opsin uh, in uh, pyramidal cells in the area. So this was the construct. Um, they had a number of injection sites, uh, quite broadly in one of the monkeys and a more narrow region in the others. Uh, that's the kind of green circles here. And then they were able to stimulate using a fiber and record in a region around that fiber um, uh, as, as they stimulated. Uh, and the stimulation, the laser delivery, um, could occur either during this delay period, which we'll refer to as delay early, around the time that the go queue was delivered, there we go, or around the time that the movement was, or, or during the movement, which we'll call peri-move. 
Okay, now um, the first thing to check is there, uh, that the, you know, the experiment worked, the virus expressed, and the channel reduction or the uh, opsin worked, as did C1V1. Um, and indeed it did. So if they, uh, as I said, they were recording at the same time as stimulating, and as, uh, some of the recordings were done right uh, next to the fiber uh, with a, a, a kind of complex uh, optrode, uh, and some of them were some distance away. And you can see that, that this is the difference in firing with, by stimulation or not as a function of distance. And so you can see that there are really appreciable changes in firing all the way out to at least two millime millimeters from the fiber. Uh, and there are some neurons that have sustained changes in firing uh, all the way out to, um, uh, all the way out to four millimeters. Um, and so there really is a, a, a very substantial impact of the, uh, of the light in this area. And I'm emphasizing that because the first part of the puzzle, not the part that we're really going to dwell on today, was that despite this fact, there was very little effect on the ongoing behavior. So neurons changed their firing, but there was no movement evoked when the laser turned on, for example, in this period when the animal was holding its arm still. Um, there was no effect on the trajectory or, or speed or anything else of the, of the movement so no effect on the kinematics and movement. There was a small delay in the initiation of the movement when the light was delivered around the time of the goku, um, but it's much shorter at about 10 milliseconds than the duration of the, of the laser, laser pulse itself, which was 200 milliseconds. But as I said, that's not what we're really going to be focusing on, at least directly. We're gonna be looking at the neural data. Uh, and, and looking at another puzzle that comes out of that. Um, and that's the following. So here what I've drawn is the um, a time series of activity uh, of the population of neurons that were recorded. Um, and I've drawn them in uh, projected onto three dimensions, which capture the most variance, the principal component dimensions. Okay, so this is the leading principal component of the, ver so it's the direction that captures the most variance across different uh, targets for the reach, so different conditions, uh, and across time. Um, and so each one of these traces is a, uh, the projected set of all the neuronal PSTHs into that first principal component. Uh, and the color tells you what the reaching, what the target of the reach was. So there's four different reach targets here. This is in PC1, PC2, and PC3. And here are the timing of the events, the go queue and movement onset. Okay, so, so these are the sorts of uh, population trajectories that we often see when uh, recorded motor cortex. Uh, now let's ask what happens in the trials, and sorry, I didn't emphasize this. These are trials where there was no optogenetic stimulation. These, this is just the baseline activity. What happens when there is stimulation? So again, here are the three phases when stimulation might be delivered um, relative uh, to the go queue and movement onset. Uh, and we're going to first look at this first principal component. Before the stimulation is presented, things look much the same, that's reassuring. Um, at the time that the, that the laser's turned on, there's a very large perturbation. Now you already saw on the large, last slide that neurons change their firing quite a lot. But what you didn't know is that that change in firing is at least partly aligned with the same direction as carries variants during the trial when it's not perturbed which is what uh, it's a, the unperturbed trials that defined that principal component one. So there is a big perturbation in this principal component direction. Um, during the stimulus, uh, or while, while the laser's on, um, the perturbation is sustained, maybe decays a little bit. We'll see that again uh, shortly. But um, the underlying sort of dynamical process of the trial had it not been perturbed, so this deflection here and this return here, also do seem to be preserved underneath that, uh, that uh, stimulus perturbation. Once the laser turns off, the uh, uh, activity returns extremely rapidly. This is one time step at the moment uh, towards the point at which it would have been had the, uh, in an unperturbed trial. And indeed, it returns and follows exactly the same dynamical pattern to within noise uh, as it would have had there been no optogenetic perturbation at all. And that's true across the principal components. Okay, so the stimulation 
um, has an effect, as we saw. It has an effect which uh, not only on the neurons as a whole, but also in the subspace that has activity related to the task, which is what's defined by the principal components here. Um, nonetheless, once the laser turns off, that activity recovers very rapidly. And there's little or no effect on the trajectory here, the neuronal trajectory that's followed subsequently. And so I said, we're not gonna really focus on the behavioral effect, but you can see that there's a potential relationship between what we see neurally and what was observed behaviorally. Okay, so what's going on? Um, so, and, and why do I say that this is a puzzle? Well, um, let's take a state space view of what's going on, right? So here is a high dimensional space, which we think of the neuronal activity as, as filling. Um, each dimension of the space is one neuron. Uh, and there's a very large number of these things. But we find in these data and in many similar data sets that much of the uh, activity of the, of the neurons ends up being confined to a relatively lower dimensional space, um, something on the order of 10 to 20. Uh, and we can think of this as a low dimensional task activity space. Okay, so what we observed was that um, there was little impact of the light on behavior. And perhaps one explanation for that was that everything that was interesting about the activity happened to be in this low dimensional space that was orthogonal to the direction of stimulation. So for whatever reason, when you, you know, uh, infect pyramidal cells and shine a laser specifically to excite them, uh, that sort of common mode of activation perhaps is not a mode uh, which uh, is explored when the task is actually, when the system is actually carrying out a computation. It's orthogonal to the computation. But that's not true, right? We saw that in fact, there was a projection of the stimulation into this space. Uh, much of the firing rate changes are outside that space, but this projection is actually large. It's larger than would be expected if this was just a random direction relative to the underlying dynamical subspace. Um, all right, so the answer is no. Uh, what's going on is not simply that the stimulation is orthogonal to the task activity. Um, we saw that it does perturb them. Uh, we saw that the activity recovers rapidly. This is a puzzle because the dynamics uh, the, by which the system evolves within the subspace are relatively slow. Uh, and so if you perturb something that has a long time constant, you should see its effects for a long time, right? And indeed, if we go ahead and fit a dynamical system model, which we can to describe the, data, the evolution of the data in this space uh, fairly accurately, um, we find that uh, if we then perturb that system, exactly as expected, the perturbation lasts for a long time. We don't get a return to the uh, trajectory that we would have had otherwise. So that's the puzzle, what's going on? Okay, we have a robustness in dynamics. Um, uh, this may be because the dynamics actually aren't created by this population we're recording from, they're just inheriting it from somewhere else. Um, that's possible. Um, but it turns out, and this is something that Leah noticed a little while ago, um, that it was possible, although if we just train a linear dynamical system, to capture the unstimulated activity alone, and then ask what happens when we perturb it. It's not robust, but that perturbation lasts for a long time. It is possible to train a linear dynamical system explicitly to be robust to the stimulation. So we have to add some trials with stimulated activity for this to happen, um, but we can do that. And we get a, a, a linear dynamical system that basically behaves in the way that our, da that our data do. Um, but that's not very satisfactory. We can do it, but um, we basically have to, to peek at the stimulated data to, to understand what's going on. It doesn't provide us with any explanatory power. Um, okay, but we can still ask what's going on in that network. And it turns out that uh, sort of the key point, and it's fairly easy to see this, we'll, we'll see it on the next slide, depends on an underlying non-normality in the dynamics. What do I mean by that? Well. Um, here again is the picture that we had before. Um, 
our, our hypothetical picture, task activity space, and in an ideal world, the stimulation might have been orthogonal to that. Um, what we actually observed was that stimulation, the stimulation input doesn't perturb the dynamics, right? And so this orthogonality relationship need not be with the space in which the task related activity lies, but it should be within the space which drives the dynamical evolution of the network. Um, but that space that drives the dynamical evolution of the network need not be the same as that where the network produces activity. Okay. Um, now, it often is that these are true that these two things are the same, but then they need not be if the dynamical system um, that gives rise to the activity that we're looking at has this property of non-normality. That is the, the, the weight matrix that takes one state to the next is a non-normal matrix. Okay, so our next question is, well, okay, we can do it. We need non-normality. Is that sort of geometric picture I've drawn here or the, or the appearance of non-normality just a coincidence? Well, non-normality is interesting in a mechanistic sense because networks that are um, composed of cells that are either excitatory or inhibitory, so networks that satisfy Dale's law, are always non-normal. Uh, and that's easy to see if this is the weight matrix of such a network, um, the red dots correspond to excitatory connections, the blue dots to inhibitory connections. And you can see that if I multiply this by a vector of neuronal, activi of, of neuronal activities, each one will either be um, multiplied by entirely red values or by entirely blue values. Okay, so that means that this satisfies Dale's law. If I take w, this weight matrix W and multiply it by its transpose on the right, uh, if you just sort of line everything up, you'll see that every entry in their product has to be positive. The positive uh, weights multiply with positive ones, negative with negative ones. But if I take the left product, W transpose W, now positive times positive, but here we get positive times negative. And so I get these off diagonal blocks of a different sign. Normality requires that these two matrices commute, that is these two products are equal, and they can't be. Right, so um, uh, Dale's law networks are always non-normal. Could it be that what we're looking at has something to do with this underlying structure? And so now to answer that question, we had to have a way to create a, a model that satisfies Dale's law and still reproduces many features of the recorded data. And what does that look like? So here's the structure, here's the, uh, the model that uh, Leia and Dan developed. So we're gonna start with a description at the at something like a network level, uh, we will have a um, high dimensional state. This is about a thousand neurons in the models that uh, Leia and Dan are actually fitting, um, which we're going to call new. Um, and um, the uh, new is you know is a vector representing the activity of a lot of different cells. Um, the mapping into in time is still linear with the weight matrix W. And that weight matrix has positive and negative entries in accordance with Dale's law. Uh, it's also sparse so that many cells, cells make only a, a limited number of connections to other cells in the network. Uh, we also enforce um, balance in that network. So the net ex, uh, excitation plus inhibition coming into a given um, uh, neuron will always cancel. And mathematically, we can express that as saying that if we multiply uh, the vector of all ones by W, we just get zero out. Okay, we want to take that model and use and fit, use it uh, to, to describe recorded PSTHs without stimulation. Um, and so we're going to do that linearly, but we're going to uh, depend on an observation that the, when we actually look at these PSTHs and ask what the, how the variance is concentrated is low dimensional. And indeed in that low dimensional space, the dynamics that seem to underlie their evolution is self-contained. Uh, and so to enforce those two constraints, we require that the mapping from nu to y be low rank. It's a product of two matrices um, where the matrix J, just jump through here, is a matrix which will map the high dimensional activity into a low dimensional space. Uh, and then C will take that low dimensional activity and map it back out to the recorded neurons. Okay. Now J is a, a matrix that we just choose randomly and fix. 
but C is a matrix which then needs to be optimized to fit the data. Uh, the other thing we need to do is ensure that these dynamics are self-contained. And I'll just very quickly, actually I probably won't take us through this in any detail, um, but there's a constraint that we will impose on uh, the interaction between W and J, which essentially makes sure, that's what these equations I'm skipping uh, uh, say, it makes sure that activity um, that lives outside of this subspace um, effectively remains outside of the subspace. It doesn't influence anything that, that goes on within it. And that's necessary to account for this observation that we make routinely, that when we fit models to um, these sorts of data, we actually find a low dimensional projection, which is self-contained in its dynamics. Okay, so that's the model. Uh, so we have a way of taking excited, uh, a, 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 an EI balanced network, um, requiring that it reproduce the data that were uh, um, observed. We could, so we're gonna fit the matrix W and fit the matrix C, such that that is true. But we will satisfy the constraints of balance and that the, in this low dimensional space, which was chosen randomly, um, the dynamics, uh, it's the projection into that space that must reconstruct the data, that's what we say here, and the dynamics must appear self-contained both observations that, that appear to be true of many data sets, not just this one. Okay. All right, so does it work? So we can fit the model and it does indeed manage to describe the, um, the activity of the um, recorded populations um, essentially as well as an unconstrained LDS would. So here are the model, so initializing the model and just running forward under the influence of W uh, I didn't stress this on the last slide. Um, there's uh, uh, the model, of course, can't know at the time of the go queue, and so the, uh, there is an input that uh, perturbs the system to initiate the movement-related activity that comes in at the time that corresponds to the time that the go queue was delivered, and that was called U on the last slide. Uh, so there's basically um, uh, one input in this regime and a different input in this regime, which is why you get that perturbation. Okay. Um, if you just fit a, a linear dynamical system to these data without any of the constraints, as I said, it's slow. And you can see that slowness if we look at the eigenvalues of the matrix that's learned, uh, they all cluster right up here, uh, close to the uh, unit circle uh, and actually close to a real part of, of, um, uh, of one. Um, in this case, we have a much larger system, right? Um, uh, uh, a thousand of these, so a thousand eigenvalues, most of them look like a random network, just a, a uniform disk um, with some gap to one. Um, the ones marked in blue are the ones that are responsible for dynamics in this subspace J, and that's where the slow stuff gets constrained, okay? But there's also some, some faster decay modes in there. Uh, and this is the amount of variance that's captured. Um, uh, yeah, so, here the constrained network, here the unconstrained network. And you can see that there's a small loss in the constraint. This is a, a more constrained model than this one, but it's, it's quite small. Okay, so what now happens when we look at the way this network responds to perturbation? So we fit the data. What happens if we now stimulate this network, introduce a new perturbation S? And the perturbation we're going to choose is random strengths of perturbation on just the E cells. And the variability comes from in the model or is meant to simulate the fact that there's noise in the Opsin expression. Okay, um, so this is the measured in the data um, difference between unperturbed activity and perturbed activity. And this is the, the length of that vector difference. And so you can see that it moves rapidly up. Uh, it actually decays a little bit, which is probably because of um, the, the uh, photocurrent itself actually decaying. That's not something we're going to model. But then when the laser turns off down here, it returns very quickly down to um, something close to baseline. But then there's actually this long decay, which we didn't see in the PCA data as clearly. Um, if we now look at the perturbation of the network, apart from that decay, that, as I said, we're not modeling, um, the rest of the structure looks much the same. Rapid up, uh, upswing, um, it stays high for quite a while, rapidly comes off most of the way when you turn off the light, uh, but then decays away relatively slowly. 
Um, now, what does this look like if we now look in the principal component space? Uh, and again, we're going to define the principal components just like was done here in the data by the dimensions that carry unstimulated variants. Uh, and the answer is that again, we do see a perturbation that appears within that space. And the net effect is actually on a similar scale uh, to what we have here, uh, although in the data in this particular run, well, sorry, the data, this was all concentrated uh, in the first principal component, much more so than in, in later ones. Whereas in this particular run of the model, it was more distributed across the top three, but that actually varies from, from instance to instance. Um, so qualitatively, we see the same phenomenon, a rapid perturbation, much less sign of that slow decay that we had before, uh, that, we, that we had on the previous slide here, right, this, this thing over here. Um, uh, and, a, and really a picture that looks uh, at least qualitatively quite data-like. Uh, that can be made quantitative if we actually take a subset of the model neurons and ask, can we now use that model that subset without perturbing the dynamics at all and without fitting to stimulus to the to the stimulation vector um, to account for um, the measured neuronal data here again are the measurements uh, and here is the now model fit where we've added an extra fitting step from a random subset of the network uh, to actually try to predict the measured neurons uh, as opposed to just look at the top principal components of the network itself and that again is is holds up across the different conditions. Okay, so that's basically all what I wanted to show. So we, we had a way of, of fitting this model. Uh, and indeed it turns out that the hypothesis that just this one extra constraint to the LDS, which is that it has to satisfy Dale's law and, and express the dynamics in completely in low dimensional space, appears to be sufficient to account for what otherwise look like a puzzle in the data. And as I said, there's a lot of theoretical work that Leia and Dan have been doing to try to, to connect those dots and ask, well, why is it uh, in a mathematical sense? But here we have the sort of phenomenological observation that it is. All right, so let me just uh, summarize to end. Um, so we saw that in these data, um, turning on the laser perturbs the responses, but once the laser turns off, uh, the responses reset very rapidly, they go back to to um, the activity they would have had otherwise. Um, we hypothesize that this might have something to do with the interaction of, uh, of excitatory inhibitory cells and therefore developed a way to fit a model while still a bit, uh, satisfying both phenomenological constraints, the observation of low dimensions, as well as the anatomical constraints of the EI network imbalance. Um, and indeed, we found that the non-normality introduced by that network naturally led to the sort of robustness that we were seeing in the data. Uh, and so some, you know, indeed, this is a situation where the mechanistic constraints are shaping functional dynamics in a way that turns out to be important to this data set. Uh, another thing to note is that the directions of maximum variance in the data over here are not necessarily the ones that are responsible for, in this case, the dynamical computation that's going on in the system. These two may not, they won't be orthogonal, but they may not be fully aligned. Um, and indeed, the, the low dimensionality of the space is important. Uh, and it may be that this robustness is part of the reason that we see that sort of low dimensionality. Uh, but that, again, is a speculation for another day. Let me thank uh, Leah, Dan, Whereupon and Krishna again. And hopefully you have a little bit of time for some questions at the end. Thank you, Manish. Unfortunately, in this format, you are subjected just to the slow solo clap uh, <laughs> of me, but uh, there's been a robust discussion in the chat. And so I think people are, are, uh, are really engaged and, and excited about what you're showing. Thank you for that. Um, I want to start with, well, if people may be typing some questions in the Q&A, um, there's a question that came up in the chat, and Dan has been chiming in there too, but I want to give you a chance to kind of answer in the video feed here. Um, I also think that I lost a little bit what the meaning of self-contained dynamics was. You know, that was okay. the other condition that you put on along with Dale's yep. law. So do you think that you could kind of say a little bit more about what that condition is? And yeah, what so, um, so there's two 
two parts to it, right? So the first part is um, the observation. And the observation, uh, you know, the database observation is you have a population of neurons. Mm -hmm. You record, sorry, I keep looking at you over there because that's where you are on my screen, but the camera's here. Um, the, uh, you have a population of neurons. You look at the, a low dimensional projection of these and that low dimensional state, you can write a dynamical system on that low dimensional state that correctly predicts how it's going to evolve in the future. So you really have captured the state space. And in that sense, the dynamics are self-contained in the data. Uh, and this is an observation that, that you know, we and, and many others have made about motor cortical data in particular for, for quite a while now. Um, then the question is, okay, what do we mean in the model? Uh, and so in the model, that's um, what is going on here and what I found I didn't quite have the time to step through in detail, but maybe let's try to go through it. Um, so uh, here, if we think about the evolution of the high dimensional state, so that's this thing over here, mm -hmm. um, but we're asking how, let's look at the, um, that high dimensional state projected into uh, this low dimensional space. So that's just J times new. Well, J times new at time T plus one, new at T plus one is just W times new at T, fair enough. But now we're gonna take this new at T and break it into two. So there's this part here and this part here, and the sum of those two terms, you know, this and this, oops, um, is just new of T. But what we've done is we've broken it into two parts, one of which lives in the space defined by J, and one of which is orthogonal to it. So that's your task. Now we're just going to say that a orthogonal part should go to zero. And that's what this constraint is up here. And is that your task relevant and task irrelevant dimension, or that's representing something well, else? Well, so in this case, uh, so the, what J is doing is it's our constraint is that the activity within J should reconstruct the data. And this constraint says, just knowing the activity within J, uh, which is actually defined by this variable X, that's J times new, I should be able to predict how activity in J will evolve in the future. So that's what we mean by self-contained. I don't need any information about the orthogonal part of this in order to work out how things are going to evolve in here. And again, that, that's what we see in, in the recorded data. And that's why it makes sense to ask our model to reproduce it. Yeah. Okay, very good. And you didn't need any nonlinearity in the network and the, the new variables in order to... No, cap so, so, th so it's, it's still actually a linear model entirely, right? Linear here and linear here. And so, I, I mean, it's worth pointing out that, um, you know, we, sh we should really be thinking of these not as firing rates, but as perturbations of firing rates away from the baseline. Right. Uh, and that also, um, you know, if, if we really allow these to go negative as firing rates, then of course a positive weight suddenly switches to being negative, which would make no sense. So we really have to think about this as, as perturbations away in some steady state. Yeah, great. All right, I think that is about the end of our time. Thank you so much, Manish, for the wonderful talk. Um, thank you all for joining us here today and for the robust discussion in the chat. Um, look forward to having this posted online so many other people can enjoy it who couldn't be here today. Manish, I know it's in the evening there. Thanks so much for giving up part of your evening um, for us here. Thanks, Chris, and, and thanks to everyone for, for listening. Maybe you can copy paste it to here so I can see because I don't have any access to the um, to the YouTube. And also, please note that uh, panelists are welcome to ask questions as well. So please be, feel free to just ask questions so we can have a fruitful discussion. I'll wait one more minute.
Okay, so uh, let's start. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. Um, we have an amazing lineup of speakers, um, and we have uh, Jacob, we have Katerina, and we have Adriana. And we'll start off with Jacob, Jacob Bohi, um, from Northwestern University in Illinois. Uh, his, the title of his talk is The Snare Regulator Complex Team 3 is a target of the cone circadian clock. Thank you for that introduction. Let me share my screen. Awesome. Yeah. So thanks for coming to this talk today. I'm going to be talking about um, my work on how the snare regulator complexin 3 is a target of the cone circadian clock, um, specifically in the mouse retina. And this is work that I did at a previous institution under Christopher Belega uh, at University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. Um, and yeah, so so what is the circadian clock? The circadian clock is um, a 24 hour rhythm of both behavior and physiology. Um, and it's a really critical adaptation that's evolved to allow organisms to preemptively adapt to changing environmental conditions that they know are going to change. Um, namely in this case, the 24 hour uh, light, di light dark cycle that we have here on earth. And Circadian clocks are present in almost all living organisms, um, and they're also present in most tissues. So um, here in humans, um, there are clocks distributed all throughout the bodies, uh, uh, throughout the body, and um, they are all controlled by this master circadian regulator in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and that sends signals throughout the body that helps to synchronize all of the peripheral clocks located elsewhere in the body. Um, and all of these clocks function with this conserved molecular architecture, um, which is shown here. And the way this works is basically clock and BMAL1 are formed or are translated, and then they form a dimer that then binds to these EBOX sequences um, and then serves as a transcription factor for the proteins which drive its degradation, which are pair and cry as well as the proteins that drive its expression. Um, and this forms two interlocking feedback loops, which then oscillate in approximately 24 hour rhythms. And um, the retina is no different. It has all of the cell types in the retina contain this um, molecular circadian clock, except for potentially rods. Um, and just to orient everyone within the retina, it's separated into three main layers. The outermost layer is the outer nuclear layer containing rods and cones, synapses um, through the outer plex form layer onto second order neurons, and then um, onto ganglion cells, which are the output cells of the retina. And so almost all these cells in the retina have their own circadian clocks, and these have really important roles for retinal function as well as retinal health. Um, so for example, if you remove the circadian clock in the retina, then there are very profound decreases in specifically cone to bipolar cell synaptic transmission. Um, and also if you remove the circadian clock and photoreceptors, they have premature aging and cell death. And you can also kind of recapitulate symptoms of diabetic retinopathy by uh, selectively removing the circadian clock within the retina. And so these clocks have really important functions in the retina, but it's really poorly understood how they're working and what specifically they're doing in the retina to have all these big effects. So in order to begin to understand this, our lab generated cones and rod specific BMA1 knockouts. Here I'm showing the cone specific BMA1 knockout. Um, and so this completely, um, the circadian clock in the retina, in the cone can no longer function with BMA1 removed. Um, and so here you can see in the cones, um, there's no BMA1 in the somas, whereas um, in these ones there is. And it's still present in other layers in the retina. And so using these cone specific BMA1 knockouts, we did fact sorting and then RNA sequencing um, to find genes which were differentially expressed between cone BMA1 knockouts and wild type mice. And so we found about 80 genes overall uh, which will all be really good starting points for beginning to figure out what is happening um, in the cones that lead to these effects of the circadian clock. 
Um, and then I got really interested in complexin-3 and complexin-3 specifically because it was the only synaptic gene which was differentially expressed um, that we found. And like I previously said, if you remove the circadian clock in the retina, you then get this pretty big decrease in cone to bipolar cell synaptic transmission. So we thought that this might be a really good um, target for actually um, causing this effect that we see. Um, and so what are the complexins? The complexins are this family of snare regulating proteins. And what they mainly do is they, they bind to the snare complex and then they hold vesicles so that they're in a very high, readily releasable state. And they also prevent them from premature fusion. And so what this really ends up doing is decreases the spontaneous vesicle fusion and increases the fast evoked vesicle release. And so there are four types of complexins. Um, complexins one and two are present generally at conventional synapses, whereas complexin three and four are present uh, specifically at ribbon synapses, which is the type of synapse that we have in cones. Um, and this type of synapse is really important to help um, cones you know, faithfully transduce um, light, dark information and have very fast, highly constant vesicle release. And so then we looked at um, what type of complexins were expressed in both rods and cones and how this differed if you remove the circadian clock. Um, and so like I mentioned before, complexin 3 is expressed um, in cones. Um, and there's this very large decrease in complexin 3 expression in um, the cone VMA1 knockout cones. Complexin 4 was also expressed highly in both rods and cones, um, but it was not didn't appear to be modulated at the transcriptional level by the circadian clock. So then we decided to see if this was maintained at the level of the protein. And so here in red, we have labeled the cones using cone arrestin, and then green, we have complexin-3. And then the bottom left, you can see uh, complexin-3 really completely fills up the cone terminal. Um, and so that's present really highly um, in wild type cones normally. And in order to see whether or not it was present really in rods, we then stained for uh, PSD95, which labels rod and cone synaptic terminals. Um, and then based on the size of the terminal, we could determine differentiate between rods and cones. So the cones have the stars in them, rods, some examples have the arrows pointing to them. Um, and you can see that there's really high expression of complexin three in the cones, but not so much in the rods. Um, and we did the same thing for complexin-4. And we saw that complexin-4 was really highly expressed in rods um, and still is expressed in cones, but um, not quite to the level that it is in rods. Um, this was kind of a surprising finding because previous work looking at complexin-3 and 4 um, had said that there was no complexin-4 in cones at all. Um, and so we were surprised to see that there was definitely some complexin-4 expression in the cones. The next thing we wanted to do was look and see that the protein was actually downregulated in these cone BMA1 knockout animals with no circadian clock. Um, so you can see in the top is during the subjective day in a wild type animal, and the bottom is during the subjective day in a cone BMA1 knockout. And you can see in the OPL where the cone terminals are, there's very low expression of complexin-3 um, in the knockout animals, but there is very high expression in the wild type animals. And interestingly, you can look at the IPL, which is uh, another synaptic layer, and you can see that there's still very, really high expression in these cone BMA1 knockouts. Um, and that makes sense because the circadian clock is only removed in the cones. And so that also serves as a nice control that it's not just a difference in the staining, it's actually um, because of the amount of protein that's there. Um, and then here's just a nice zoomed in image. You can see there's really a profound decrease specifically in the cone terminals of um, complexin-3 expression. And next we wanted to look in wild type animals and see that there was actually rhythmic expression of um, complexin-3 because just being downregulated in the knockouts doesn't really mean that it's controlled by the circadian clock. And so we wanted to show that there actually was this difference um, at day versus night in wild type animals. And we found that there was a strong decrease at night um, compared to during the day in um, 
wild type animals. And then we quantified all of this here. Um, so you can see this is the, um, on the left, we found this decrease in um, complexity expression in the code model and knockouts compared to wild type. Um, and we also looked to see if there's any effect of light adaptation because we wanted to see if it was actually controlled intrinsically by the clock or if it was controlled by light dark cycles. And we found that there was no effect of light adaptation. Um, and then when we looked at day versus night difference in uh, wild type versus Cone one we found that there is a significant downregulation in um, complexity three at night um, in wild type, but there was no difference in complexity three in the Cone one knockouts. Um, and really interestingly, the Cone one knockouts are stuck in this nighttime-like state of expression, the lower level. And that makes a lot of sense because uh, BML1 actually drives kind of the daytime half of the feedback loop. So we would expect them to be stuck in kind of a nighttime like state. Finally, we looked really looked at um, to see if there were any circadian clock transcription factor binding sites. Um, and we found that Complexin 3 specifically had potential transcription factor binding sites in its promoter region, whereas Complexin 4 had none. Um, and so this really is interesting because it potentially reveals a difference in why there are two complexins um, that are present at the ribbon synapse that when they have basically the exact same function and it's kind of in it how they're regulated rather than what they're doing. Um, and so overall, what we think is happening at the cone synapse is that during the day, there's this increase in complexin three expression at the cone pedicles which then leads to an increase in the speed and amplitude of uh, second order neuron light response. And so um, in the end, this causes there to be a um, improved vision during the day when cone mediated, mediated vision is the dominant form of vision. Whereas at night, there's this decrease in complexin three at clone pedicles, and uh, this leads to a decrease in the speed and amplitude of the second order neuron light response um, but this isn't really important because at night, rod mediated vision is what's really important for um, perceptual vision. And so by decreasing the speed and amplitude, you end up decreasing glutamate release and overall decreased energy expenditure at night when rod medi mediated vision is important. And yeah, that's all I have. I'd like to thank um, the people who I work with in my lab, um, specifically Christopher Belega for all of his great advice. And then Zijing Zhang was really helpful in doing a lot of the facts, er, facts sorting and sequencing, as well as um, breeding the mice for this work. Um, and here are our funding. And now I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob. Uh, and congratulations for this uh, recent publication. Um, so while we're waiting for questions, uh, you're more than welcome to type the questions in the questions and answer, answers. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, can you think, it, it, it might sound a little bit far-fetched, but can you think of a com complementary um, behavioral paradigm that you can test these mice, these knockout mice? Yeah, so one thing that we've, um, and kind of have slightly done is we've looked at, um, um, so optokinetic response. And so you can see, um, you can use that to kind of test how uh, well the mice are seeing. So looking at how they respond to drifting gratings, usually they'll follow it. Um, and actually in the cone BML1 knockout animals, they have slight deficits um, based on like preliminary data, there's slight deficits in the optokinetic response we saw. Yeah. What is again uh, the task, or what would what, what are they doing while uh, you're recording with optogenetics? All right, so um, they are it, behavior looking at the mice while there is a moving grading, and so mice generally will track um, along and try to stabilize the grading okay. on their field of view. And so okay. if you look at how their eyes move, you can see. Okay, so these are awake mice, and uh, they're just they're tracking these. Uh, this visual uh, grading. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, no oh, yeah. Not yet. Uh, what are your current plans now? 
like uh, published uh, work. Yeah, so um, hopefully this will be continued in by other people in the lab and we wanted to do recordings from um, bipolar cells and see actually if there's actually a strong difference at day versus night in these animals because right now we're just looking at how much the protein is expressed so we can't really say too much definitively about what's actually happening um, and so we want to do maybe like paired recordings between rods or from cones and bipolar cells and see if there's actually this difference um, and there's lots of other kind of maybe doing like calcium imaging or something like that just to see um, what's happening physiologically rather than just what's being expressed. All right, okay. Thanks again and good luck with that. And let us move quickly to the next speaker. Adriana Ramos uh, currently is a research associate in the Department of Neuroscience at John Hopkins. Uh, and she's been working there for the last uh, six years. Um, and the main, her main research interest is to understand how microglia can regulate neural function and cognition in conditions of stress. The title of her talk is uh, the nuclear, nuclear GAPDH HMGB cascade in cortical microglia regulates cognitive flexibility. Thank you for the introduction, and I, I will start by my talk that the, the title is The Nuclear Gap DH and DB Cascade in Cortical Microglia Regulates Behavioral Flexibility. So I will start by introducing what is behavioral flexibility and why it's important. So basically, this is the cognitive construct that allows us to adapt to changing environment or circumstances. But the reason why I got initially interested in this construct is because it is known to be affected in many neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative disorders. And as well, it is known to be affected during regular aging. But despite the importance of this cognitive behavior in so many diseases, the molecular and cellular mediators for the, it, this behavior are unclear. And very little is known, but we know some things. We know through ablation and functional MRI studies that the prefrontal cortex region of the brain is one of the regions more important for the regulation of this behavior. And all behaviors are affected by stress, but this is a, particular, this is a behavior that is particularly affected by stress. So working on the, the hypothesis that the psychological and psychosocial stress induce oxidative stress, I wanted to address if the nuclear gap DH cascade that is a sensor of oxidative stress can play a role in the regulation of this behavior. And I think like many people know that gap DH is one of the main enzymes involving glycolysis, but what many people don't know is that this enzyme is able to get post-translational modify within encounters oxidative or nitrosative stress. And when this happens, gap DH binds to CA1. This binding is important because CA1 is the protein that moves uh, gap DH to the nuclei. So for us, we have two different ways to intervene with this cascade. We have a pharmacological approach that is a drug we call RR that we demonstrated that is able to cross the BBB and reach the central nervous system. And as well, we have a genetic approach that is a point mutation in GAPDH that will block the binding between GAPDH and CIA. And we took advantage of that point mutation to create a conditional mouse model. So coming back to the scheme, both approaches will target this binding. If this doesn't bind, GAFDH won't move to the nuclei. So these are the main aims of this study. And for today, I will just focus on the preclinical aim in which what we are trying to see if it's the nuclear GAFDH cascade can regulate behavioral flexibility. On the clinical side, what we are trying to propose are biomarkers that allow us to predict behavioral inflexibility in the clinic based on what we learn on the preclinical side. But as I told you for today, I will focalize on the preclinical aim. 
So with this, I introduced the preclinical mouse model that we use, that is a very simple model that consists on the that consists on consecutive injections of LPS, of intraperitoneal injections. And this is a model that has been used in the field as a model of inflammation and oxidative stress. I just want to highlight that I, in this model, every outcome measure I take is 24 hours after the last injection. So what I will be addressing in this mouse is a cognitive task and not sickness behavior. So with this, first thing I did it was to test how these animals perform on the behavioral flexibility task. This task has two main portions, the initial association and the rule shifting. And this rule shifting, this extradimensional shifting is what it tell us how flexible the mice are. So what I found in my LPS mice is that they didn't present deficits on the initial association portion, but they did present deficits on the rule shifting. As you can see, there are some variability on the performance of the LPS mice, but we consistently see deficits in these mice. So when we characterize that the LPS mouse model presented deficits, we decided to treat with the drug that blocks the binding between GABD8 and CIA in order to see if the nuclear GABD8 has an effect or has a role in the regulation in this behavior. And as you can see, the animals treated with RR perform uh, better. Like the panel on the right, like highlights just the perseverant errors that tell us that the mice are not performing randomly, if not that they get a stick to what they previously learned on the previous task. So our, at that point then, what we knew is that the nuclear gap cascade is involved in a mechanism responsible for behavioral flexibility, but we wanted to know which cell types were involved in that regulation. So for that, I addressing the activation of this cascade paying in a cell type specific way, paying attention to microglia and astrocytes mainly that are the main cell types involved in the provocation and resolution of inflammatory effects. And it was very striking to see how microglia was the main cell type in which this activation was taking place. And what I'm showing in here are, is the binding between GABD8 and CIA as a way to show activation of the nuclear GABD8 cascade. But even more interestingly, it was not all microglia that was activated, if not that it, it was more prone cortical microglia to be activated versus other brain regions. So we don't know if this tells us about different, um, different um, um, uh, populations of microglia cells or if it is that the um, stress is higher in certain regions. But this will be in conjunction with the behavioral deficit we observe that we know is very prefrontal cortex driven. And this is just to show that there are works in vivo. So I corroborated these results as well using the sulfogabd 8 antibody. That is another way to test activation in which we see that the signal of sulfogabd 8 co-localizes with IVA1 and not with other signals ten, telling us that it's microglia specific. So next question was to know how microglia is controlling neural activity in order to regulate this behavior. And for that I performed a chipstick analysis against nuclear gap D8 to initially know more about the activation of this cascade. You have the results in here on the panel of the right, the peaks of occupancy. And with that, I ran an ingenuity pathway analysis to know common hubs or pathways regulated by gap D8. Um, the three first pathways are really interesting, but tell us more about the autonomic function of microglia under stress. And for this particular project, I got really interested on the fourth hit on the regulation of HNDB1 and 2 signaling. And the reason why I got interested on that is because it has been described how HNDB proteins can bind to the NDA receptors and work as an agonist. So what I thought that it was happening is microglia Gap, nuclear gap DH in microglia will be regulating HNDB proteins that will be secreted to the extracellular space and bind to the NMD receptors of closed neurons. So first I tested that 
the results of my tip seek were true through the different techniques. I, I did a tip uh, QPCR to test that the binding of uh, nuclear gap DH to the promoter of HNDB2 was actually true. And as well, I tested that this binding was functional and that is actually regulating HNDB proteins at uh, mRNA and as well at protein level. So next thing then was actually test if I could see then the, the activation of the neural cells in my system. And for that, I performed calcium imaging as an indirect measure of the NDA receptors. And long story short, what we found in here was that uh, we observed an increase of the firing rate in the uh, pyramidal neurons of the animals that were treated with LPS. And we were able to revert this effect when we treat the animals with RR, that is the, block, the drug that blocks the binding between gap dh and CIA. But as well, in order to, tell, to test causality of the HNDB proteins, we acutely treat the slice with an HNDB antibody that would theoretically block the binding between HNDB proteins and the NNDA receptors. And this was successfully as well revert the increase of firing rate we observed in the cells. But all of this is, was not the clear proof that microglia was the responsible cell for the regulation of this effect on neurons. And for that, we slightly changed our model for being able to back cross it with uh, our Nokim mouse line and specifically target the activation of the nuclear gap DH in microglia cells. Two things. In this model, initially, we reproduced the same effect we saw before. So the increase of firing rate is happening on the, on the cortical regions. And we decreased this effect when we block the activation of the cascade just on microglia cells. As well with this genetic mouse model, we also saw how we are able to revert the deficits on the behaviors. So with all of this, what I told you today is that the nuclear gap DH cascade is specifically activated in cortical microglia in LPS mice and responsible for behavioral inflexibility. And that the nuclear gap DH transcriptionally regulates HNDB1 and 2 expression in microglia cells. As well, microglial and gap DH cascade regulates neural function through HNDB1 and 2 signaling. So with that, I just want to acknowledge my mentor, Akira Sawa, and all the people in my lab that participated in the study, as well collaborators inside Hopkins and our funding sources. So thank you all of you, and I will take any question. Thank you very much, Adriana. Uh, let's wait for questions. Um, okay, so while we're waiting, can you tell us a little bit more about your plans now? Well, my plans, I like finished my postdoc, so now I'm like, applying for jobs, I'm entering in the job market and seeing how that works, but maybe this was not the best year to enter in the job market. But. <laughs> it's not the best timing for anything, so, so in that sense, it's, Let's it's be fun. flexible, you know? <laughs> yeah, we're all in the same boat here. And uh, was this um, uh, project published? Uh, we submit, it's submitted, so yeah, hopefully it gets out soon. Okay, oh, that's that's wonderful. Good luck with that. Any more um, any more projects that you that you need to wrap up, or you're done? Okay, um, I mean, there are other directions, uh, all of them like related with microglia. For example, I'm very interested as well on um, addressing the metabolic function of microglia and how that can also be in relation with the regulation of neural function. So how the reprogrammation of the metabolism in microglia can affect the rest of the cells in the brain. It's been like one of uh, 
of the other lines and actually the line I want to take with me so yeah mm, okay all right good luck with that uh, we have one 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 question sorry from Kaleen Conrad do you think there are other non-neuronal cells that are regulating neuronal firing or do you think this is a micro this is microglia specific I do think it's microglia specific um Overall, like the genetic uh, rescue showed that microglia is crucial for this. What is true is that what I, I cannot be completely sure if it could be an effect, an, a, like an extra effect that could be as well mediated by astrocytes, for example, and that micro, the activation of the nuclear Gabriel's cascade is activating astrocytes that subsequently activate as well, have an effect on neurons, and there is like a, a, an additive mechanism. But what I do know is that microglia is the, if you target, if you block um, uh, the activation of this cascade in microglia is sufficient to reverse the effect on neurons. So, that what I have. Okay. Thank you, Adriana. Before we move on to the uh, third speaker, there was an unanswered question from you to Jake um, before. Do you want to repeat it or do you want to wait for later? Say again. I see that you had here a question. Yeah, I think I wrote it on the wrong, on the wrong yeah, slide. Yeah. Yeah, my question was like, if you think that these mechanisms you observe that Vimal is regulating uh, CPL3, do you think this is something specific that happens on the retina? Or do you think that this happens in other brain regions and in other neural cell types? Yeah, so I think complexin-3 specifically is probably only in the retina because it's basically only expressed in the retina at these ribbon synapses. And the only other place that it's really expressed is in hair cells, so maybe there as well. But one thing that I think is potentially interesting is that uh, the circadian clock could regulate maybe complexin-1 or, or 2 at conventional synapses, and no one's really looked at that at all. And so that's kind of one interesting direction, maybe. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, uh, great. Thank you very much again, Adriana. It's wonderful to see so many results. Um, let's just move quickly to the last uh, speaker of today's webinar, Katerina Dimitri, Dimitropoulou from, um, from Athens, Greece. Uh, she's working in the Biomedical Research Foundation of the Academy of Athens. And the title of her talk is uh, The Neuroprotective Role of Orphan Nuclear Receptor NR5A2 LRH1 Against Oxidative Stress. Unmute yourself, please. Has everybody seen the presentation? Okay. So, hi everyone. Um, I will be introducing you to the, um, excuse me, I'm not sure if you're seeing this. It's my first time in Zoom. Do you see this? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, I'm gonna try this. Okay, thank you. So, um, I will be introducing you to the neuroprotective role of orphan nuclear receptor NR5A2 or otherwise known as LRH1 against um, oxidative stress. Um, first of all, uh, neurodegeneration is the progressive um, and ultimately fatal loss of selective uh, populations of neurons. And prevalent uh, neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, um, ALS disease and many more emerge as different types of neurons or different anatomical regions of neurons um, get affected. However, they share um, common ground as far as, as, uh, as, far as their ideopathology is concerned. Uh, neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, um, impairments in uh, proteasomal, autophagosomal, and lysosomal systems, as well as uh, dysfunction in the mitochondria are 
uh, some of the common mechanisms that are interlinked in neurodegeneration. And um, one of the key players of uh, this um, pathological condition and our focus today is um, oxidative stress. Brain is uh, the organ that uh, needs uh, the most oxygen of, uh, in the organism and uh, which subsequ subsequently leads to excessive uh, production of uh, reactive oxygen uh, species. And uh, cellular uh, mechanisms act to keep those, uh, to keep uh, ROS at uh, essential and uh, optimal levels because they also function as uh, signaling molecules. And uh, in the cases that uh, this imbalance happens, this is when oxidative stress occurs. And um, uh, now we will be talking about uh, nuclear receptors, which are transcription factors that uh, they have uh, lipid uh, soluble lichens that they can uh, uh, travel through the uh, plasma membrane and can directly um, activate the receptors uh, intracellularly, I'm sorry. Um, one such, uh, actually in those receptors, uh, can mediate a vast, um, uh, a, a vast uh, list of uh, biological uh, procedures. And when uh, dysregulation happens, uh, this is when um, um, uh, certain conditions uh, get worsened or it can actually initial initialize pathological conditions. Um, NO5A2, or uh, liver receptor homolog one, because it was uh, first added in liver, uh, is, uh, is one such uh, receptor. It is predominantly um, expressed in heteropath, in hetero, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, heter, um, well, in liver, and uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't seem to, uh, to remember the word, and um, panc um, pancreas and the intestinal epithelium and in this system. And more recently in uh, immunoregulatory uh, uh, processes. And uh, it is um, its connection to the nervous system is, uh, is not so uh, known. Uh, however, our lab uh, in uh, a recent publication uh, found that it is essential to the development of the central nervous system as a um, knockout mice. Uh, die around uh, embryonic day seven. And as you can see, it has uh, some very severe effects when it is uh, conditionally uh, deleted through the Cree system. Um, it also, um, in uh, a recent uh, research, uh, it has been highlighted its role in um, driving neurogenesis in the nervous system while blocking the cell cycle and also blocking the pathway to astrogliogenesis. And it is uh, during those studies that we um, noted that uh, the uh, temporal deletion of NR5A2 sp um, spikes the levels of uh, activated caspase 3. And, and so the hypothesis of neuroprotection um, has a reason. Um, what we did uh, first is to establish an oxidative stress, uh, because this is our selected insult, uh, an oxidative stress model. And uh, the currently most established one is using um, hydrogen peroxide. And uh, through titration, we chose um, uh, 350 uh, micromy, I'm sorry, 350 micromy uh, as a concentration that has a desirable effect of survival around 40%. Uh, percent. And uh, to test this on uh, cell line, we chose SHSY5Y, which is uh, an established human neuroblastoma cell line that does not endogenously um, uh, expresses uh, the NR5A2 um, uh, protein. So it would uh, be um, optimal for overexpression uh, studies. And uh, as you can see, we first tried um, two adenoviral constructs, one having the GFP gene and the NR5A2 gene, and one having only the NR5A2. However, um, because for immunofluorescent studies, it is very essential to, um, to 
uh, detect the GFP, and it because it has a desirable uh, difference, as you can see, we chose the adenoviral, adenoviral construct that has the GFP gene um, that carries the GFP uh, gene within it. And uh, next, we proceeded to uh, those overexpression studies I told you about before, um, and with uh, immuno immunofluorescent studies, uh, we um, uh, tested for antibodies uh, that are uh, against markers of apoptosis, uh, such as the um, most famous apoptotic protein, activated caspase 3, and uh, a marker for uh, dying or dead cells, which is um, a thetium homodimer 1. Uh, and as you can see, uh, there is um, hydrogen as expected, I'm sorry, as expected, hydrogen peroxide does increase um, extensively the activate caspase in the first case. Uh, and then the NR5A2 overexpression ameliorates this um, effect and uh, it is uh, similar, the neuroprotective effect, uh, with uh, ethidium homodimer 1. And having established the uh, first um, neuroprotective uh, effect of uh, NF5A2 in a human cell line, we proceeded to test it in uh, primary cortical neurons. We chose, um, uh, we performed dissection in uh, um, murine embryos of day uh, 15 uh, and a half because this is when uh, neurons are mostly generated and astro astrogliogenesis has not quite begun yet. So we have a, a more um, homogeneous population. And uh, through mechanical and chemical um, titration of cells, uh, we performed the same titration of uh, hydrogen peroxide. Again, we chose 350 microme concentration for uh, a similar um, survival effect. Uh, and as you can see, we also um, confirmed the overexpression of our uh, denoviral construct. And then we proceeded with uh, immunofluorescence uh, studies. And similar to our SHSY5Y experiments, activated caspase 3 increases with uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, peroxide, I'm sorry. And then um, this effect is, uh, um, uh, let's say, rescued uh, by the uh, overexpression of NR5A2. We uh, then, uh, having uh, established the neuroprotective uh, effects at, uh, let's say, apoptosis levels, we wanted to explore kind of the uh, mechanism and the other uh, targets implicated um, uh, in, this, uh, um, in this pathway. So we selected uh, a few genes. Um, as you can see, the first row are genes that, are, that belong to the BCL2 family. The first uh, two ones are anti-apoptotic genes, and the second two ones, uh, backs and back, are pro-apoptotic genes. And uh, in the case of uh, BCLXL and BCL2, we see that they are increased with NR5A2, um, which uh, let's say quite makes sense because they are um, anti-apoptotic. The, however, the second two does not make much sense because you could, um, let's say, expect that they would be um, uh, decreased. However, let's remem remember that this is mRNA level and they could be targets of NR5A2. Uh, the first row, as I said, is implicated in apoptosis. And since we're talking about um, oxidative stress, we selected um, two uh, genes. Uh, that they are um, Katarina, we're implicated a bit in uh, over time. Sorry. Can okay, I'm gonna make it up? fast. We, we yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, so they are they are also increased with NR5A2 overexpression. And uh, what's most uh, important in this is that there is um, an FDA approved and effective NR5A2 agonist uh, DLBC, which can recapitulate the neuroprotective effects of NR5A2. Um, although there's no conclusive 
um, result about the levels of the NR5A2, we see that PCL Excel and PCL2 are also increased. And um, to end this presentation, um, we have um, uh, uh, proven um, neuroprotection in a human cell line in the primary cortical neurons with uh, the overexpression of nr 5 a 2 along with its agonist, DLPC. And our next step is uh, to test those genes on the protein level because uh, to see what's actually happening within the cell and to investigate new targets that have arisen from the cells that we have already chosen and uh, proceed to cheap and uh, transcriptional assays to test the direct binding of nr 5 a 2 on this target and ultimately uh, reveal the mechanism behind it. And uh, thank you, Katerina. I'm so sorry. For the, last... the rule will be taken soon. It's, this is it. This is it. This is it. Thank you. This is it. Thank this you so much. End. And I'd like to thank thank my members and my um, with the guidance of uh, Panagiotis Politis for this uh, very valuable experience. All right, thank you so much, Katerina. And I'm so sorry for the time. No problem. We do have one question here. And before that, I forgot to mention that uh, Katerina is a master's student, which is uh, pretty much unbelievable given the, the, this type of work that uh, you've been doing. Um, so a question from Pauline Conrad, quickly. Sorry if I missed it, but can yes. any of you test if these are functional neurons and not just neuron-like cells expressing uh, neuronal factors? I'm sorry, the sound is kind of messy. If I have tested... If, if, um, or can you test if these are functional neurons or just other types of, of cells that act like neurons and expressing neuronal factors? Um, if I have... I'm not sure if I understand it correctly. Uh, if I can test it in other type of uh, neuronal-like... Yes. Cells? If you can test, Is, if you can test, if you can, if you can test, are... if you can test the neuroprotection, well, this study isn't uh, in its uh, very primal steps, and uh, we haven't got gotten that far. Um, we've come as far as the ex vivo model, and our next steps would be more like in vivo, and uh, uh, we haven't thought about neuronal like um, other type of cells, but we'll look into it. Okay, one more question quickly. Uh, in one of your tests, you were able to rescue the, apopto the apoptoic cell. Were you being Can able you please to... repeat? Were you be uh, sorry, were you able to rescue the apoptoic cell? Yes, there was a res the rescue. Actually, there was a difference in uh, activated caspase 3, uh, a, a significant difference. Uh, and this is in uh, IF studies. Uh, we haven't per se, um, let's say, seen this uh, on protein level. We have seen it in, uh, we have seen it in IF studies. But there is a significant amelioration of uh, um, oxidative stress effect. Okay, we really need to wrap up here. Uh, the room will be taken for another uh, webinar session soon. So thank you everyone again. Uh, I really enjoyed your talks. Thanks the attendees and thank the speakers and thanks uh, Felipe for uh, handling all the things behind the scenes. Thank you very much and uh, good luck in the future. Thank you, bye. Bye bye, bye everyone. Uh, now, I believe we are streaming live on YouTube. My name is Ina Puse, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to this session. And I'm being assisted uh, on the back end by our host, Elisabetta Bala. And we have um, three um, very diverse and exciting talks um, today, which uh, I'm, I'm really um, interested in, in seeing. And it's all about... Um, the self and, and, and egocentric kind of um, navigation and also um, one's body position in space and how one experiences it. And very, very interesting three talks. The first one, we're going to go to the rat and we're going to go to Andy Alexander, who's going to tell us about um, navigational processing in rats and when they're doing self-motion. Take it away, Andy. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, thanks to everyone in attendance and to the conference organizers. 
it's amazing to see how the scientific communication is adapting to the current situation we find ourselves in. And today I'll be talking about adaptation in the posterior parietal cortex. And this was work done in collaboration between my grad and postdoc laboratories. And it's been fun to meld the two worlds while analyzing a slightly older data set. So um, my research uh, has primarily focused on neural circuits important for spatial cognition and, and navigation. And today I'll focus on the dynamics of neurons that exhibit firing in an egocentric coordinate frame or relative to the animal itself. So neurons in multiple regions track the linear and angular speed of an animal, which is thought to underlie path integration computations for localizing oneself in space. And there are also egocentric responses that are not explicitly related to movement, such as neurons in the parietal cortex or lateral and terrenal cortex that respond to the position of a visual stimulus or a goal relative to the animal itself. And uh, many studies utilize simple paradigms like free foraging to study navigational processing, but intelligent behavior requires switching between unique forms of behavioral control. For instance, mice and rats forage, but also exhibit chase behaviors and hunt small prey. So uh, this paper from the Neil lab showed uh, mice chasing crickets. Um, predatory behaviors rely on visual information. So we designed a task in which rats pursued a visual target to explore how navigational context alters cortical processing of these navigation relevant variables. And I just wanna quickly say that there's some awesome studies on the sphere colliculus and the zona inserta and their role in this predation behavior that uh, you should check out if you uh, are so inclined. So we trained rats to chase a uh, visual target projected onto the floor of a circular maze. And the target was experimental controlled uh, but with a green laser pointer, as you and the audience might have at once uh, played with a cat or a dog. Um, so we track the position of the animal and the target. Shown on the right are all of the paths uh, of the target in uh, blue, all of the paths of the rat in light gray, and all of the paths of the, right in, of the rat in dark gray when it's chasing the visual target. And the target primarily moved in pseudo-random trajectories, and the animal's goal was to intercept the target, at which point the target would shut off, and a reward was then delivered to a random location within the arena for the rat to retrieve, which uh, the trajectory to the retrieval is shown in these purple lines. And I hope these videos are playing for everyone. Um, I've had some problems with that in the past. Okay, uh, so we questioned whether rats would learn the presence of paths with a statistical regularity. So we embedded characteristic trajectories of the visual target amongst these random trajectories. And uh, shown to the right are all such paths in a single session, and then three individual examples. So each instance of a characteristic trajectory started and finished in relatively similar coordinates within the allocentric reference frame and possessed this reliable recurrent shape that involved a stereotype sequence of actions and headings. And indeed, rats picked up on the presence of the characteristic trajectory and tracked the target more closely than during random paths. And we map the position of the target relative to the animal in egocentric coordinates, the animal's placed in the center of this. And then we can look to see where the target is to the left in front of or to the right of the animal. We do that for a single session. We can average it across all sessions. And we see that during the characteristic trajectories, the animal keeps the target in a smaller angular range than on the random trajectories, indicating that it's anticipating the position of the target. Further, Rats showed that they had internalized this characteristic path by exhibiting predictive behaviors that we, for simplicity's sake, are referring to as shortcuts. So the video on the left shows one such shortcut wherein the animal observed the trajectory of the target on a characteristic path and then cuts through the center of the maze rather than chases the target in order to intercept it. So to officially perform this task, animals must integrate sensory motor and spatial information of target trajectories to adapt self-motion behavior especially in cases like these shortcuts wherein the animal executes action sequences in the spatio-temporally insightful manner. So we hypothesize that these computations may occur in the posterior parietal cortex, which uh, possesses dense reciprocal connectivity with visual and sensory motor processing areas. And so to explore PPC dynamics, we recorded in the region while the animal performed the target chasing task, and then in separate sessions, free foraged in the same arena. And consistent with prior work, we observed parietal cortex neurons with self-motion sensitivity. So shown here are linear and angular speed tuning curves for six uh, neurons. Uh, each column is a single neuron, uh, linear and angular top and bottom. 
and greater than 50% of parietal cortex neurons were sensitive to the linear speed of the animal, and it took many different forms, as you can see from the variety of profiles here. Approximately 30% of the parietal cortex neurons exhibited significant self-motion tuning during pursuit, um, and, uh, more, sorry, uh, exhi exhibited significant angular tuning, and there were more neurons that were sensitive to self-motion tuning during pursuit than free exploration, and also self-motion tuning was more reliable during target chasing. PPC neurons also exhibited two forms of gain modulation as a function of task. So the color maps here show the linear speed tuning curves in free exploration on the left and pursuit on the right for cells with significant sensitivity. And we split these neurons into subsets that had increased mean rate um, in free exploration on the top or increased mean rate in pursuit at the bottom and then sorted them by their peak firing within their preferred navigational epoch. And as demonstrated by the greater number of neurons in the bottom two plots, significant proportions of linear speed modulated cells had greater mean firing rates during the target pr pursuit session than during the foraging session. And the same was not true for angular speed sensitive neurons, wherein there were similar proportions. So accordingly, we can say that there's an additive gain on linear speed sensitivity during pursuit, but additive gain may not enhance the code for linear speed at the ensemble level, as the signal to noise ratio would essentially remain fixed under this scenario. So we next tested for the presence of multiplicative gain, which has been reported in numerous tasks, as well as in structures like the parietal cortex. And so to examine this, we fit Gaussian modified linear models to self-motion tuning curves. So here, uh, the model implements a linear regression with an additive 1D Gaussian parameters to capture any non-linearities. And so the amplitude parameter schematized here can uh, reflect additional activation above a linear fit and can be thought of as modeling the magnitude of within receptive field firing. And consistent with the presence of multiplicative gain modulation, many linear and angular speed sensitive neurons had significant differences in the amplitude parameter between the two tasks. So the multiplicative gain ended up yielding uh, enhanced signal to noise ratios for linear speed sensitive neurons during pursuit uh, in comparison to free explore. And that's great, but the signal to noise ratio is only meaningful if it yields corresponding changes to the resolution of self motion decoding in downstream readers. So we decoded linear velocity in free exploration and pursuit independently and found that decoding accuracy was greater during pursuit in both uh, single neurons. So shown here is the decoding accuracy in pursuit versus free explore. And so it's greater in both single neurons as well as when we decoded from ensembles. So we can better detect linear speed during target chasing. Um, this was true for the instantaneous relationship between neural spike trains and self-motion, but neurons can have temporally latent relationships to behavior. So we next ran the decoder after shifting the spike train relative to, uh, after shifting the spike train relative to the behavior in 100 millisecond increments for two seconds forwards and backwards in time. And if decoding accuracy improves when the spike train is shifted backwards, this would indicate that the spiking activity is better related to the retrospective or history of self-motion state and the reverse is true for forward shifts. So shown here are four example decoder latency curves for linear speed sensitive and angular speed sensitive cells. And the purple curve reflects decoding accuracy in pursuit and the gray in free explore and the dots indicate the peak decoding accuracy. And so overall, when we look at the full population of parietal cortex neurons that have linear speed sensitivity or angular speed sensitivity, we see is overall PPC decoding is greatest at non-instantaneous relationships to behavior and biased in the retrospective direction, indicating that self-motion sensitivity in parietal cortex actually reflects the history of movement or is more sensitive to the history of movement. So we next fit these decoder latency curves and discover that the temporal scale by which movement can be decoded from parietal cortex is significantly longer in duration during pursuit than during free explore as depicted in the greater width of the purple curve versus the black curve here. So decodability extended through retrospective and prospective shifts of the spike train relative to the behavior. And this means that parietal cortex ensembles provide information about the past, present, and future self-motion state of the animal for longer time periods during pursuit, which could facilitate movement co coordination and prediction across multiple regions important for this predation behavior. And so finally, we wondered what is driving uh, these changes in the strength, the reliability, the gain, and the time scale of self-motion computation in parietal cortex 
uh, during pursuit compared to free explore. And an obvious possibility is the presence of the visual stimulus, which dictates movement commands. So we found that approximately 30% of parietal cortex neurons were significantly modulated by the egocentric position of the visual target, which we visualize here using uh, what we call rat to target rate maps, which simply show the activation of an individual neuron as a function of the position of the target relative to the animal. So we see a variety of different forms of, uh, of uh, visual target sensitivity, including neurons that have a wide bearing in which they are sensitive to the position of the target, but no real distance component. And then a larger proportion of neurons that have more restricted receptive fields that possess both egocentric bearing and distance components uh, with respect to their target receptive fields. We also saw that about half of the neurons with self-motion sensitivity were simultaneously sensitive to the position of the visual target as shown for this example neuron. So this neuron is sensitive to the target in front of the animal. It's also linear speed sensitive and angular speed sensitive in the sense that it prefers straightward motion. And so uh, we examined the distribution um, of amplitude and mean rate changes between neurons that tracked the target and neurons that did not and observed that target tracking self-motion cells had significantly greater gain modulation than those not sensitive to the possession of the egocentric target. And that's shown in the rightward shift of these cumulative density functions for linear speed. So both the amplitude and the mean of uh, gain modulation is higher for neurons that also track the target, you know, gener uh, creating sort of a, a potential mechanism, a coding mechanism for uh, the emergence of this gain modulation. And so in summary, we uh, trained the animals to perform this pursuit task. We found that there was greater reliability in self-motion sensitivity and greater numbers of neurons with self-motion sensitivity during the pursuit task, that there was multiplicative gain modulation that yielded greater decodability of, of uh, linear speed and that neurons that were sensitive to linear speed that were also sensitive to the position of the target had greater gain modulation. And so we conclude that parietal cortex is dynamically integrating self-motion information in response to ongoing behavioral demands. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge my advisors, uh, Doug Nitz and Michael Hasmo um, at UCSD and Boston University and my co-authors in bold. Um, there's a preprint forthcoming and um, yeah, uh, thank you so much. I'll take questions. And thank you, Andy. And notice he had on there that he's on the job market this year as well on his slide. So um, I've got a, a couple of questions here for you, Andy. One is just a, a clarification question from the audience about um, whether the, the, the paradigm was blocked or alternating for your free exploration and your pursuit tasks. Yeah, it, so it was, all, it was alternating blocks. So the animals would do the pursuit task first and then the free explore. And then we also counterbalanced that. We also had uh, ex experiments where we uh, uh, sandwich the pursuit session between two free explore sessions. Mm -hmm. Great. And then we have a question from Sapide Keshavazi, and she's actually asking the question I was going to ask. So thank you, Sapide. <laughs> Very nice talk. Andy, have you thought of or tried a similar chasing experiment where the target is not visual, i.e. a hunting task in the dark, so that you could tease apart the effect of visual versus purely goal-related changes in these gain modulations? That's a great question. No, we haven't done that. And that's certainly a direction that we could move forward with. Um, it is the case that um, the Neo lab showed that the uh, cricket hunting in mice was primarily dependent on visual information. So when they plugged the ears of the mice, auditory information was blocked, but the animals could still chase down the crickets. So we have to be careful about the exact design, but it's an interesting idea, certainly. And that's why I'm kind of interspersing uh, visual target and goal throughout um, the talk and, and the manuscript because uh, it's a bit ambiguous. Okay, so um, that's uh, that'll do it for us for the time. Thank you very much, Andy. That was a really, really um, lovely talk. Thank you. And um, we will move on to the next speaker. And now we go from mice to Drosophila. And so uh, we're going to be learning about a path integrating circuit again. So um, exploring plasticity uh, in, in uh, the, these path uh, integrating circuits in Drosophila. And it, the talk will be presented by Pantelemon Vafedis. Take it away, Pantelemon. Thank you very much. And thanks a lot to all the organizers for making this possible. 
so um, ours is a modeling study primarily. And uh, the title is uh, Learning a Path Integrating Circuit in the Drosophila Central Complex. Um, so there are two things I would like to unpack from this title. Um, the first thing is learning. Uh, so our goal is essentially to learn the synaptic connectivity in our network that allows it to do uh, to achieve its goal. And the goal is to path integrate. Um, so by path integration, uh, we mean the ability of animals to maintain an accurate internal representation of their location in the environment uh, in the absence of external cues. Uh, so this usually happens because they have available some self-motion cues, uh, which allows them to maintain this internal representation. And in our case, uh, we study the head direction cells, uh, which are cells that uh, maintain the representation of uh, the head of the animal in relation to an external landmark. And uh, essentially uh, what we refer to as external input would be the visual input uh, where the information of this landmark is available. And what is we refer to as self-motion cues is the uh, angular velocity of the animal, the vestibular input. Um, so this has been studied ex extensively in computational neuroscience and usually uh, the framework uh, with which people, people study that uh, is that of uh, continuous attractor networks. And uh, usually the head direction cells are arranged in a ring uh, and each head direction cell responsive to a different head direction. And uh, this, this ring has the property that it can support a localized bump of activity anywhere along, its, along the ring. And also it can move this bump of activity, which represents the current head direction of the animal, um, according to uh, self-motion cues. Um, so there have, there have been fascinating uh, advancements in this field uh, experimentally, um, because it has been found that such a structure, a ring structure, uh, exists uh, in the fly central complex. And we have here a simplified version of this uh, circuit, um, which of course contains head direction cells. Uh, different colors means they correspond to different head direction. And uh, they receive visual input directly. Um, we have the recurrent connections among them, which are uh, plastic. And um, the head direction cells, we have basically two head direction cells for each head direction. Uh, one is uh, projecting to leftward head rotation cells, which are responsible for moving uh, the bump leftwards, and the other to rightward head rotation cells. And the head rotation cells receive a differential vestibular input, as you can see here. Um, finally, the head rotation cells then um, uh, project back to the ring. Uh, of head, head direction cells uh, with plastic connections as well in our model. And here is also the visual input, which is basically uh, an inhibitory bump uh, centered in the current head direction. And the mechanism uh, uh, with which it works is disinhibition, basically. Uh, for more, look at this paper here. Um, so uh, our goal is to learn the connectivity that achieves path integration. And um, in order to do this, uh, we use the visual input as some sort of supervisory signal. And uh, essentially the, the synapses uh, should be tuned in such a way that in the end, in the end of learning, once the learning has converged, um, the network can predict the visual input from only the vestibular input. So the visual input is not needed anymore. And of course, it has been shown that animals can do this. In darkness, they can maintain this accurate internal representation of heading. Um, so <clears throat> in order to achieve this, um, we utilize uh, a framework which has been developed for mammalian systems. Uh, look at this paper, Larkin 2013, um, where the pyramidal neuron in mammalian systems has been assumed to be uh, the fundamental unit of cortical processing because it can associate inputs arriving in different compartments of the neuron. Uh, so we call this associative neuron and adapt it to the fly. Uh, and this associative neuron uh, is a rate neuron 
uh, contains two compartments. One is the actual compartment where the visual input comes in, and the other is the dendritic compartment where the recurrent connections and the head rotation connections come in, uh, which are both plastic. Uh, and we also see uh, that our assumption of this separation of uh, inputs to head direction cells, because the associative neuron is a head direction cell in our network, uh, holds. Um, so this is um, a plot from the uh, Janilia Connectomics uh, Fly Connectomics project, uh, and shows where the incoming connections in a uh, head direction cell arrive. And you can see that uh, with red and blue, we have the visual inputs, which are segregated from the rest of the inputs. So, so this assumption holds. And then um, we define our learning rule here. Uh, first of all, to define it, we take note that there is coupling in here and with, between these two compartments. And uh, as a result, the steady state voltage of the axonal compartment uh, will be uh, given by this uh, equation in the absence of visual input, um, an equation which depends on the voltage of the dendritic compartment. And then we define a our learning rule um, as follows. Uh, so it's, it's essentially the difference of the firing rate of the cell uh, minus the dendritic prediction of this firing rate uh, times the, uh, the postsynaptic potential of the presynaptic neuron J. And this is our, our learning rule. Um, importantly, this is a, a biologically plausible local learning rule uh, because the firing rate is available in the dendritic compartment because of back propagation of action potentials. And it converges when uh, the dendritic uh, prediction is essentially the same as the true firing rate. And then we can say that the neuron can predict the visual input, which arrives at the axonal compartment, uh, from just the vestibular information, which arrives in the dendritic compartment. And therefore, it has learned to integrate vestibular information to get to, uh, to, 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 to estimate the head direction. Uh, so yeah, after this uh, long introduction, um, we let our network learn and converge. And uh, we saw an example uh, of, its, of its activity. Um, so here in time, we see, uh, so, sorry, in the x-axis, we see time. And on the y-axis, we see uh, the neurons organized according to their uh, sele to their um, uh, selective uh, heading, basically. So um, this is both true for head direction cells and leftward head rotation cells and rightward head rotation cells. They're both organized according to their uh, to the heading they correspond to. Um, we can also see uh, the population vector average uh, in a blue line. Uh, the, darker li the darker blue lines is basically the firing rate of the cells. And, with, uh, and in red, we can see the actual heading of the animal during the experiment, the simulation. Um, and there are two cases uh, which we look at. Um, with red background, when, when we have red background, there's light. Uh, when the background is uh, white, uh, it's darkness. Uh, so as you can see here, um, first of all, a bump emerges in the head direction uh, network and propagates following very well the actual ground truth when the visual input is available, which is no surprise um, because basically the visual input guides, guides the output of the network. Uh, but what is interesting uh, is what happens when the visual input is not no longer there? So here we are in purely um, path integration regime. Uh, and basically, we can see that the network can still follow very well um, the location of the head, the head direction of the animal, just from angular velocity information. Uh, in the end, there's some accumulated error uh, between the blue line and the red line. Uh, but um, of course, this will go away as visual input appears again. And uh, so this is just an example. Uh, here we saw, we saw what happens when we drive the network with a constant angular velocity, and we assess how fast the bump moves in the network. 
And we basically see a one-to-one -one correspondence for both light and darkness conditions, which means that uh, if I drive on the network with a given velocity, the bump will move in the network uh, with the same velocity. And this, is, uh, this has been hard for people to achieve in the past uh, for all uh, velocities within a reasonable range, which the animal usually turns around. So yeah, we can confidently say that our network has learned um, to do path integration in the absence of visual input. Uh, so I'm going to go briefly through the last slides. Um, uh, first of all, we opened the black box to see what is the resulting connectivity. And we find starting similarities with uh, the true connectivity in the fly. Uh, we see there's a lot of uh, symmetry in the connections that emerge here and here. And if we plot the profiles as a function of receptive field difference, uh, we see local uh, recurrent excitation in the, uh, in, in the head direction network, which allows the bump, the bumps to emerge. And then in the, in the head rotation connections, uh, we see that there is this asymmetry which uh, pushes the bump towards the uh, direction these head rotation cells are selected for. And finally, uh, we saw what other things our network can accomplish. Uh, one of them is that it can learn all velocities up to a, a maximum theoretical limit uh, for a given network of this type. We can see that our learn learned networks follow this theoretical limit very well. Uh, secondly, we reproduce experiments where uh, we stimulate, uh, uh, where, where people have optogenetically stimulated and move the bump uh, wherever they wish in the network. And we can do this in our network as well. Uh, and then we also saw that it displays attractor states along um, all of its, in all of its locations, basically. So it, it, it uh, displays the continuous attractor network properly. Uh, finally, we saw that our network is flexible enough to learn any gain. And in this experiment, for example, we reverse the gain from 1 to minus 1, meaning that there's incongruity between visual input and vestibular input. But our uh, learned network with gain 1 in the beginning can reverse uh, its connections so that the leftward head rotation cells become rightward and vice versa in order to achieve this gain minus 1. Uh, so yeah, that was. All of it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Pantelemon. That was um, that was really um, fascinating. I have a, I do have a question. I, I I see that there are. We don't have any questions here from the audience, but I have a question about whether these cells are active when flies have these kind of funny mating behaviors. You know, when they're using their wing. Do, are these cells active at that particular time as well? Is, is that what they, they're also using um, to, to navigate? Uh, I'm not an expert uh, in flies. I'm more of a computational Neither am guy. I. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I think they are active. Um, our network is mostly about um, what happens when uh, flies walk, because this is uh, when we have information about this network. It's hard to actually have a manipulation where we can have all this information when the fly flies. Uh, but the velocities of the fly when it flies uh, are around this range also. So we expect that this network can also explain behavior during flight. Okay. We have a question from uh, Marcus Plaiser, and that is, are there assumptions inherent within the mammalian cortical neuron model which are not appropriate for modeling Drosophila neurons? Very, very good question. And uh, so this model uh, initially has a somatic compartment and a dendritic compartment. Um, but because we know that in the fly, the soma is largely irrelevant and electrotonically uh, segregated from the rest of the neuron. Um, in our case, what is important is the axonal compartment. So basically the area where the neuron is more likely to be excited when there's input there. So we replace basically somatic with axonal. Okay, very good. Thank you so much for, for that talk. That was, that was fascinating. Much. And as I said, I'm not a fly expert, but I always find these talks fascinating. And now, 
Um, for something completely different, we're, we're moving from the fly. We're going to the rhesus monkey now. And we're going to the rhesus monkey and we're going to be looking at vestibular function still. Uh, and this is a, a talk by Kantapon uh, Pom Bibun Saksakul. So, Pom, the floor is yours. Thank you. And um, thank you, everyone, for making this conference happen. And thank you, Dionins, for um, attending attending this session. So um, my name is Pami Boon Saksuko. I'm from the Cullen Lab at Johns Hopkins University. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how biomimetic design can help improve vestibular processes. So for those who are unfamiliar, the vestibular system have sensors in your inner ear that sense your balance and use this information to do many different important functions including gaze stability, posture and balance, accurate head movements, and also self-motion perception. And as you can imagine, if something were to happen with your sensors, you can no longer sense your head movements and no longer have these essential functions. And this is actually very debilitating. It's because you left with visual and postural instability, you're dizzy all the time, you lost the sense of self-perception, also sense of um, direction. So one way, to mitigate this is the development of the vestibular processes, which basically aim to substitute the damage periphery with the implant. And how it works is that it has a gyroscope module that sends your head movements, and then use a mapping function to map that head movement into a stimulation rate, and then stimulate the vestibular afferents accordingly. So the, the goal is that even with the damage periphery, once you restore this information, we should be able to regain all these functions. And that's exactly what's going on in our collaborator um, lab, Dr. De La Santina, who has a clinical trial and he has implanted um, a handful of patients and early results have shown marked improvement of quality of life and also partially restore functions. However, one main feature that this device differs from how the real inner ears are lies in how it convert the head velocity into the stimulation of the nerve. And let me explain that to you. So the current mapping function, which I'm gonna call the static mapping, it responds equally regardless of the movement of the head movements. But real afferents don't do that. Real afferent um, exhibit what is called a high pass property. And by that, I mean, it show an increasing gain or depth of modulation as the frequency of the head movement increase, as shown here. It also shows what is called a phase lead, which basically a lead in time of the response comparing to the input um, as signified by this arrow over here, which is leading the line. And so different kinds of afferents actually exhibit these property to different extent with the irregular afferents um, showing more of this kind of behavior. And um, to quantify these relationships, um, we can look at what is called a body gain and phase plot. And that is basically describing the gain and the phase of the system as a function of the input frequency. As you can see here, both regular and irregular afferents show increasing gain and increasing phase lead as function of frequency. So now that we know how afferents behave, how can we make the processes more like this? Um, the first step toward this is to know the transfer functions. And these are essentially the math mathematical realization of the scan and phase relationship that you can put into the processes and tell it to do stuff. And so, um, so based on these ex experimental data, I can estimate the transfer functions for the regular and irregular afferents. And since um, neurons in the vessel nuclei actually get input from both type of afferents, we also implemented um, a mixed transfer function with behave somewhere in between the, the two type of afferents. Um, in addition to this, we also have the current static mapping, which basically have a flat gain throughout and have a phase lead of zero. And um, finally, to um, probe the perimeter space a little bit more, we also um, implemented what is called a super irregular transfer function, um, which show of super high pass property and is meant to be the other extreme comparing to the static mapping. And so in addition to these 
linear relationships. Um, afferents actually also um, exhibit what is called a cutoff nonlinearity. And what that means is that um, it saturates when the inputs get too high in either direction. And this can be captured by using a simple fixed nonlinearity. And peer reviewers have shown that these two together can really well describe how real afferent responds. So this is gonna be the backbone of how our process is gonna convert head, head motion into nerve stimulation. And so the main question is then, if we implement the transfer functions and make the vestibular processes behave more like real afferents, would we be able to get any better performance? And to answer this question, we are gonna to turn to a monkey model um, with the processes so that if we see any improvements, we can go and record from the brain to see the um, neural underpinnings of that. And we're gonna look specifically at gaze stability as the output of this. And for those who are unfamiliar, gaze stability is mediated by the vestibular ocular reflex or the VOR, which basically is a SETI cam system for your eye. So um, the brain senses your head movements and then move the eye um, equal but in the opposite direction so that your gaze remains stationary. And um, you can actually use similar gain and phase analysis to um, analyze the head movements and the resulting eye movements. And as you can expect, um, the perfect compens compensation is the gain equal one, which is move the eye exactly like the head move, and also the, the phase of zero, so move the eye exactly at the same time that the head moves. This is actually quite impressive um, due to the fact that this pathway has a um, delay of five milliseconds, which should result in an increasing phase lag, but in healthy animals, we don't see that. We see a perfect compensation. And this is also partly why it kind of motivates us to implement these biomimetic transfer functions. And so um, I'm gonna show you two kind of results. The first steps are gonna be from the sinusoidal rotations from 0.2 to 20 Hertz, which is a natural range of self motion. Um, the other ones are gonna be a short transient perturbation of the head, similar to the head impulse test. So for the sinusoidal VOR, um, the dash line over here are the inverted head velocity. And what I'm gonna show you is the time series of the eye velocity resulting from the head movements. And so with the static mapping function, um, even at five Hertz, right away, we see a phase lag as indicated by the arrow and that gets worse and worse as the frequency gets higher. In, in addition to this, the gain actually decreasing as a function of frequency. But once we start to implement the biomimetic functions, um, this problem goes away right away. So for the regular mapping function, the gain is really good at five Hertz. It gets a little worse over time, but still doing better than the static mapping. Um, the gain for this actually remain robust throughout all these frequencies. And we see similar trend for other um, biomimetic transfer functions. And comparing to data from another monkey, we see very similar results. And so when we implement the biomimetic transfer function, we have better gain and phase response. And so I can quantify what I just told you qualitatively um, by looking at the gain and phase plot. And so the top row will be the gains, the bottom row will be the phase, and each column will be for each monkey. So let's start with the phase. So with the static mapping, again, like I told you, um, we see a very fast um, increasing phase lag that goes away and become more close to zero when we have a biomimetic mapping function. And actually for the super irregular, we actually kind of see a too much compensation per se, we see too much phase lead. For the gain, um, again, we see a decrease in gain as a, frequency increases, especially at higher frequencies. Um, these remain more or less, more um, roughly the same when we implemented the transfer functions. And for the super irregular, we actually see a gain increase. And for monkey G, we actually get close to one gain, which is actually what we want. So this kind of raised another question, what would happen if we turn up the, the, um, the gain for all the transfer functions? Would we see anything differently? And so this is what happened after we double the gain. Um, 
we for the face the face relationship remain exactly the same, and that is a good thing, um, because we can keep the temporal structure of the response, but still get more amplitude of the response. And for the um, gain, we see overall increase in gain, which is a, which is good. But we're also starting to see this kind of saturation at higher frequencies. All right, so let's move on to the transient VOR. So we apply a short head perturbation around 150 milliseconds long with the 200 degree per second. And so um, kind of the, the smaller trace is gonna be the actual trace and the one on the left will be a denormalized trace to show you, um, be able to see the temporal structure of the of signal. And I'm also gonna be quantifying the latency, which basically how, how long does it take the signal to start to respond to the input? And also the peak timing difference with basically how different is the peak of the response compared to the peak of the input. And so with the static mapping function, um, right away, again, we have already a lag in response and a very long latency, but that change, um, especially with the regular and the mix function, we have a very good um, timing of the peak and a shorter um, estimated latency. For these irregular and super irregular, we get lower estimated latency, but we also kind of have, again, like too much leap of the response. And finally, just to link the sinusoidal and the transient responses together, um, a simple linear model using the gain and phase relationship um, that I got from the sinusoidal data can accurately predict the eye movement resulting from the um, transient head movements, which mean that even at 200 degrees per second, um, we are still operating within the linear range of the system. And in conclusion, um, biomimetic transfer functions help reduce the VR response phase lag starting around one hertz. It also helps maintain the VR gain starting around five hertz. And it also results in shorter estimated latency and better timing of the transfer responses. And um, Regular and mixed transfer functions are likely the best for VOR performance due to their um, constant gain throughout and also better timing of the response. Though other functions of the vestibular system need to be considered, um, such as balance and self-motion perception. And these are actually um, active areas of in investigation in our lab. And finally, these results have a direct implication for clinical application advocating for the more bi biomimetic design of the vessel processes. And with that, I'd like to thank the Common Lab members, our funding sources, and thank you. Any question? Thank you, Pam. That was um, fascinating. Yes, thank you so much. And, and the other speakers, if you wish to ask questions as well, don't be shy. I have a question about um, whether you can, and, and, and what triggered the question was when you were talking about balance as well. Um, and I wondered whether you could actually get a handle on the um, the gain function by changing the temperature in the vestibular canals and having asymmetry in the vestibular canals. And when you do that, of course, you, you elicit a, a VOR, a strong VOR, without having to induce a head movement. And I'm wondering whether that can be an additional way to, to maybe give you more information about the transfer function of the system? Um, absolutely. Um, so I, I think um, using the um, temperature change to induce nystagmus um, mm -hmm. is yep. one way to probe the function of the vestibular system, um, I guess for the application of the processes, I think it makes more sense to estimate the gain based on the head movements um, rather than um, the change of temperature because I guess that that's how the um, how the processes kind of get its input from from the gyroscope. 
that sure, sensing. Sure, sure. Yeah, the, the, the reason I ask that, and, and, that's, and that's fair enough, the reason I ask that is that when you, you know, do change the temperature in those canals, people have a sense of that they are losing their balance. And that may not necessarily be the case when you, you know, you, you get a head turn very quickly. That, that, was, that was what the basis to my question was. Um, yeah, but it's really, really fascinating work. And, and of course, it's, um, it's relevant because a lot of people have issues with um, their vestibular uh, system. A lot of, lot of human um, um, subjects, patients have these and they're very debilitating these uh, these disorders yeah so it's really lovely to see that um, work in this prosthetic uh, area is being generated now I don't think do we have any um, do we we don't have any questions people are being shy I, I have um, a quick question yes please uh, I'm curious maybe I just missed it are you estimating these transfer functions in animals that are actually freely moving or are they sitting in a like chair and being rotated how does that work so um, basically a lot of people, so the, the long story short, um, these are from rec real recordings from the Afrins of normal monkey sitting in a chair, rotating okay. at different frequencies. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious if you think that these transfer functions would work in a actual moving animal when, you know, it's heads bobbing and other rotations that are affecting the autolith and vestibular systems are occurring. Um, I think theoretically it should work if the system are still within the, the linear range. So basically you should be able to characterize the system using the, all these sinusoids. Mm -hmm. And if it's linear enough, whether if the input becomes more complex, you should be able to still use the same um, information. Cool. It's cool stuff. Okay. Yeah, it is. That's really fascinating. Now we do have a question from the audience from my Rai Bore Gug. And, uh, they ask, can uh, transfer the transfer function solve the phase lag problem in the transient stimulus as well, or does phase lag only uh, can only be solved in the sinusoidal stimulus? So that's their question. Um, I would say that it can solve for both both conditions. Um, I guess. For the transients, you, you wouldn't really call it a phase lag because it's not um, cyclic data per se, but it definitely solves the lag in response time. Okay. Is it the transfer function, yeah, in a way help you get the output quicker, get the output right. out quick, quicker. Right, great. Thank you for that. And we've got time for one really quick one. It's a fascinating one. Do you think, and this is Robin Mildren, do you think clinicians could tailor the transfer functions for individual patients to have the prosthesis, prosthesis form perform optimally for them? Yes, absolutely. And I think um, I think it's a it's a great way to have like a more precision medicine. And um, yeah, so basically, you, you could do a flat test input for each patient, and then whatever thing you don't want, you construct the transfer function to counteract the things that you don't want. But uh, I guess it will be the problem of, of the mat, whether those will be causal or implementable in real time. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for answering those questions. And thank you to all the presenters for an absolutely fabulous session. And also thank you to Elisabetta Bala, who was on the back end of this. And everybody have a good evening. See you later. Thank you. Ranjan, yes. uh, we have Sun Sananda, sorry, this is a hard. It's one. okay. It's a Sananda Shrikant. Oh, Sananda Shrikant. Yes. Oh, Sananda Shrikant. Mm -hmm. And we have Maxim. Mm, sorry, can you pronounce this for me? Oh, is Miroshni Chenko. Miroshni Chenko. Miroshni Chenko. Okay, Maxim. Awesome. Um, Miroshni Chenko. Okay, uh, try to remember this, but probably don't have time to practice. And then we have Wei, Wei Kong Shi, right? Yes, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I'll, I'm probably not gonna just go over, go through all the lab hat, like the PI, if you have, for, for the second talk, because we have such a group. I'll just um, call up your, your name, and then we will put the introduction, like the info, information about you, each one of you in the chat.
Sounds good. Uh, cool. And oh, just one quick thing for the second talk, are you gonna switch sharing screen or you have one person sharing screen and people just look at the screen? Just one person. Just one person. So genius, you're gonna be the people who share screen. Okay, uh, then we'll have, we'll save a lot of time like switching the gear and uh, that'll be great. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what I have more questions. Okay, I think we are on time right now. It's 6 p.m. East time, maybe different for different people. Um, so, so do, uh, gallery, shall I start or we should still wait for like a second or something? Oh, we're good to start. Yes. Okay. Okay, cool. We have, yeah, we have some attendees right now. Maybe people will keep flooding in while the talk um, starts. So, okay, great. Thank, thank you everyone for coming and for, or for participating this session and giving the talk. My name is Anchi Wu. I'm a, a postdoc Can research you, fellow. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Question? No. Okay, <laughs> I'm a postdoc research fellow from Columbia University working with um, William Panensky and John Cunningham. Today, I'm glad and honored to be the MC for this session um, for, a series to, uh, for a series of really interesting talk that's gonna happen um, in this coming hour. And we have an exciting list of speakers. Um, we have um, Aris, Oh, sorry. We have Aris Vilaris, um, Junye, Francis Cho, uh, Tandy Rajan, uh, Sunanda Shrikath, and Maxim Miro Shnichenko. Sorry, I'm just trying to practice again. And then we have uh, Wei Kang Shu. So, yeah, I think we should just uh, start with the first talk. Oh, before everything, just want to say uh, for the audience, just ask questions. There's no stupid question. Just, um, try to engage and try to participate, okay? Um, so let's start with the first talk from Aris Villaris. She's assistant professor from University of Minnesota, and she will talk about comparing um, decision-making across social, emotional, and perceptual tasks. Okay, so I'll just hand it to uh, Aris. Awesome, well, thank you very much uh, for um, allowing me to present. And please, as a... Uh, uh, as you said, please interrupt me at any time for questions. Uh, I will try to keep uh, on time. I'm not very good at it, but I will try. Um, and also let me know if something is not very clear. So um, every day, can you see the screen? Okay, perfect. Yeah. So every, every day we are making all sorts of decisions, right? So uh, there's different kinds of decisions. So I don't know if all of you or some of you have, are familiar with this particular uh, visual illusion. But for example, one very simple visual perceptual decision is, uh, does, is A or B uh, darker? And actually in this illusion, they end up being exactly the same shade, but it looks like B is lighter because of the perception of the shadow. But this is a very uh, low level visual perceptual task. And then there's other types of tasks. For example, imagine that your partner enters home and uh, he or she is looking at you in a specific way. So it's very important for you to figure out what they are feeling because uh, if you uh, discover what they're feeling before they say something, you save yourself a lot of trouble. And in the same way, if you see someone in the street, if they look angry, maybe you shouldn't approach them. If they look happy, maybe you can approach them always with socially distancing these days. So it's it's a very different type of decision, uh, but it's a decision nevertheless, is to try to decide or recognize which emotion the other person might be feeling. Then finally, um, so this is my daughter who was born during the pandemic. And so what she's learning and what we are all learning is uh, who should we trust, right? And, uh, you know, uh, should we trust this person? And of course, if we trust the wrong person, uh, there's negative consequences. If we don't trust anybody, that's also bad. Now, one thing that I'm very interested in is to uh, is just to know if the way we make decisions at one level, if it's at all related to how we make decisions at the 
at another level. Uh, so in, in, in this particular case is the way we do uh, decisions in a very basic visual perceptual task at all related to how we do emotional recognition decisions or even social decisions. And then I want to understand uh, if uh, these type of decisions are connected with or influenced by personality traits or psychopathology. So this is the high level questions that I have. For for this particular um, uh, experiment, we looked at alexithymia. So uh, alexithymia is a, is a personality trait, which is characterized by low emotional awareness. So people with higher levels of alexithymia are not, have troubles uh, describing their feelings, have trouble identifying their feelings, and they ha have more of an externally oriented thinking. So instead of just fo focusing on their emotions, they are just focusing outside. And uh, actually the word alexithymia was coined and it actually means no words for feelings. So they really are, have low emotional awareness. Um, and even though it's not a psychiatric trait, it's associated with several psychiatric traits. And it often leads to worse social relationships and uh, directly or indirectly to poor, uh, to, uh, poor well-being. And it exists in about 10% uh, of the Western population at least. Um, so it's, it's high prevalence. We were also interested in understanding if uh, poor emotional awareness affects decision-making in at any of those levels described before, and if yes, in which way. So in our study design, so what we did, also I want to mention here that this study was uh, spearheaded by Nathan Toronsky and that he is, um, he started the study with me while he was still a, a very talented undergrad, and he is now uh, finishing his. Uh, he's just finished his uh, this project in my lab as an RA, and is now looking for PhD for PhD. So if you have an opening, I would definitely recommend him. Um, so in this in the study, we collected data from the Minnesota State Fair. Uh, last year, of course, because this year this was would not be possible. Uh, but so we got 150 participants uh, from the white community in Minnesota, uh, and we registered the the study at Open Science Foundation. So all our experimental protocol, hypothesis, analysis, um, they are all pre-registered. Uh, we uh, we had participants uh, complete this uh, TAS20 lexitimic questionnaire which is the most commonly used questionnaire where higher, uh, a higher score in this questionnaire uh, indicates higher levels of lexithymia. And we had them perform three different tasks. And uh, because of time, I won't be able to go into them with, with a lot of detail, but if you have questions, just, just ask me afterwards. So the first one is just a visual, a simple visual perception task, which is called the random dot motion task. And basically in this task, you have a, a subset of dots that are moving in a specific direction. And your task is to say if they are moving right or they're moving le left. And in our case, we had four difficulty levels. And in the, uh, the easiest level, we have 65% of the dots moving in the, in the same direction either right or left, and the other 35% are moving randomly. In the hardest case, we actually have only 5% of the dots moving in the correct direction, and the other 95% are just moving randomly. So it's very hard to see a pattern there. We have an emotion recognition task, which is called the reading the mind and the eyes task, where you see a, a snippet of the eyes of somebody and you, and you have four different possible emotions and you have to choose which one you think best characterizes the face that you are watching. And finally, you have a social decision-making task, which is the, the trust game, which uh, basically uh, uh, the first person, the first player has to trust some money to the second player. Uh, and they they have the risk that in, in player B, the, the, the trustee might decide to reciprocate that trust or might uh, just keep all the money for themselves, in which case they betray player one. So this is a social decision-making task. And we also analyzed different aspects of the decision. So we analyzed uh, performance. So how good they were at the task. Uh, we also analyzed uh, confidence. So after each trial, we asked them how certain do you feel about your answer? 
And so we, we analyzed uh, that. And we've, we, finally, we analyzed something we call the metacognitive ability. So uh, confidence is a sort of metacognitive ability, but we, are, we specifically analyze uh, metacognitive sensitivity, which, is me, which um, measures how good one is at distinguishing between one's own correct and incorrect responses. So is your confidence justified? If you tend to say that, okay, I'm very confident in this answer, is it generally because you actually are right in this answer, or is your confidence and your performance not actually matched? Um, so I, um, before I start to the results, are there any questions here that we can, or, well, I'll, I guess I'll wait for the end, but if there's any pressing question, I'm happy to reply. Um, yeah, there's no question from the Q&A session, so I guess we just- Okay, okay, so we'll just continue and we'll see until the end. Um, so in terms of across task results, we saw that perhaps unsurprisingly that performance was not correlated across tasks. So people that were um, better at distinguishing uh, if you know that's moving to the right or to the left were not necessarily better at knowing the emotion that the other person was feeling and vice versa. Um, this was not surprising, but it's good to see. We also, uh, but interestingly, we, we found a very strong relation in confidence across tasks. So um, people that tended to report higher confidence in their choices uh, in the, this visual perceptual task were also uh, tended to, to report more confidence in this emotion recognition task. Uh, it's, if you see, it's a very, very strong um, result. And the same thing with the trust game. So at the end of the trust game, even though in the trust game there was only uh, one choice, only one trial. Uh, then we also see a strong correlation. And if you see basically all the three different tasks uh, are strongly correlated in the terms of the confidence. Uh, finally, we also looked at, uh, so here we also saw, is confidence related with performance? Uh, we saw that individual perceptual task, that's indeed the case. So has, um, people got better at the task because so their percent correct increases. So are they get better at distinguishing between the right and the left? They also on average report more confidence in their choices, which is, this is what is expected. But interestingly in the, in the uh, emotion recognition task, this is not the case. So uh, the way, how well or poorly they performed is not at all related with how confidence they, they say, confident they say they, they feel about their answer. And so uh, perhaps unsurprisingly stemming from that, we did not see a significant correlation between metacognitive sensitivity across these two tasks. And for the trust game, it's not possible to calculate metacognitive sensitivity because you need to have several trials. Uh, but basically you see here that there's no, no results, even though at, in the last, in the easiest, um, this is the four uh, difficulty levels in the dot motion task and perhaps in this easiest level, there might be some effect. Um, finally, in terms of, because I think we still have time, in terms of alexithymia results, how does emotion um, awareness affects these results? We, we find that alexithymia was not related to performance. So it was not related to performance in the individual perception task. And again, we expected this, but uh, it's interesting to see. However, surprisingly, it was also not correlated with performance in the emotion recognition task. So even though they were less confident in, in uh, their choices, they actually did not perform any worse uh, in the emotion recognition task. However, alexithymia was negatively correlated with confidence. And this was not only in the emotional task, but also in the visual perception task. So especially in the, uh, in the easiest level, this is the, the easiest level. So as the lexithymia scores increase, the, uh, the median re, uh, confidence level, um, even in, the, in, the, um, in this dot motion task decreases. And the same thing happens uh, for the reading, the mind and the eyes uh, task. So uh, as they have higher lexithymia scores, they have, they report on average lower confidence in their answers. Uh, 
we also did not find the correlation between alexithymia and metacognitive sensitivity. So uh, overall, we find that uh, performance in these tasks is uh, task specific, at least in our, the tasks we, uh, we used. Uh, we find, perhaps unsurprisingly, that high confidence does not always mean better performance, so it's good to remember that. Um, conf the confidence might be a character trait, so people that uh, people seem to tend to uh, report more confidence, some people tend to be more confident in general or less confident in general, re regardless of performance, and this is correlated across tasks, even tasks so, di so different as visual perception, emotion recognition, and social decision making. Uh, metacognitive ability was also task specific, or at least we did not find any strong evidence for it to be um, the same across tasks. Finally, in terms of uh, emotional awareness, we found that uh, people with higher levels of lexitemia were still able to perform as well, uh, not in this, even in an emotion recognition task. Uh, but it was associated with a lower general confidence. So even though they were able as as able to perform as others, they, they reported less confi confidence in their choices. And this lower confidence was not only in the emotional recognition task, but even in a, a basic visual perceptual task. This suggests that uh, signals from one's emotion might be necessary to, to have a subjective confidence, to perceive subjective confidence. Uh, and finally, I want to thank uh, Nathan that did most of the work, my lab, the Engdahl Family Research Fund that funded this project and the, and the lab members that helped collect the data. And thank you all for listening. And I'm opening to questions. Okay, thanks, Aris, for the great talk about the um, decision-making and about this confidence level uh, in different tasks to study emotion. Um, so there's a question from uh, the panel actually, is how do you, ask, uh, do, how do you assess um, a laxithemia score. So that's this uh, uh, Toronto. It, it's a it's a self report questionnaire. In in our case, it's a, it's called a Toronto Alexithymia scale, the task twenty, and uh, and basically in the self report questionnaire, um, people have to answer a series of questions uh, in a Likert scale, and in a higher um, sc a higher score in this uh, in this questionnaire suggests higher levels of alexithymia. Now, the creators of this questionnaire suggest say that this should not be used as a cutoff point so that uh, lexithymia should be seen in a continuum rather than in just you have it or you don't have it. Um, so it just in general, higher lexithymia scores are related to, to lower emotional awareness, even though they some cutoffs do exist. But this is the one that is most used uh, in the field. I see. Okay. Uh, thanks, Aris, for the for the answer to the question. And given the time limit, we have to switch to the next talk. Um, and yeah, thanks Thank again. Uh, yeah, maybe Jin, you want to put up the slides and share a screen. Just brief introduction is we have a present. We have um, five presenters for this talk, uh, which are Jin Ye, uh, Francis Cho, Tevi Rajin, uh, Sunanda Shrikant, uh, and uh, Maxim. Miro Shini Chenko. I want to challenge myself again. Okay, I, I won't waste more time and just give the stage to, to Jin um, for the presentation, okay? Hello, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just gonna go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, so my name is Sananda and I'm here with um, Tanvi, Jun, Francis and Max. Um, we actually attended Neuromagic Academy this summer where Max was our wonderful TA. And today we are happy to be presenting work that we did as part of our project there. We use data from Steinmetz et al um, in which mice performed a perceptual decision-making task. So in this task, the mice was shown two stimuli, one each on left and the right sides. And once a go cue was sounded, the task was to either move a wheel in order to bring the higher contrast stimulus to the center or not to move the wheel at all if the two stimuli were of the same contrast. Data was recorded for the firing rate of uh, neurons and local field potential from different brain regions. In the middle panel here, 
we show a PSTH of 33,000 neurons averaged across trials. The white and the yellow rectangles indicate the stimulus onset and the go queue times respectively. We observe high neural activity associated with each event type, that is around the time of stimulus presentation and around the time of action, that is whether they should move the wheel or not, or go versus no go. On the right, we see a spectrogram of recorded LFP in the visual cortex as an example. What we can see is that visual differences are apparent between the spectrograms for different trial types. In this poster, we explore how well these external covariates, that is stimulus present versus absent or action of going versus not going can be decoded from neural responses or local field potentials. We hypothesize that a slow and continuous change in neural dynamics gives rise to selection of action, while a sudden and discrete change of neural dynamics encodes visual stimulus when presented. We investigate if this is true by constructing computational models that reflect continuous and discrete states of neural response patterns and LFP. So here is the approach we took. Um, so we, uh, like Sunanda mentioned, we wanted to investigate whether a discrete st state system, which is reduction of the neural spiking or LFP data would be able to represent the data or would be able to represent the data and help us decode certain external covariates such as action and visual stimulus, at least as well or better than a continuous representation which um, has richer data. Because when you discretize data, you lose information Whereas in a continuous representation, you don't lose information, but we wonder for, deco for decoding which of these individual covariates would a discrete system be at least as good or better than a continuous system and not suffer due to loss of information. So for our discrete system, uh, discrete state representation, we used a method called hidden Markov model uh, inspired by our tutorials on Neuromatch. Uh, and for a continuous system, we used uh, independent component analyses. And we used the output, state, the output states or continuous representations arising from both these systems uh, in the appropriate stimulus time, in the appropriate behavioral epoch in order to decode the visual stimulus or the action. Uh, one challenge here was that we had recording from a lot of different sessions, from 39 different sessions, and each session had recordings from different from neurons of different brain regions. So in order to unify them and to pick the brain regions which would be the most helpful in decoding these behavioral covariates, we ran a generalized linear model to estimate coupling uh, so, some sort of, uh, it's, it's a sort of pre-processing where we wanted to estimate how much weightage is assigned to visual stimulus and go, uh, action within each brain region. And we found that the biggest discrepancy uh, for decoding each of these external covariates was in the visual cortex and in the midbrain with the polarities uh, different. Now you can see that other cortex and basal ganglia also have uh, differences in coupling to write an action, but a, not a lot of uh, sessions had recordings from basal ganglia or other cortex. So we decided to exclude these from our analyses and only use visual cortex and midbrain in our further analyses. So <clears throat> here we show the uh, dimension redu reduction results, representations um, uh, into three dimensions. So the left shows the continuous representation uh, uh, reduced by the ICA, and the right shows the discrete uh, representation reduced by the HMM. So for the, on the left, uh, we see on the top row, the two plots are basically decoding from the visual cortex, and the bottom row are decoding from the midbrain. And the left column is decoding the goal versus no goal, the action the right column is decoding the uh, visual stimulus present or not. So we see the top row is very different, looks different from the bottom row. And that kind of shows us the top row, the visual cortex encodes the kind of fast changing dynamics versus the midbrain, 
encodes kind of the slow changing dynamics. We saw similar dynamics when we looked at the discrete state representation of our spiking data. So here we fit a three state Poisson hidden Markov model to spiking data from neurons either in the visual cortex or the midbrain. And in these plots, we could see the inferred states on a per trial basis, um, color coded by these three, three colors. Uh, the trials are sorted by go, no go, and stimulus, no stimulus trials from top to bottom. And these vertical lines indicate the time slice that was used to decode either the stimulus or action based on these inferred states. Um, and what we can appreciate is that visual, visual cortical neurons reflect relatively fast dynamics as indicated by this brief transition to the light blue state three, which happens quickly during the visual stimulus presentation period and only in the trials in which there was a, uh, a stimulus. And on the other hand, on the bottom, we could see that the midbrain neurons reflect the slow dynamics as indicated by the transition through all three states throughout the trial period. And this happens only during the GO trials, uh, perhaps more indicative of a continuous representation. And here shows the decoding results uh, uh, on this uh, dimension reduction um, representations. So uh, the left uh, column shows the uh, decoding results on the spiking data. The right column shows the decoding results on the LFP data. And the top row again like shows the decoding of the uh, stimulus present present or not. The bottom row shows the decoding of the action go versus no go. And we see on the, the top row, uh, basically the SA, SA and HMM results are pretty similar. And the, but versus the bottom row, when decoding the action, the SA is uh, better than HMM. So this kind of uh, shows that the, the discrete states kind of enough to represent the encoding of the stimulus, but not the case for uh, action. So hopefully by this point, we've convinced you that discrete and um, continuous dynamics um, both exist and are different in brain regions and uh, modalities. Um, let's now um, look into, go back to the spikes and BCHs and take a look if, at them to see if we can pick out what, whether they look different um, based on those modalities in brain regions. Um, look at the right side of this panel, panel on the left. <laughs> um, right contrast is greater than zero, right, on the visual cortex. Um, you can see that the transition there that differentiates uh, right contrast equals to zero from right contrast greater than zero occurs very suddenly. And the uh, difference is more or less confined to this narrow region around 0.5 seconds. Um, you, you can see actually quite a well-defined vertical strip kind of um, to the left of uh, the center of that figure. Whereas in the right set of panels for midbrain and compar comparing go and no go, there isn't that sudden onset um, difference between go and no go. It's rather uh, a diffuse in time change where some neurons come on and come off and then others come on after them. And so, um, these dynamics are much more conducive for um, a continuous state rather than discrete, like we have in the left. All right, so in conclusion, what we've seen is that during a perceptual decision-making task, the midbrain neurons contain more information that's relevant to action than visual stimulus. And the dynamics are, um, more continuous than discrete. However, the visual cortex neurons contain information that's more relevant to visual stimulus than action. And these uh, neural responses in the visual cortex are represented better as discrete states than as continuous states. So there is a um, dichotomy in uh, 
in the representation of these states and where in the brain they are being represented as well as what, um, what they are representing, namely action or um, visual stimulus presentation. Um, for this, we'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Nicholas Steinmetz for the data set that we, um, that we used for this project. Uh, we also used tools um, from Dr. Scott Linderman and obviously huge shout outs to Neuromatch Academy where we all um, got together and did this whole project. We've, we had a lot of mentorship from Dr. Jin Liu, uh, from Colin Hako and all of the faculty um, at Neuromatch Academy as well um, as our awesome TA Max who's present right here. So thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for the great presentation from the team. Uh, I'm really excited to see such a presentation from a group of students from your MASH Academy um, and using the uh, tools people learn from the, the, the course to really make interesting scientific study uh, from, yeah, from these data sets. So very, yeah, big applause to the work that people have done. Uh, yeah, do we have, yeah, we have some time for a question or two. Uh, maybe I can start with one. Um, I think this is really interesting that you find these different um, signals in visual cortex and, and midbrain um, cortex and learn these different representations. One question is, uh, what's the motivation of using ICA as the dimensionality reduction tool uh, for continuous data? Um, is, is there like a strong motivation you use that or it's just one thing you choose or you ac actually try others but don't really see interesting uh, phenomenon? Yeah, we, uh, we, we tried using SA and PCA um, uh -huh. for uh, to the decoding, uh, to the dimension reduction, um, but they get very similar results. So uh, here we just choose to show SA um, arbitrarily. Interesting. Yep. So P we had uh, also because tried, mm -hmm. yeah. So I think we had yeah. also tried GPFA, so, uh, um, and uh, my recollection is it d actually didn't do very well on the classification. Oh, have you tried a because the ICA is applied to? Um, okay, that, that's from something means ICA is applied to spike train. Uh, is applied to LFP data only, or you apply that to both spike train and, and L LFP? Um, so I think. What we're showing here is um, only from spiking data. However, we did also try it with um, LFP data. And um, I think in subsequent slides, we show the, um, the decoding accuracies if we use ICA versus HMM with LFP data as well as spiking data. I see, okay. And so um, maybe I should clarify that the way that this was done with LFP data was LFP data was first decomposed into its spectral components. And so you have these different spectral components and their, um, their um, evolution in time. And so that was what was um, then um, provided as input to ICA and then dimensionality reduced and shown here. I see. I see, cool. Yeah, thanks for the answer. Given the time limit, we a, li a bit past the timeline for the third talk. So let's wrap up here for the second talk and another big uh, plot for the presentation uh, pr for the presentation from the team. And and um, and yeah, okay. So the third talk is from uh, Wei Kangshu, who's a grad student from um, university uh, from Washington University in San Luis. Um, his PI is Camilo. Padoa Shiopa, I uh, hope yes. that's all right. And um, yeah, I'm excited to, to hand the stage to Wei Khan to talk about e economic choices with simultaneously, uh, simultaneous or sequential offers rely on the same neural circuit. Okay, so I get started. So uh, hello everyone. Um, it's my great honor to present uh, my work in this special uh, conference. So the, the topic today is economic choices with simultaneous or sequential offers rely on the same neural circuit. So our lab, our lab studied in neural economics. So we studied behavior of uh, uh, making decision between two options. 
uh, imagine you're working. So one daily example is like choosing between food options. Imagine you're in a rest restaurant and you want to choose between two pizza options. One is pepperoni pizza and then one, another one is cheese pizza. So you will see the pictures on the menu and you want, want to ask yourself, which pizza do you want? So at this, in, I mean, in this case, the two options are presented to you at the same time. However, nowadays, because, because of the pandemic, you cannot go to the restaurant. I mean, we cannot go to the restaurant. So the way we make order is order online. So maybe you take off your smartphone and look at the apps. At first, you see your first option, which is the pepperoni pizza. And then you see another option, which is the uh, uh, cheese pizza. And maybe at the bottom of the app, you're going to see a question, which pizza do you want? So in that case, the two options are not present to you at the same time. They're, pre they're presenting to you in a sequential way. So our lab or this project is trying to answer this question. So we want to know whether the same neural circuit mechanism is shared by both test modality. So in the following talk, I will refer the sequential offer task as task one and the sequ uh, sequential, I'm sorry, si simultaneous offer task as task one and a sequential offer task as task two. So we use non-human primates, so that's, we have to design a task for monkeys to do. So we design a task that uh, we have both task one and task two uh, interleave together. So the structure of task one simultaneous offers look like this. The monkey first fix at a fixation point, and then in the queue time window, monkey will know what task it is by looking at the shape of the fixation point. And during the offer on, the monkey will make decision, uh, I'm sorry, during the offer on, there's two, uh, two visual stimulus associated with two options will be presented to the monkey. And after the go queue, the monkey will reveal a decision by making a C card to the target. So this is a juice quantity quality trade-off task. So we use different color to represent juice type, uh, which is uh, juice A, apple, apple juice, juice B is peppermint tea, and different number of squares to represent juice amount. So this is for task one. Uh, for task two, se sequential offer task, the structure looked like this. Monkey first, first fix at fixation point, and then the queue time window will use another shape as a fixation point to let the monkey know what task it is. And we have offer one time window, monkey will know, I mean, we will present the visual queue with, associated with the first offer on the, in the middle of the screen. And in the inter-offer delay, uh, there's nothing. And during the offer two time window, the second option will be presented. And after wait and delay, monkey will reveal the decision by making the card to the target. And we have both, uh, we can have A presented first or uh, B presented first. So we have A, B, and B, A trial. And we interleave trials from all these conditions randomly. So they're randomly interleaved. How about the result of uh, behavior and uh, neurons? So first let's look at the behavior. Our behavior analysis is done separately in task one and task two. So because this is a, uh, uh, juice quantity quality trade-off task. So we're expecting a sinusoidal curve like this. So the sinusoidal curve is fit by a probit, um, probit fitting, and the formula is written like this. And also because we look at task one and task two separately, so for task one, it's only this part of this formula. And from this fitting, we're looking at two measurements mainly. One is the relative value, which is measured at this, uh, which is basically the indifference point of this signal the curve. It's mirroring the uh, relative value between juice A and juice B. The second measurement is stiffness, which is uh, beta one basically from this fitting. And that gave us the uh, behavior variability of this signal the curve. So that's for task one. For task two, we actually look at A, B and B, A trial separately. The AB trial and BA trial just remind you, uh, refer to the order of this presentation. If A first, that will be AB trial. If B first, that will be BA trial. And uh, we look at relative value and the stiffness are as our two measurement. And we also have another one, which is called order bias, which is defined like this. Uh, this is basically the measurement of those two colored lines, the distance between those two. And we call it order bias because the distance is actually reflecting the monkey's behavior, uh, which is the order bias in favor of the second option in task two. And why I said that, from this, from this result, you can see the, the, the red line is on the left side of the blue line. The red line is AB trial. And if it's on the left, means more B is chosen. And in this case, B is the second option. So, we, so, in, so in this case, monkey has chosen more B in AB trial. 
and the opposite idea can be applied on BA trial. Therefore, from this single session example, you can see the bias in, is, is in favor of the second option. And another effect you may observe from this is the difference of the stiffness between task one and task two. Task two has smaller uh, stiffness compared with task one. And that makes sense because maybe task one is easier for the monkey to do. So that's why the stiffness is, is higher. And such effect is also confirmed at the population level. We have two monkeys. This is example sessions. So first we look at the relative value difference and you may notice that they may not differ very much from the example sessions and that may be the case. Uh, may, I mean, the statistic is kind of significant but you can see the difference is not very much. So we tend to think the relative value may change but not dramatically. But for the stiffness, as I mentioned, task two have much smaller stiffness compared with task one. And we also observe a significant larger than zero order bias, uh, which means it's in favor of second option. And uh, I didn't uh, tell you what's our in, uh, implication of that. It's actually quite easy because order, the order bias is in favor of the second option. Second option maybe have better uh, memory or have less um, memory, I'm sorry, have less temporal discounting. So that's why monkey tend to choose second option. So how about the neurons? So we do a recording from orbital from the cortex, which is defined as the cortex in the middle of uh, middle auto orbital from the orbital sulcus and lateral orbital sulcus. So it's the purple, oh, so I'm sorry, I think it's pink, pink part here. And we mainly record it from 13M here. And this is the bottom side of the monkey showing you the same thing. And we have uh, uh, more than 1,500 neurons recorded and we mainly focus on 1,100 neurons from them because we define them as task related. I don't have time to explain what is task related, so, but we are just defined as task related. If you wanna discuss, maybe we can uh, talk about it after the talk. So for the neuron analysis, we actually similarly do analysis separately for task one and task two. So for task one, this task structure actually has been studied very well in our lab. And our main finding from this is that we found three types of neurons uh, in OFC uh, and those neurons are functionally different. First, we found some neurons tuned to their firing rate to the value of one, only one juice type. This example is a neuron that tuned to the value of only juice B. So we call it upper value B cell. And the second type of juice, uh, I'm sorry, second type of neuron is a binary encoding neuron. And this neuron, uh, the firing rate is tuned to one of the juice type. And the third one is the chosen value cell. Uh, these neurons tune their, uh, their firing rate to the value. It doesn't have information about the juice type. And we can also have a related neuron similar as uh, provided B cell and chosen juice B cell. And also we can have positive tuned neuron which are like this and negative two neurons. Therefore, in total, we can have eight cell types. And those eight cell types already covered a lot of neurons in OFC. And by having those type of neurons, you may, you may have an idea. I mean, we actually have that idea that a decision circuit may be in OFC. And the structure may be like this. For the offer value cells, they are maybe feeding the input to the decision network uh, because they have both information about value and juice type. And for the chosen juice cells, because they are binary encoding neurons, so maybe they are projecting the uh, output from this decision network. Therefore, to answer the question that whether task one and task two are sharing the same neuron circuit, uh, one way actually is in, is a way in this one is that to identify whether we have a, we can identify a decision network like this in task two. This work has been uh, preliminary done in another study, which only have task two in that, in, in, uh, in that paper, which is uh, here. What we found here, I mean, what we found in that paper was that we first found neurons in different time window are tuned to different things in task two. That is not the case for task one. What I mean is when we only look at the three time windows, post offer one time window, which is this, post offer two time window and post juice time window, we found those neurons are tuned to different var variables. However, those variables are actually not random. They are associated with each other. And uh, we call them value, I mean, variable sequence because they are, the variable appeared in a sequence, in a temporal sequence. And only eight of the variable sequences 
are really uh, tuned by those neurons, uh, which is uh, present, uh, which I present here as a table. And you can see the number eight match the finding from pre previous one, the test one, and also it, it, it is expanding many neurons as well. So what do I mean by the sequence to explaining that? I think a better idea is to show you some example neurons. So here I'm showing you one example neuron that is from the sequence number three. This neuron first tuned to the uh, upper value B in BA trial only. This is the tuning curve, how the tuning curve look like. Uh, I missed the Y axis. The Y axis is its fine rate. Um, but here different color represent different trial types. Blue is B, uh, BA trial, red, which is written here. I hope you can see. And red is AB trial. So because it's tuned to the BA uh, value, offer value B only in BA trial, so all the red ones are uh, assigned at zero. And you can, so that's what I mean by the variable offer value B in BA trial only. However, this neuron tuned to the offer value B in AB trial, if we look at the post offer two time window. For the post choose time window, you can see this neuron are tuned to the chosen value B. So this neuron actually tuned to the value of choose B whenever B is presented like this and this, and the whenever B is, uh, cho uh, is, cho cho uh, is chosen. So this neuron's uh, tuning property uh, resemble our uh, offer value B cell. The second example is another uh, binary encoding neuron. It first in encode the choose type or the uh, trial type, A, B, or B, A. And then for the post choose time window, it is encoding chosen juice. So this neuron resembles our uh, chosen juice cell maybe. For the third type, uh, it's a value encoded neuron. So it's encoding offer value one first in offer one time window and offer, two, offer value two in offer two time window. And it's encoding chosen value in post juice time window. It has no information about juice type. It is resemble our uh, chosen value cell maybe. So similarly, we can have A assigned neuron and we can have positive negative assigned, uh, I mean tuned neuron. That's why we can have eight uh, sequence type in total. And let's uh, move back to this. As I mentioned, those neurons resemble uh, what we found in task one, are they? So that basically means maybe our circuit is true uh, as well in task two. But uh, we also wanna further explore that. If that, uh, uh, we, I mean, we wanna know whether it's uh, not only just true, it's also have a one-to-one -one matching, which means one neuron defined as upper value B cell is also uh, some, somehow offer value B cell in this case as well. From the single neuron example, my answer is maybe yes, because uh, those neuron examples shown in here are actually exactly the same neuron as I show you in, ta in task one. However, we need to test this at the population level. To do that, uh, so the question is whether the cell classification from the two tasks, task one and task two are correspond to each other. To do that, our hypothetical analysis is to, is to uh, make a contingency table look like this. So in, in, I mean, in this table, each, un, uh, each element is a number, which is a cell number. And the number means how many neurons, for example, this one means how many neurons are classified as upper value A cell in task one, and also encoding sequence number one in task two. If there's a one-to-one -one matching, or, if the, or I can say the classification is corresponding, we're expecting high numbers only along this diagonal line. So here's the result. From the raw data, you can see the diagonal line have pretty large numbers as well, but this number cannot offer us statistic power. So to do that, we translate this, this, uh, this contingency table into an odds ratio table. The odds ratio is done at uh, ele uh, element wise, which means this uh, odds ratio means odds ratio from this. And the odds ratio is telling us uh, what's, uh, I mean, if the odds ratio means, if the odds ratio larger than one, which means the number shown here is uh, above random level higher than other elements. So what Sorry, do we, we I, expect? We need to uh, yes. wrap up in a minute very soon. Please finish. Okay, so basically you. what I'm, the point from this plot is just showing you that the diagonal line have above one and also pass the Fisher exact test which match our hypothesis. So perfect timing, I guess, kind of. The, first, the last slide is the conclusion. I show you at the behavior level, task one and task two are similar in terms of relative value, but task two is different in terms of stiffness. 
uh, in terms of uh, neurons, what I've shown you that is uh, the, the same neuron circuit might be adopted. And last, uh, it's a, a, I would like to thank everyone in Camilo's lab and our funding resources. And here's our uh, Twitter and email. So please feel free if you have any other questions. Um, yeah, thanks. Oh, sorry. Thanks, yeah. Wei Kang, because yeah, thank you we, very much. we are about to be kicked out in like 30 minutes, 30 seconds. So I just want to wrap up soon. We probably don't have time for Q&A because of the long presentation, but people want oh, okay. to discuss sorry with- sorry about that. That's why uh, people want to discuss with Wei Kang or all the presenters here, just follow their Twitter, uh, continue discussion on Twitter with hashtag NMC3 as well. So yeah, um, I think that's basically the end of session. I hate to finish and wrap it up so rushly, but, but um, yeah, but still thank you very much for all the presentation and all the presenters today for the session and, and thank you for the participation. Um, and also for, for the participation from the audience, okay? Uh, yeah, that's probably the end of the session and have a good night or have a good day. Sorry.